Geeks for Geeks has a challenge for you. The 390 challenge. Choose what you want to learn in 2024 and aim to complete at least 90% of the course in the next 90 days. And if you do that, you get back 90% of what you paid for the course. We believe you can do that. Now all you got to do is commit to your success, commit with Geeks for Geeks. Uh, hello students, welcome back to our YouTube channel Geeks for Geeks Gate Computer Science. So uh, guys, in today's session, we are going to discuss about all the questions which we have to practice for engineering mathematics that would help us to brush all the uh, topics which we have and also we are going to uh, discuss methods or short tricks to solve those questions. Just let me know in the chat section if I am audible and visible properly. Uh, just let me know guys in the chat section if everything is fine with my stream and I am uh, sharing my screen in which I have questions and all. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, guys. Right, uh, we'll do complete mathematics, but before that, uh, in this session, we are going to discuss all about engineering mathematics, and then later on, we'll discuss about uh, discrete mathematics in the later class. Uh, it will get scheduled uh, in this YouTube channel. I hope my screen is visible to everybody. Uh, just give me a minute so that I can start my session. Please just let me know if my screen is visible. If everything is proper, just let me know. Just give me a quick thumbs up so that we can start our session. Uh, we are going to complete engineering mathematics in this one session. I think we have around 29 to 30 questions which we will discuss and I will try to complete cover all the topics and if you have any question in mind you can post that in the chat section and uh, yeah we can discuss that and if you know if you feel like that any topic is left just let me know so that we can discuss about that topic. Okay I think everything is good now we can start the session so guys as you can see my first slide based on 390 challenge it's not for uh, the students who are preparing for gate 2024 it is for students who are preparing for gate 2025 what it says or any another courses if you purchase for gate if you have three months time so what this uh, says it says that let's say if i have uh, if you buy any course in J from January, 1st of January to 31st of January, we'll give you 90% refund. If you complete that course in 90 days and you complete 90% of the course, not complete course. If you complete 90% of the course, you will get a 90% refund. So now you can see that this is a big opportunity because it would help you to get all the money you have paid for the course and already because you know that you have to complete it in 90 days so there would be a consistency right so it is only for the students benefit we have bring this challenge so that you can be consistent for all the studies okay uh, yeah so that is our 390 challenge is going on so guys hurry up if you want to enroll in this course if your uh, colleague or if your sibling or friend or anyone who want any course from GFG, just tell them that buy it from 1st January, uh, from 1st January to 31st of January, right? Because uh, if you will complete it in 90 days and you will complete 90% of the course, you will get 90% refund, right? So I hope uh, this would help many and many students. So that's I am telling it again and again. Usually we do not uh, bring any kind of uh any kind of offers and all so we have this challenge only for keeping you guys in mind okay yeah so let's start the session guys uh just let me know before starting the session if any topic 
you guys have a question or have any confusion let just let me know in engineering mathematics what do i mean here i mean here linear algebra calculus and probability these three subjects are there and if i'll talk about the topics which i have in linear algebra so if i'll talk about linear algebra i already told in many classes that the important topics in linear algebra we have as determinant determinants eigen value eigen vector eigen value eigen vector right and the next topic i have is system of linear equation system of linear equation and the last topic is lud composition these four topics are very important there are many more topics but these four topics play a crucial role in gate exam right so just let me know guys in linear algebra anybody have any uh, question regarding this topic yeah regarding these topic if anybody have any confusion just let me know in the chat section and if i talk about calculus i already told you so many times that in calculus we have uh, one topic which is limit and another topic which is definite integral these two topics are very important definite integral right and if i'll talk about rank of matrix is important yeah uh, rank of matrix already gets included if i have to work on eigen value rank i know how to find out a rank similarly for system of linear equation to solve i should know that how to find out rank right so it's obviously there and if i talk about probability so probability basically main question depends on probability definition and also then their distributions and you should know all the distributions mean median mod then you would be able to solve most of the question and one topic is also there that is conditional probability right so these type of topics are important number of solutions using rank ha huh, that comes under sort of that comes under system of linear equation right uh guys uh, just let me know uh, is there any problem with my camera just give me a minute guys yeah uh, am i visible properly just let me know or oh, let me see once i think there is some error i'm facing just give me a minute guys till then you can tell me that if you have any confusion in any topic a uh, random variable okay so guys if there is no problem then let's move forward yeah so rajvi said to us that we also have random variable in probability yeah random variable is covered in distribution what we'll do uh, let's say if x is a random variable and then we are going to discuss about their distributions okay what about singular value decomposition singular value decomposition is not so much important in your syllabus uh okay from the next uh, from the next class onwards we can uh, have that kind of a class just don't know your name yeah but this class we have to be like that because i have already started it okay yeah so let's start let's start the questions yeah so we have this first question it says that uh, so we'll start from linear algebra and then we'll move to uh, calculus and then we'll work on questions of probability so we have this first question it says that this matrix has two eigen vectors 1 to 1 transpose 1 1 0 transpose as eigen vectors both with eigen value 7 and traces 2 
then what would be the determinant of a can you tell me guys what would be the determinant of a so we have given trace and we have given one icon value so how do i find out uh, how do i find out the determinant 49 is the answer rajveer is saying anyone else guys just try this one guys okay uh, yeah guys uh, ax is equals to lambda x would be the definition for the eigen value lambda that is true rajveer is saying that both with eigen value 7 we have 7 comma 7 as eigen values uh, but rajveer as you can see that we are getting a eigen vector of 3 cross 1 right so we have 3 uh, cross 1 vector so that means matrix would be of 3 cross 3 order if matrix is of 3 cross 3 that means we have three eigen values right uh, determinant is equals to product of eigen values but we have given only one eigen value and we have a 3 cross 3 matrix we required three eigen values here guys so how do i find out those three eigen values just let me know uh, just let me know the final answer guys okay so guys as we can see here that corresponding to eigen value 7 we are given two eigen vector so that means 7 is repeating two times as an eigen value so 7 comma 7 are two eigen values for the matrix a right but you can see that matrix a has eigen vectors of order 3 cross 1 so that means a would be a matrix of order 3 cross 3 then i should to find out determinant of a i should include three eigen values so let's consider 7 7 and lambda these three are my eigen values so i have given trace is equals to 2 if trace is equals to 2 so that means 7 plus 7 plus lambda is equals to 2 so on solving i'll get lambda is equals to minus 12 if lambda is minus 12 so that means three eigen values would be 7 7 and minus 12 and you guys already told me that determinant is what product of eigen values determinant is product of eigen value so it would become 7 into 7 into minus 12 so you can see that there is no negative number so option d is correct determinant of a is uh, uh right minus 12 would be the value of lambda so that's why determinant is equals to none of these i hope rajveer you got got it that why we can't take 49 as an answer because the matrix is of order 3 cross 3 you have to uh, see that right okay so if it is clear let's move to the next question if there is any question just let me know in the chat section so this is a next question it says that a 3 cross 3 matrix p exists for which the eigen values are given as 1 2 3 if for a scalar lambda not equals to 0 we can express P inverse is equals to p square by lambda minus p plus 11 by lambda i3. The value of the scalar lambda will be. So guys, here lambda is not an eigen value. They are, have given a constant lambda here. So I just try it this once. Uh, right this is a question based on characteristic equation
just try this question guys Okay, uh, if algorithm was not completed, I think then sir will take another class so that they can complete the whole session. Have they discussed something with you regarding this? Okay, so we have given a matrix P which has eigenvalues 1, 2 and 3. So for a scalar lambda, we have given this metric, uh, this equation in which we have P as a matrix and we have to find out scalar value of lambda so how do i do that so guys one thing i know that every metric satisfies its own characteristic equation right uh, every metric satisfies its own characteristic equation so if i'll find out its own characteristic equation what would be the characteristic equation one two and three are the roots of that characteristic equation so if i'll multiply x minus one x minus two and x minus three I'll get my characteristic equation. What would I get if I'll solve x square minus 3x plus 2 and then x minus 3 equals to 0. Can I write down this as x cube minus 3x square minus 3x square minus 9x plus 2x minus 6 equals to 0. So if I'll solve it, I'll get x square minus 6x square and I think uh just a minute let me see if calcul all the calculations are correct i'm checking the calculation okay this is plus plus 11x minus 6 equals to 0. now i know that every metric satisfies its own characteristic characteristic equation can i write down this as p cube minus 6p square plus 11p minus 6i equals to 0. if i'll take 6i to the right hand side and p cube minus 6p square plus 11p and if i'll multiply p inverse both the sides let's multiply p inverse both the side into p inverse so i'll get p square minus 6p plus 11i and 6p inverse let's take this 6 to the right hand side if i'll take this 6 to the right hand side this will become like this 11 by 6 so if I'll compare these two equations, this one and this one, what would be the value of lambda? Lambda value is 6. Right, Aman? Uh, you gave the answer correct. Right. So 6 would be the correct answer. The value of scalar lambda would be 6 here. I hope this is clear. Okay, just give me a minute. Okay, so guys, just let me know uh, if my screen is uh, clear to you now. Okay, just give me a minute if you guys are facing a problem. Uh, just a minute, guys.
I'm checking my uh, connections. Yeah, I think everything is fine. Just let me know, guys, if you guys are facing confusion till now, facing problem or facing any issue. Okay, so if it is clear, let's move to the next question. So six would be the correct answer. Yeah, this is a question. This is one of the easy question we have is which one of the following option provides the correct value of the eigenvalue of the matrix. Okay. Uh, right guys a would be the correct option because uh, we have learned this so many times if i have a diagonal matrix upper diagonal upper triangular matrix lower triangular matrix so in those type of matrix the elements on the diagonal entry the elements on the diagonal gives me the eigenvalue of the matrix i do not have to solve it i can see directly that here one four three would be the eigenvalues one four and three would be my eigenvalue so here option a is correct right so this is the easier yeah it is an upper triangular matrix yeah this is another question it is from gate cs 2016 we have given two eigenvalues of a matrix p we have to find out determinant of p again the question says that p is a three cross three matrix but we have given only two eigenvalues so how do i work on that tell me guys how would i work on that just think about it Uh, right guys okay yeah correct answer guys because i can see that p is of order 3 cross 3 and we know that eigenvalues are the roots of characteristic equation and we know that if we have a complex root complex roots always occur in pairs so if i have 2 plus iota as a root this is what square root of minus 1 is iota then 2 minus i would be the root of the same equation so that means 2 plus i and 2 minus i occur as a roots of a equation together so if i have this so the third eigenvalue would be 2 plus i 2 minus i and 3 and if i'll multiply these so i'll get 5 into 3 that is 15 so 15 would be the determinant of p yeah all all have given the correct answer yeah this is another question it says that in the given matrix one of the eigenvalue is one one eigen, the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue one is so we have to find out what would be the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue one Uh, so guys tell me uh, in this given matrix one of the eigenvalue is one then eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue one r also guys just one thing to tell you that you do not have to find out explicitly the eigenvector here right just go through the options and see by multiplying that which of the option would give me the correct answer because it would take time if i'll uh, use the formula a minus lambda x is equals to zero and try to find out the value of x 
the vector x here. Okay, so guys, uh, let me tell you that one format is that I'll write down a minus lambda i x is equals to zero. A this matrix a minus lambda i x. So instead of lambda, I'll write down a minus lambda is one a minus one i x is equals to zero. Right? I'll solve this, but you can see that that would be very lengthy process. Just don't do that because it would take so much time. And I do not want to uh, waste our time in easy questions. So what would I do? You can see that 4 to 1 is an eigenvector. Why? What is this alpha? Alpha can be any constant. We know that system of when system of linear has infinite number of solutions, then it would comes, uh, it would get multiplied with k, and it would give me infinite number of uh, solutions. Similarly for eigenvectors, when I'll solve for eigenvector, they can be infinite, but they are dependent. So similarly, here we have given 4 to 1. So if I'll multiply this matrix with 4 to 1, what would I get? Let's see. If I'll multiply 4 to 1, solve this, guys. So 4 uh, minus 2 plus 2. That means 6 minus 2. That is 4. And 0, 1, 0 gives me 2. And if I'll solve this, 4 and 2, 2s are 4, 1, 1s are 1. So we'll get 4, uh, 4, 8, and 9. So we'll get this 4 to 9. And you can see that this would not form an eigenvector because if you will take, uh, it is not forming the form ax is equals to lambda x. Right? So that's why this is not an eigenvector. Then I'll go for the option B. Option B is minus 4 to 1. Right? Let's see minus 4 to 1 work for this or not. If I'll multiply minus 4 to 1, what would I get? Minus 4, minus 2, plus 2. So we'll get minus 4 here. And this will become 2. And if I multiply minus 4 plus 4 and uh, 1, that would give me 1 here. So you can see that this I can write down this as 1 into minus 4 to 1. So it is forming a into x is equals to lambda into x. So option b is correct. Right. So here I can see that option b is correct. Now similarly, I can go for option c and d. Just check by yourself. Are they? Uh, are they forming an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1 or not, let's do that. If I'll go for option C, square root 2, 0, 1. I'll multiply this with square root 2, 0, and 1. So if I'll solve this, I'll get square root 2, it would be 0, square root 2 plus 2. And I can see that it is not forming an eigenvector. And it would become 0, and it would become square root 2, plus 1. But if I'll take, yeah, it is not forming an eigenvector. I can see that. Similarly, you can check for C and D as, uh, D as well. They would not form an uh, eigenvector. So here, option B is correct. Right? So I hope this is clear. Just let me know, guys, in the chat section if there is any confusion in this. Otherwise, let's solve this question. This is an easy question. Suppose that the eigenvalues of a matrix A are given, that is 1, 2, and 4. We have to find out determinant of A inverse transpose. Anyone else, guys? Aman already answered. Just check it that this his answer is correct or not. Okay, yeah. So, guys, let's solve this. In this question, we have to find out determinant of A inverse transpose. 
so we know that determinant of a transpose is equals to determinant of a so can i write down determinant of a inverse and determinant of a inverse would be 1 by determinant of a and determinant of a is what product of eigen values product of eigen values eigen values so i can write down here 1 by 1 into 2 into 4 that is 1 by 8. so 1 by 8 is a product of eigen values you can write down the same decimal to uh, fill up the blank place okay now let's see this question let's see another question this is another question it says that consider the matrix a is equals to u into v transpose where u and v are given we have to find out largest eigen value of a here a transpose to the power ha huh, we can do that a inverse transpose or either i can say no we can't do that a inverse transpose and a transpose inverse no uh, we can't uh, like write uh, like, like that just check by taking an example either we are able to uh, write like that or not anyone else guys so if i'll uh, see this question a is equals to uv transpose right so u is equals to 1 2 and v transpose would be 1 1 right so what would i do i'll form a matrix i have taken a v transpose so let's write down 1 1 and 2 2 this would be my matrix right this i hope all of you get this matrix now i have to find out eigen values so eigen value would be a square minus lambda i determinant so that means determinant of 1 minus lambda 1 2 2 minus lambda i can write down 1 minus lambda 2 minus lambda minus 2 so if i solve this i'll get 2 Plus lambda square minus three lambda minus two equals to zero. So I'll go get lambda into lambda minus three is equals to zero. I get two eigen values here, zero and three. So largest eigen value would be three, right, guys? So you can see that uh, with the help of vectors you form a matrix, and with that uh, matrix you have found out an eigen value. Okay, let's see another question. So this is another question based on LU decomposition. so we have given a matrix a and its lu decomposition then they are asking that which of the following are correct the values of l and u so i hope everyone knows how to form an lu decomposition okay i'll explain it so guys uh, let me tell you about lu decomposition what is lu decomposition lu decomposition is basically i am breaking the matrix into lower triangular matrix and upper triangular matrix i have broken broke down this matrix into l and u why i have done this because to solve system of linear equation there is also one way to solve system of linear equation that is to break down it into l and u then corresponding to u first i'll find out and i uh, the solution of the equation and then corresponding to l but that is a uh, that is not in our syllabus so we are not a, 
uh, working on that. We know that if I have to find out solution of system of linear equation, I'll uh, use ranking method, right? But I should know that how to find out edu decomposition. One thing is that I'll multiply L with U and compare the values of A. What do I mean here? So if I'll multiply L with U, what would I get? One, if I'll multiply one, zero, zero, so I'll get U2, U3 on comparison. Similarly, if I'll multiply the next row, I'll get L1, U1, and then L1, U2 plus U4, L1, U3 plus U5, right? I'll get this. On comparison, I can find out the values of L1, U1. I can do that. But don't you think that would be a very lengthy process? If I'll try to do that, that would be a lot of calculation and there would be a chances of error. So I would not do that. So then how do I find out uh, the values of L and U? By, uh, by row reducing the matrix. So what do I mean by row reducing? Let's see. So guys, you can see that this is a A matrix given to me. So if I'll row reduce this matrix, what would uh, what do I do in row reducing the matrix? I basically uh, convert the values. Uh, con I'll basically make the pivot entries and make the matrix into upper triangular matrix. So by row reducing, I'll get an upper triangular matrix. Simultaneously, I form a lower triangular matrix as well. So let's consider this matrix A. If I'll apply the, and what is my lower triangular matrix? Lower triangular matrix is given to me 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0. I have to fill the value L1, L2, and L3. So if I'll convert this, first I am doing R2, approaches to R2 minus 3 R1. What do I am doing? I am subtracting 3 out of this place. And I am subtracting from the third row. I am subtracting 2. R3 approaches to R3 minus 2 R1. Right? So if I'll solve this, what would I get? 1 minus 1, 2. These two values would become 0. R2 minus 3 R1. That means minus 1 plus 3. That is 2. And 7 minus 6. That would give me 1. Right? And if I'll apply this operation, minus 4 plus 2, that would give me minus 2. And 5 minus 4, that would give me 1. Now you can see that because I have subtracted 3 from this place, I'll add 3 here. Because I have subtracted 2 from this place, I'll add 2 here. Right? Similarly, now to make it an upper triangular matrix, I have to remove this. So what would I do? R3 approaches to R3 plus R2, right? So if I'll solve this, what would I get? Min minus 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, and 0, 0, 1 plus 1, that is 2. So you can see that because I have added 1 from this uh, row 2, I'll subtract 1 from here. Right, so now you can see that this is a lower triangular matrix and this would become an upper triangular matrix. Now you can multiply. If I want to check that either I have done all the operations correctly or I'm getting a correct answer or not, I'll multiply L with you. Let's do that. Uh, if I'll multiply 3, 1, let's see, minus 3 and plus 2. That would give me minus 1, 3, 2, 6, 1 and 7, 2 minus 1, 2. And this would give me, this is sorry, this is 1. Let's keep it 1 here because it is 1 given to me. 2, it would give me 2, minus 4, and that would be 2, 4, and minus 1, plus 2. Yeah, that would give me L into U as the, yeah, uh, right, right, right. This is 1. And this would be 2. Why it is 2? Because I am adding uh, second and third row. I hope it is clear. So now I can compare, which they are asking, L3 is equals to 0, U5. L3 is 0. L3 is here. So L3 is not 0. So this is not true. L3 is minus 1. Okay. U5 is 1. U5 here we have U5. U5 is 1. So this is correct. L3 is minus 1. And U5 is 1. L2 is 2. L2 is 2. And U6 is 2. U6 is here. U6 is 2. Option C is also correct. Let's check for D. L2 is equals to minus 1. That is not true. So you can see that here option B and C are correct. Aman, uh, you can see in this question, they are asking which of the following are correct. So 
this can be msq right so you have to understand the question carefully you have to read the question carefully then you would be able to answer otherwise if you have already solved it this whole question then uh by not looking the question properly it will there may be a chances to get the question wrong so here option b and c are the correct option i hope this is clear just let me know if there is any confusion uh in this question okay so now let's solve the next question Okay, so this is another question. It says that a system of equations represented by ax is equals to zero, where x is a column vector of unknown and a is, yeah, by row property we had we have made zeros by row deduction. Okay, so this is a question from Gates CS two thousand three. A system of equation represented by ax is equals and no Rajveer marks would not be given if you will select any one of the option. If it is M MSQ, so the if they are uh, asking for two options correct, then you have to tick for two options. Uh, right, we have to make upper triangular using row reduction. A system of equations represented by ax is equals to zero, where x is a column vector of unknown and a is a square matrix containing coefficient has a known trivial solution when a is non singular singular symmetric or hermitian just tell me guys which of the option would be correct here Uh, right guys option b would be correct here so you can see that why option b would be correct because we have given homogeneous system of linear equation ax is equals to zero and we know that in this homogeneous system of linear equation we have only two type of solution what are those two type of solution either i'll get a unique solution or i'll get an infinitely many solution infinitely many solution there are only two types of solution possible and when I'm talking about unique solution, because ax is equals to zero, if I'll put x as a zero vector, right, this would always be an answer. If x is zero, this whole a into zero would become zero. So zero would always be an answer for a homogeneous system of linear equation. So when I'm talking about unique solution, that means I have a trivial solution. And if I have infinitely many solutions, so I can call the solution as non-trivial solution right and why i am saying that a should be a singular matrix because in this ax is equals to zero let's say if a is non-singular then i can multiply a inverse on both sides i'll get x is equals to zero in that case if inverse exists right so in this case determinant of a would be not equals to zero and in this case determinant of a would be zero so for non-trivial solution we have singular matrix Right, either I have unique solution, trivial solution, determinant of A is zero, or I can see that A inverse exists here. Both have the same meaning. A inverse does not exist. Or I can say that here, rank of A is less than N. N is a, uh, N is a rank of, N is a number of rows in a matrix and rank of A 
is equals to it. Right. So, yeah, guys, all of you have given the correct answer. Singular option would be correct. So I hope you know this kind of a chart for uh, non-homogeneous equation as well. Right. So if I have AX is equals to B, I'll add one more column, which is no solution. But all other things would not work like that. Trivial, non-trivial would not work in uh, non-homogeneous case. I hope this is clear. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Here, option B is correct. Yeah, this is another question uh, based on matrix multiplication. A, B, C, D, B in cross N matrix is each with zero determinant. If A, B, C, D product of four matrix is one, then B inverse is. What would be the value for B inverse? Guys, one thing we know that matrix multiplication is not commutative. If I'll write down A into B, I cannot write down B into A. Uh, so, guys, we want to find out B inverse here. So, what would I do? I have given here A into B into C into D is equals to 1. So, what one thing I can do? I can multiply A inverse on both sides. What would I get? A inverse. Right? A inverse into A is identity. If I multiply identity with B, C, D, it remains in B, C, D. A inverse. Now, what would I do? I'll multiply B inverse uh, on uh, left hand side to this met B inverse B C D and B inverse A inverse. So B inverse B would be identity and it would become C D and this would become B inverse A inverse. Because now you can see that A inverse is to the right. I have to take it to this place. So what I can do, I have to take it to the left hand side. I'll multiply A because I am multiplying A to from the right side. So I have to multiply A from the right side. So C, D, A is equals to B inverse, right? So here option D is correct. So guys, you have to see this, that how I'm multiplying the matrix, right? So that's why here option B is correct. So you should understand that how to multiply the matrix. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. You cannot multiply A from the left-hand side on one side and A from the right-hand side on another side. You can't do that. Okay, so yeah, I hope this is clear. Just let me know guys up to now if you have any confusion. So this is another question. It says that which of the following is our eigenvectors for the matrix given below. I think this is a question from gate 2022. Just try this one. And there is one more thing that you can see here that they have written here is slash r. So there might be a possibility Okay, guys, let's get back to the previous question because Saurabh is asking that why I have multiplied with A inverse. Because uh, Saurabh, you can see that if I have given this equation A, B, C, D is equals to identity. I cannot direct multiply B inverse to the left hand side because I will not, I would not be able to take it at this place. I told you uh, that matrix multiplication is not commutative. So how would I take this B inverse to this place? to make the inverse B into identity, right? So that's why I first I have to multiply it with A inverse so that I can remove A, A from here. Then I will I have a reach to B. Then I can multiply with B inverse. Then if I, now I have replaced this B value from the left hand side, it, I have taken it to the right hand side. Now I have to remove this. So that's why I have multiplied it with A. 
yeah post pre post multiply matters here right them so i hope this is clear okay so we have this question just let me know uh, which of the option is true So guys, here I have to check all four options. I can't say that, okay, option one less or two, any of the option is matching. I'll take that option and move forward to the next question because they are saying is slash R. Because guys, if you have seen the previous year gate papers, they would not uh, say that from this question to this question, you have multiple selected question, MSQ. You have to just check by yourself, which is MSQ, which is MCQ. Uh, no, there should not be exactly mentioned in the question. Like this question is given like this. So if they have mentioned is slash R. So you have to check for uh, multiple selected options as well. They would not mention that this is M MSQ or this is MCQ. Okay, let's try this one. So I have to check, let's multiply it with minus one, zero, two, two. So we know that AX is equals to lambda X is a definition for eigen vector, right? So what would I get here if I'll multiply nine and two twos are four, four twos are eight. Nine minus eight, that is one. And two twos are four, that would become minus three. And if I multiply this minus eight plus six, uh, eight minus six minus two, that would be zero. And if I multiply minus 20 plus 16 plus 10 minus four, no, minus 20 plus 16 plus 10. Just give me a moment, minus 20 plus 16 plus 10 okay that would give me plus six yeah that would give me plus six and then if i'll solve minus 32 plus 40 plus 24 38 minus 32 that would give me six so if i'll take three common i'll get minus one zero two two so now guys, you can see that AX is equals to lambda X. It is forming. So can I say that this is an eigenvector? 
right so here option a is correct option a is my eigen vector now let's check for option b Okay, let's check for option B. B is also correct. Let me check. Uh, let me remove the calculation for option A because we have already solved it. Zero one minus three zero. Zero one minus three zero. I have to multiply with these two values 1 and minus 3 that would give me 0 1 and minus 3 9 minus 6 that would give me 24 minus 15 15 minus 24 sorry 15 minus 24 that is minus 9 and that would give me 0 i can take 3 common 0 1 minus 3 0 right guys option b is also matching let's check for option c and d option b is correct uh aman i'm also getting option b correct why you are not getting b correct b would be correct let's check for c as well b i got correct let's check for c minus one one zero one minus one one zero one so nine minus six and minus four that would give me minus one minus eight minus six sorry eight minus six minus one that would give me one twenty minus minus twenty plus fifteen plus five that would give me zero minus thirty two plus twenty one plus twelve that would give me one yeah, option C is also giving. I can write down this as 1 and 2. This is also giving me. So C is also correct. Let's check for D. Uh, guys, do you have, uh, do you check for D? Or do I need to check? Let's check it. 1 plus 1, 0 minus 1, 0 equals to 9 minus 9 plus 2 11 8 plus 3 minus 8 plus 3 minus 5 so you can see that here 1 here 0 i can take anything common i would not get 0 at this place so a b c are my correct option so now you guys know okay yeah so a b c are my correct option i can see uh, let's check it out here yeah a b c are my correct option okay yeah uh, right aman it is very lengthy to check every option but uh, we do not have any another method one method is that i can find out each of uh, four eigenvalues and then corresponding to that i'll find out four eigenvectors but that would be much more lengthy than that so that's why i have to go through each option one by one just uh, work using calculator or just try to practice some questions so that you can do it much less time okay but be careful while solving because sometimes it happens that we do a calculation mistakes when we are in a hurry okay so if this is clear let's move to the next question so this is another question guys just let me know what would be the answer here uh i haven't decided the timing for the class basically we have to cover all the questions so we'll see how long it goes so guys it's up to you if you solve questions uh early then we'll end the class early otherwise we'll 
complete all the questions so i i told you i have here around 29 to 30 questions so i'm going to work on all the questions in today's session Okay, so guys, uh, for this question, uh, if like basically, if you will multiply this question, you would find out that this is system of linear equation. So just don't solve it by using rank method or any other method. I have given the option, so I'll try each of the option. Let's put a is equals to two and b is equals to two. If I'll put a two and b two uh, and c zero, I'll get. Let's say if I'll pick here. So what would I get in result a2, b2 and c0? I'll get 2 plus 2, 4 and 2. But that does not matches our options. Option A is not correct. A0, b2, c2. So yeah, that would match. That would give the results 2, 2, 4. Similarly, if I'll check c, a2 and b2, that would give me 4, 2, 2. That would also not match us. C is also not correct. And similarly, you will get here that d is also not correct because it would give me the result 2 2 2 so here option b is correct okay so here option c is correct option b is correct sorry guys option b is correct rajveer please check here option b is correct Okay, so guys, let me know. Uh, let me know if uh, there is any topic you have confusion in linear algebra because next slide onwards, I have questions based on calculus. I hope we have covered every type of question system of linear equation, eigenvalue, eigenvector determinants. I think we have covered. And guys, one more thing that if you face any doubt in uh, after this session as well you can post that in the comment section we'll discuss it in the next class okay yeah so let's move forward and if you have any query or any question just post that in the chat section right now otherwise let's see this question yeah this is another question based on limit i told you that limit topic is very important for calculus right there is always one question based on calculus kelly hamilton theorem is important sometimes they ask question on kelly hamilton theorem so you should know that uh, how to work on kelly hamilton theorem it's not much of the importance because if i'll see the previous year question they are not asking a lot of question based on kelly hamilton theorem but you should know yeah so guys this is a question you have to find out the limit for the uh, fraction function given to me here. Uh, Sufia, for which question you are asking to for explanation this one or the previous one uh, this one I'm going to tell just let me know if you want for the previous one just let me know uh, 
okay so guys uh, have you heard about l hospital room because there are lots of there are all the question based on this uh, for met or i'll say that this rule what it says let's say if i am finding out limit x approaches to a fx upon gx and if i am getting if i am getting 0 by 0 or infinity by infinity these kind of form we call these forms as indeterminate form indeterminate form indeterminate forms if we are getting these kind of forms so what would i do i'll write down this limit equals to limit x approaches to a f dash x upon g dash x that means i'll take a differentiation of numerator and denominator okay so that is my uh, rule here so what would i do here uh, i'll write down here limit x approaches to minus 3 because you guys are getting 0 by 0 form so i'll differentiate numerator and denominator by differentiating numerator i'll get 1 by square root 2x plus 22 and differentiation of 2x would be 2 and differentiation of minus 4 would be 0 and differentiation of x plus 3 would be 1 right and for this for solving the limit you should know all the differentiation formula so if i'll put minus 3 here what would i get here sorry 1 upon square it differentiation would be 1 upon 2 root square root 2x plus 22 because differentiation of square root x would be 1 by 2 root x so 2 and 2 get cancel here i am left with 1 by 2x plus 22 2 into minus 3 that is 6 22 minus 6 that is 16 square root of 16 that is 4 1 by 4 gives me the value 0.25. Like Aman, you uh, got the answer correct. 0.25 is my correct answer. Ah, uh, right. We will do differentiation for both numerator and denominator. Okay. Sufia is asking for the previous question, guys. Let me know if there is any problem in this. Otherwise, I am just discussing the previous question once. So, Sufia, what we have done in this? Ah, uh, I have given right hand side is 2 to 4. what i have done i have taken the first option is given to me a2 b2 c0 so i have filled all the values 1 1 0 and b would be 2 0 1 1 and c would be 0 here 1 0 1 so i have solved it if i'll solve the right hand side if i'll get it is equals to the left hand side then it is correct otherwise it is not correct so here i'll get this as 2 2 into 1 2 0 and plus 0 2 2 and that would be 0 0 0 0 so i have seen that i get this as 2 4 2 but left hand side is 2 2 4 so option a is not correct right similarly i'll do for option b if i'll do for option b here instead of 2 2 0 instead of 2 2 0 i have here let's see what i have here 0 2 2 I'll write down zero two two. If I'll solve the right hand side now, I'll get zero zero zero. This would become zero two two, and this would become two zero two. So you can see that on solving, you will get two two four. So which is equal to the left hand side. So option B is correct. Now, if you will check similarly for option C and D, you would not get the right answer. so basically uh, uh right aman it is um, like somewhat if i'll make a bar on o then i can write down this as uh, hospital otherwise the pronunciation is hospital right hospital right apost if i am able there are too many pronunciation for there uh, too many uh, notation for that right so so i hope sufia this question is clear just let me know if you have confusion uh now hello peter so i hope this is clear let's solve for next question let's try this one guys Let's try this one again based on L Hospital rule.
yeah it is again if you are getting zero by zero form then you have to use a orbital rule okay so guys uh, if you guys are getting uh, zero by zero form then you have to apply as orbital rule so i can see here a to the power zero is one and b to the power zero is one minus one is zero and sine zero is zero so that's why uh, we will get here zero by zero form so what would i do i'll differentiate numerator and denominator limit x approaches to zero differentiation of a to the power mx would be m a to the power mx log a instead of log log i'll write down ln log a minus m b to the power mx log b and differentiation of sine kx would be k cos kx right now if i'll put x is equals to zero here so what would i get m log a minus m log b upon k right so uh, 1 by k I can write down outside and because of logarithmic property x log y is equals to y to the power x so I'll write down here log a to the power m minus log b to the power m right and we know that log a minus log b is equals to log a by b so can I write down log a to the power m upon b to the power m so I can see that option a matches to my answer so here option a is correct uh, Saurabh, uh, just check it that we do not get any two here, right? Option A would be correct. Right, so yeah, option A is correct. Let's see next question. So now you know that how to apply L orbital rule. Yeah, this is the next question. We have to find out this limit x approaches to 0, 10x minus x upon x cube. Again, if you will find solve this, you will get zero by zero form. Or uh, 10x ka differentiation so x square x, right? Would we get 1 by 3 as an answer, Aman? Just check it once again. I don't think that we would get. 
I'm getting C. Uh, so guys, uh, what I would do here, I'll apply L hospital rule because it is 0 by 0. So differentiation of 10x would be 6 square x minus 1. Limit x approaches to 0 and it would become 3x square. But again, if I'll put x 0 here, 6 0 is 1 and 1 minus 1 0 and 3 into 0. Again, I'm getting 0 by 0 form. If I'm again getting 0 by 0 form, can I apply L hospital rule? Yeah, obviously I can. So I'll write down limit x approaches to 0, sec square x differentiation would be 2 sec x and differentiation of sec x would be sec x 10 x. So it would become sec square x 10 x upon 6 x. Uh, right, Aman. Okay, okay. So basically, if I'll cancel out this 2 into 3 x. So I, if I'll write down limit x approaches to 0, sec square x. And if I'll write down 10 x by x. So if you remember 10x by x, sin x by x gives me 1 as my limit. So I can uh, I can break down this product over this. Limit x approaches to 0 sec square x and limit x approaches to 0 10x by x. Again, I can apply L hospital rule in this. It would become 1 and if I'll apply L hospital rule, I'll get, sorry, I have 3 as well. Let's keep it 1 by 3 outside. So 1 by 3 into 1 into 1, I'll get 1 by 3 as my limit. Right, Aman, 1 by 3 is correct. I just want to know that you told us that uh, we are not going to use the differentiation. Uh, have you used the expansion of 10x? Or which method uh, you have gone through for the limit here? Ha, okay, expansion series. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can do that. But you have to remember that series. Okay, so we get this limit as 1 by 3. Just let me know, guys, if there is any confusion in this question. Yeah. You just, like we have some expansions here that like sine x expansion is 1 minus x square by 2 factorial plus x cube by x to the power 4 by sorry sine x expansion is x minus x cube by 3 factorial. This is sine x expansion x minus x cube by 3 factorial plus x to the power 5 by 5 factorial. So you can use these expansions. Similarly, we have cos x expansion as well, which is 1 minus x square by 2 factorial, x to the power 4 by 4 factorial like this. And similarly, I think we have 10x expansion. Uh, let me just check. I usually don't remember these expansion. So I do not. Let me check what would be the expansion for 10x. Expansion. Okay, what is a 10x? x plus 1 by 3x cube. Okay, so it's something like x plus 1 by 3x cube plus 2 by 15 x to the power 5. So this is a kind of expansion for 10x I have. Similarly, we have expansion for e to the power x and all other, like e to the power x as 1 plus x plus x square by 2 factorial x cube by 3 factorial. So you can use these expansion. Now, if you will fill this 10x expansion here, x and x get cancelled uh, because of minus sign and then x cube from the numerator get cancelled with x cube to the denominator, you would left with 1 by 3. All other have higher power. If you will put x0, all terms get 0. Right. So there would be, uh, yeah, if it is, if you are able to remember these series, then it would be okay. Otherwise, you can work on L hospital as well. But that is a little bit lengthy. Uh, using L hospital, like you can see that we have to apply three time L hospital to get the answer. So, yeah. If you are able to remember this series, this would help you to solve the question. 
right amma okay now let's check this how to find out this uh, limit this i think this is a question from gate cs 2022 okay uh, so all of you are getting minus 1 by 2 as an answer just check all other so again you are getting zero by zero form if you will apply limit x approaches to zero what would i do i'll differentiate numerator and denominator so in numerator if i differentiate i'll get 1 by 2 root x and if i differentiate 1 that would be zero minus e to the power 2 root x remain same and if i differentiate 2 a uh, root x it would become 1 by 2 root x 2 and 2 get cancelled and i can see here 1 by root x cancelled with 1 by root x so i'll get here minus 1 by 2 e to the part 2 root x limit x approaches to 0 if i'll fill the value x as 0 i'll get minus 1 by 2 as a limit is it okay to leave distribution functions and random variable right j if you do not have much of the time to work on that you can leave that because there are not so many questions uh, gets asked in previous year basically they ask questions on probability and if you have other things to revise if you have time then you can give 2 to 3 days otherwise it's okay that because uh, i think right now it is time that you should revise all uh you have studied before or you practice questions based on that it is not the time to study new topics okay so yeah let's solve next question so this is a next question this is based on continuity yeah we can say that there should be 5 to 7 marks oh uh, basically they ask for 5 marks but sometimes there might be a possibility like if i talk about 2022 if uh, discrete and uh, engineering mathematics both are about 17 to 18 marks i think there are too many questions from discrete mathematics okay so yeah so we are getting minus 1 by 2 as an answer for this one as well let's see yeah
okay so the question says that uh, for what value of lambda the functions defined by continuous at x is equals to 0 we know that for continuity limit extending to 0 negative fx is equals to limit x approaches to 0 positive fx and f of 0 so if i'll consider this portion only this one so limit extending to 0 positive so x is less than 0 function is defined this and it is saying otherwise so that means x is greater than 0 so i'll write down limit extending to 0 positive 4x plus 1 and f of 0 would be lambda into 0 square minus 2 if i'll put this limit i'll get this one minus 2 lambda here lambda would become minus 1 by 2 right so here lambda is minus 1 by 2 okay so i hope this is clear let's see next question Next question is this based on Lagrange mean value theorem. Uh, these are basic statements of LMVT. You can remember that, uh, like LMVT says that usually they do not ask question, but I prefer that students know because the, it is very simple. It says that they're, they're, if f is continuous and differentiable on this interval, then there exists C belongings to on this interval 0, 8 open interval such that f dash C is equals to f of B minus f of A upon B minus A. So here in this case, f of 8 minus f of 0 upon 8 minus 0. And f dash c would be, if I'll find out f dash x, f dash x is 8 minus 2x. So it would become 8 minus 2c. So you have just have to find out the value of c. So 8 minus 2c, if you will put f of 8 here, 8 into 8 minus. So it would give me 0 by 8. So if you will solve, you will get c is equals to 4, right? So option A is correct. So this is a simple statement. You can remember this. I don't think that it would be much of a problem. Option A is correct. Am I done something wrong here? Guys, you guys are saying that zero would be the answer. Just check it once, guys. Just remember the LMVT statement rules theorem uh, would be uh, based on that because in rules theorem, if I'll add f of a is equals to f of b, like you can see that in this question, we have rules theorem also gets applied because f of a is equals to f of b. Okay, so yeah. Let's see next question. Just try this one question, guys. I hope all of you know about maxima and minima.
okay so guys here you can see that x is equals to minus 1 and 2 are extreme points of fx is equals to log mod alpha log mod x beta square plus x so you can see say that f of minus if i'll find out f dash minus 1 would be 0 and f dash 2 would be 0 that are extreme points extreme points are what critical points where derivative is 0 so if i'll find out f dash x what would it become alpha by mod x plus 2 beta x plus 1. So if I write down f dash of minus 1, that would become alpha upon mod of minus 1. That would give me alpha plus 2 beta of minus 1. That means minus 2 beta plus 1. That is equals to 0. Similarly, if I write down f dash 2, f dash 2 would be alpha by 2 plus 4 beta plus 1 is equals to 0. So now if I solve alpha plus 8 beta, is equals to minus 2 and here alpha minus 2 beta is equals to minus 1. If I'll solve this alpha minus 2 beta is equals to minus 1, minus and plus, minus minus get cancelled, 8, 9, 10 beta. And this, I think I have done something wrong. Let me just check guys, just give me a minute. Okay, alpha minus 2 beta. Okay, so guys, you have to do it like this. So if x is greater than 0, x is greater than 0, then your function is alpha log x plus beta x square plus x. So in this case, f dash x would be alpha by x plus 2 beta x plus 1 so you would get if you will find out f dash minus f dash of 2 you will get f dash 2 is equals to 0 that would give me alpha by 2 plus 4 beta plus 1 is equals to 0 that means alpha plus 8 beta plus 2 equals to 0 if x is less than 0 then your function is defined as alpha log of minus x plus beta x square plus x because of modulus definition. If you will find out f dash x here, alpha upon minus x and differentiation of minus x would be minus 1 plus 2 beta x plus 1 equals to 0. And they are saying that f dash of minus 1 is equals to f dash of minus 1 is equals to 0. So alpha upon minus 1, alpha upon minus 1. Alpha upon minus 1 plus 2 beta into minus 1 plus 1 equals to 0. So you will get minus alpha minus 2 beta plus 1 equals to 0. Now if I'll add these two equations, add equation 1 and 2, alpha and alpha get cancelled. 8 minus 2 beta that would give me 6 beta. 2 plus 1 that is 3 is equals to 0. So what I have done, I have added these two equations. So beta I get from here as minus 1 by 2. Let's put beta in any of the equation. If I'll put beta is equals to minus 1 by 2 in this equation, I'll get plus 1 plus 1 and alpha would become 2. So alpha is 2, beta is minus 1 by 2. So here option B is correct. So I hope you get this uh, right to equation 2 unknown. So guys, I have done one mistake previously. I have taken the function modulus of x. I have to take if x is greater than 0, it is more alpha log x. If x is less than 0, it is minus x. Maximum and minimum value kaise nikalenge? Okay, so I think I have the next question based on that. So we'll discuss in that question that how to find out maximum and minimum value. Just let me know, guys, if there is any confusion in this question. Okay, so let's see next question. So they are asking for the maximum value of the function in this question. Let me see. Yeah. 
in this question they are asking for the maximum value so for maximum and minimum value first what we have to do we have to find out the derivative of a function derivative would be 4x minus 2 and i have to equate it with 0 to find out all the extreme points uh, right sort of this is little bit tricky question yeah this was tricky. so x i got from here 1 by 2 and guys when we have given a closed interval when we have given an interval we consider end point also as an extreme point so x is equals to 0 so we have three extreme points here first i have find out using the derivative equating it with 0 and other i have taken the end points of the interval now what would i do i'll take i'll find out values at all these points so f of 1 by 2 would be if i'll find out f of 1 by 2 2 into 1 by 4 minus 2 into 1 by 2 plus 6 i'll get this 6 minus 1 that is 5 plus 1 by 2 that is 11 by 2 and if i'll find out f of 0 that would be 6 and f of 2 would be 4 minus sorry 8 minus 4 plus 6 so that would give me 10 so you can see that out of these three values 10 is my maximum value right this is one thing if i have given an interval if i do not have an interval then what would i do i'll if i do let's say if i do not have an interval then i got this critical point x is equals to 2 i'll not do all these things because that all these things i have done because i have given an interval i'll find out that double derivative double derivative i get 4 which is greater than 0 so at this point i have a maxima sorry i have a minima if derivative is greater than 0 if in case i'll get derivative less than 0 then i'll have maxima all right that's how i'll work on maxima and minima but right now we have given an interval so we'll work like that so i hope it is clear that so uh, guys one thing that if you have given an interval just find out uh, all the extreme points and then we'll work on you know, finding out the function value at those extreme points and see where i am getting a maxima where i am getting a minima okay so just let me know guys if there is any confusion in this question for ft only that subject is okay j uh, in further sessions in further marathon session there would be one session scheduled for aptitude as well just join that session and that would be able to help you in all the preparation for aptitude otherwise just do one thing just take uh, five to ten years of paper and each paper has ten questions for aptitude just solve them by yourself if double derivative equals to zero then there would be a settle point that means neither minimum nor maximum because if i'll take this function fx is equals to x cube and if i'll get one critical point which is extreme point x is equals to zero but we'll take uh, we'll find out double derivative and their double derivative is zero so it is a settle point neither maximum nor minimum in case interval not given out of given options 10 would be correct no in that case you cannot say 10 would be correct yeah let's say let's solve this question i think uh, so guys uh, just one thing uh, just want to tell you that area under the curve is finding out using an integration so let's say if i have given this function fx and i want to find out area in, under this curve what would i'll do i'll find out fx and i'll integrate i think it would give me a whole yeah yeah it would give me the area under the under this curve right integration fx dx so now let's solve it so now in this question they are saying that a function yx is defined in this interval 0 comma 1 on the x-axis as it taking from 0 to 1 by 3 it is taking the value 2 1 by 3 to 3 by 4 it is taking value 3 3 by 4 to 1 it is taking the value 1 so which of the following is the area under the curve for the interval 0 comma 1 on the x-axis so what would i do i'll integrate yx function over this curve 0 to 1 to find out the area 
so i have given 0 to 1 by 3 i have given y x is equals to 2 i'll integrate it and from 1 by 3 to 3 by 4 i have given 3 i'll integrate it from 3 by 4 to 1 i'll take this and i'll integrate it right so i'll integrate so what would i get 2 x x would be the integration 1 by 3 minus 0 plus 3 into 3 by 4 minus 1 by 3 plus 1 into 1 minus 3 by 4. Now you can solve it to get an answer. Uh, right. Uh, Saurabh, so uh, in the case interval not given, we'll say that the function maxima does not exist because we are giving only we are getting only one extreme point, and at that extreme point, we are getting a minima. Okay, so guys, on solving, you told me that we are getting option D. Yeah, and option D is correct. Okay, so this is based on calculation. So guys, I hope we have covered all the questions and all the different types of calculus. I think we are left with one definite integral and we have already covered in this as well. Just try uh, if you do not, if you have some questions, you can post that in the comment section. We will discuss it in the next class. Otherwise, let's move forward to probability section. Uh, just let me know, uh, should we move forward to probability section? Or do you guys need a five minute break? Just let me know. Uh, I told you that there is no need to uh, remember Rose theorem formula. Uh, I told you previously that this is my Lagrange formula. F dash C is equals to F of B minus F of A. What would happen if F of A is equals to F of B? Then F dash C would become zero. Like this is a statement of a rule f dash c is equals to zero. Like what does it mean that uh, uh, we do not? Uh, that means function is continuous and differentiable, and functions are at endpoints are equal of the interval. Like tell me, guys, should we continue or do we take a break for five minutes? Just let me know. Just let me know, then we'll move forward accordingly. I think how many questions we are left with. Okay, so guys, I am co continuing because you guys are not answering. So let's continue further questions. Okay, do you need a break? Okay, so let's take a five minute break, guys. Uh, let's take a break. And we'll meet after five minutes. So just don't go anywhere. Right. I'm coming in five minutes. So yeah, let's meet after five minutes, guys.
ओके सो गाइस शुड वी कंटिन्यू ओके सो गाइस वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट क्वेश्चंस बेस्ड ऑन प्रोबेबिलिटी okay so we have this question consider a random variable x that takes value plus 1 and minus 1 with probability 0.5 each then we have to find out the cumulative distribution function fx at x is equals to minus 1 and plus 1 so we have to tell them Uh, guys, I hope all of you know what is uh, cumulative distribution function. Basically, cumulative distribution function capital F X gives me probability X is less capital F X probability F X or oh, let's say probability X is less than equal to X. डिस्क्रीट मैथ्स का क्लास कब होगा लेट मी टेल यू द स्केड्यूल फॉर डिस्क्रीट मैथमेटिक्स जस्ट अ मिनट लेट मी सी डिस्क्रीट मैथमेटिक्स वुड बी ऑन इलेवन जनवरी इलेवन एम सेम टाइमिंग इट वुड बी ऑन इलेवन ऑफ जनवरी Okay, so we have to find out the value for capital F X. So can I first write down probability distribution function? Probability distribution function is given to me at minus one. We X is equals to minus one. We have probability uh, of point five, and at X is equals to one, we have probability point five. So can you tell me what would be the cumulative distribution function? Which of the option would be true here? so guys if i'll find out capital f value at minus 1 so probability x is less than equal to minus 1 so there is no value which is less than there is only x value which is minus 1 so it would be 0.5 now uh, then they ask me to find out cumulative distribution at 1 so that means probability x is less than equal to 1 so for this i have probability x is equals to minus 1 and probability x is equals to 1 that means 0.5 plus 0.5 that would give me 1 so 0.5 and 1 are the values of cumulative distribution function so here option c is correct all right so here option c is correct so i hope this is clear okay now let's see next question just let me know if there is any confusion in this otherwise let's see next question so this is a next question two people p and q decide to independently roll two identical dice each with six faces numbered from 1 to 6 the person with lower number wins in case of a tie they roll the dice repeatedly until there is no tie define a trial as a throw of the dice by p and q assume that all six numbers on each dice are equally probable equally probable means that each of the number has equal probability and all the trials are independent here then they ask me to find out the probability that one of them wins on the third trial is 
we have to find out the probability that one of them wins on the third try. Just try this one, guys. Anyone, guys, how do we approach this question? Okay. Okay, yeah, uh, let's solve this. So you can see that they are asking that one of them wins on the third trial. And we know that they uh, would, in the first and second trial, they would be having a tie. In first and second trial, they would be having a tie. So can I say that probability that one of them would be uh, win on the third trial would be that on the first trial, uh, on the first trial there would be a tie. On the second trial, there would be a tie. And on the third trial, they uh, any of them wins no time can i write down that that any of them wins i do not care which one wins but any of them wins so what would i do how how do i find out probability of getting a tie so they will get a tie that let's say if uh, one p is getting one then q should have one if p is getting two then q should be uh, q also have two if p is three Q would also be 3. Otherwise, let's say if one has 2 and another one has 4, then the lower number, which has 2 wins. So, there would be a tie if each, both of them have the same number occurring. So, both of them have a same number occurring with the probability 1 by 6 and 1 by 6. And there are 6 numbers possible for that. So, we will get the 6 because either they can have both have 1, either they both can have 2, either both can have 3. So, 6 and 6 get cancelled. So we'll get 1 by 6. Now probability of not getting a tie. So what it would be? It would become 1 minus 1 by 6. That means 5 by 6. So now I can find out that probability one of them wins on the third trial. 1 by 6 into 1 by 6 into 5 by 6. 
Now let's solve this. What would I get? 5 upon 6 into 6, 36 into 6, 216. Now just you can solve it using calculator. You will get the exact answer. Uh, 6 by 36 would not work here. Uh, I hope you get it why 6 by 36 would not work. Okay, just let me know guys if there is any confusion now. Just let me know. If not, let's 5 by 6 is also not correct because a 5 by 6 is probability of not probability of winning. But what about that? They do not win in the first and second trial. I have to consider that as well, right? Okay, let's see next question. Just let me know, guys, if there is any confusion in this right now. So, yeah, on calculation, you will get this something 0 0.02 on solving. Okay, so this is another question. It says that a box contains 15 blue balls and 45 black balls. Two balls are selected randomly without replacement. The probability of an outcome in which first selected is a blue ball and the second selected is a black ball else. So, we have to find out that probability. Okay, so the question saying that a box contains 15 blue balls and 45 black balls. Two balls are selected randomly without replacement. So we haven't replaced that ball back in the back. Probability in which first selected is a blue ball and the second selected is a black ball. So we in total we have 15 blue balls. So 15 upon 60 is a probability that first selected ball is blue ball. Now I, go, I am left with 14 blue balls and in total I have 59 balls right so now probability of a selected ball is a black ball that would be 45 upon 59 right now i can solve this to get an answer so 15 fours are 60 so it would become 49 by 236 option b is correct so for these type of question you should know okay so i'll try to do that if i'll get time for all the concepts okay so here option b is correct so guys for these type of question you know the concept of without replacement and with the replacement then you would be able to solve questions now next question we have here is for a given biased coin the probability that outcome of a toss is had is 0.4 the coin is tossed thousand times x denote the probability whose value is the number of times that a had appeared in these thousand tosses then we have to find out standard deviation of x so in this question we have to find out standard deviation of x Uh, right, right, right. So, guys, you can see that this is a binomial distribution because we have a Bernoulli trial and we are doing that trial thousand times, right? So, this is a Bernoulli trial binomial distribution question. N is equals to thousand, and probability p is getting a success. So, success is that head appeared. Getting a head is a success. So, 0.4 is a success probability. If I'll find out 
probability of a failure that would be 1 minus 0.4 that is 1.6 and i told you so many times to remember uh, the formula for standard deviation variance and mean for all the distributions. So we know that binomial theorem, binomial distribution has standard deviation square root of NPQ. This is a standard deviation for binomial distribution, square root of NPQ. So square root of 1000 into 0.4 into 0.6. Like so, I'll get here 10, I'll get here 10. This would get cancelled. I'll get square root of 240. On solving, you will get something 15 point something. So you can see that here option A is correct. So guys, remembering all the distributions, mean, variance, and standard deviation help you to solve these type of questions. Uh, right, square root 240 would be the answer. Let's see next question. So this is the next question, guys. Okay, already answer is visible, but then let's just solve by yourself. I told you the formula of expectation, right? So the question here says that continue. Uh, let consider a continuous random variable f x defined by f x is equals to one by two, where x lies between zero to six. We have to find out expectation of x square plus x plus one. So how do I do that? Let's try it once. Uh, so guys, I'll make you remember that if I have to find out expectation of GX or uh, what would I do? Integration of GX and probability distribution is given to me FX then DX. I'll integrate over the whole domain where FX is defined. So here if I have to find out expectation of X square plus X plus 1. So what would I do? I'll integrate X square plus X plus 1 into FX and into DX. So it would become x square plus x plus 1. fx is 0 otherwise and it is given to me 1 by 2 on the interval 0 to 6. 0 to 6. So I'll take 1 by 2 outside and let's integrate. It would become x cube by 3. And this would become x square by 2 plus x and it goes from 0 to 6. What would it become? Z 1 by 2, 6, 6, 36. 2, 2, 3, 6, 72, 6, 3 is 18, plus 6, we'll get this. So if I'll solve this, 72 plus 18, 18, 96 by 2. And that would give me 48. So here option C is correct. So you can find out expectation of any function given if you have a probability distribution and you want to know, you know that for which function you have to find out the expectation. Just let me know, guys, if it is clear. If there is any question, please ask. Otherwise, I'll move forward to the next question. Okay, so let's try this question. If this is clear, this is question based on conditional probability. So they ask me like P of E denote the probability of the event E. We have given probability of A is equals to 1, probability B is equals to 1 by 2. Then they ask me to find out probability A given B and probability B given A respectively R. So we have to find out these probabilities. So just try this.
A and B are independent events. No, uh, E is an event. So A would be the subset of A and B would be the subset of E. They can't be an independent event. So, uh, yeah, guys, um, most of you are giving the right answer. So probability of A is 1 and probability of B is 1 by 2. So can I say that B is a subset of A? Right, because A and B are, uh, because of the event E, A and B are subsets of E. And we have given that probability A is 1, probability B is 1 by 2. So B should be a subset of A. So if I want to find out probability A given B, it would become probability A intersection B upon probability of B. What is A intersection B? Probability of B upon probability of B because B is a subset of A. These two gets cancelled, we'll get one. Now, when somebody asks me to find out probability B given A, that would become probability B intersection A upon probability of A. What is probability B intersection A? Again, probability B upon probability of A. So, it would become 1 by 2 upon 1. We'll get 1 by 2 as the probability. So, right, option D is correct here. Uh, right, guys, all of you have given the correct answer. Option D is the correct answer. So, I hope all of you understood that why option D is correct. Let's see next question. Yeah, this is our next question based on Poisson distribution. This gets asked in GATE CS 2017. It says there. A random variable x has a Poisson distribution with mean 5 and then the expectation of x plus 2 square equals. Just try this one guys. Okay, so basically, guys, uh, let me make you understand Poisson distribution. So, guys, do you, uh, let's say, let's understand with an example, then that would be more feasible for you. Let's say uh, I have a one hour session. I have a one hour session and uh, students ask me, in on an average, students ask me five doubts, right? In a one hour session, let me write down here. In a one hour session, on an average, five students ask me doubt. Right. So on a cert, on a particular day, I want to know that what would be the probability that seven students would ask me the question or ask me doubts in a one hour session. Right. That is Poisson distribution. So that means if we are given uh, the probability, no, it is not similar to normal distribution. Normal distribution is completely different. So. Uh, so that means on an average, if we know that what would be the probability on an average of happening that or number of times uh, uh, on an average this event happened or on a particular number of times it would happen. If I have to find out that I'll use Poisson distribution. Similarly, let's take one example that in a restaurant, I have 100 on an average 100 customers per day come, right? They cater 100 customers per day. So they want to know what would be the probability that there would be 120 customers on any particular day. You can see that how much it is important because if there is a greater probability of 120 customers coming to that particular restaurant, then they would have all the resources for that. They have to make all the availabilities and all the requirements they have. They have to complete it. So that's where Poison distribution gets used. Right. So if I talk about Poisson distribution, it's distribution. Uh, it has the distribution lambda to the power x upon x factorial, e to the power minus lambda, lambda to the power x upon x factorial. This is its uh, probability distribution. And it is, a, it is a discrete distribution, right? Normal distribution is continuous distribution. So here x is a uh, discrete number, right? And 
uh, if I'll talk about expectation of this random variable that is lambda and variance of x is also lambda. Both expectation and variance in this case is lambda. So lam what is lambda? Lambda on an average an event is occurring how many times is the value lambda. And if I want to know that what would be the probability of happening an event that particular time is given by Poisson distribution. So that is a Poisson distribution. Right now, so in this question, they ask me to find out expectation of x plus 2 square because they have given me 5 as my mean. And I know that mean is lambda. And so can I say that variance of x is also lambda 5? I have to find out expectation of x plus 2 square. So it would become expectation of x square plus 4 plus 2x. And I know that I can write down this as expectation of x square plus 4 plus 2 into expectation of x. Right. What is expectation of x square? I do not know right now. Plus 4, 2 into expectation of x is 5. So can I write down this as expectation of x square plus 2 fives are 10 plus 4 40. But I know variance of x. So variance of x formula is expectation of x square minus expectation of x whole square that is 5. So can I write down here is expectation of x whole square that is 5 square that is 5. So I can write down this as 5 plus 25. I'll get expectation of x square is equals to 30. So let's put this value. Uh, 5, 30. Uh, just a minute where I have uh, done I have done something wrong x square plus 4 okay so guys it would be 4x okay sorry sorry guys I have just made an error in opening the square that's why I was getting an error this would be 4x 4 into expectation of x and that would become 24 so now it would become 30 plus 24 that would give me 54 as an answer. So you can see that by remembering variance and expectation, 54 would be the answer, uh, not 44, because a whole square would be x square plus 4 plus 4x. Yeah, 54 would be the answer. Just let me know uh, if it is clear. Okay, so let's see next question. So yeah, this is the next question and I think, okay, we are left with two questions. So the question here says that lifetime of a component of a certain type is a random variable whose probability density, do we need to see student T distribution, not for gate computer science. You just have to see uh, binomial, Poisson, exponential, uniform distribution, normal and standard normal these six distribution just if you do not want to go in de detail just go through the topics and their probability distribution their mean and variance and how do we find out that in this question we have to apply binomial distribution for da yes for da you have to work on t distribution chi square because you can see now in their syllabus they have mentioned t test and chi square test so you should know and t distribution is basically similar to normal distribution. Okay, so let's see. Lifetime of a component of a certain type is a random variable whose probability density function is exponentially distributed with parameter 2. So in this case, lambda is equals to 2. We have a parameter uh, lambda is equals to 2 in exponential distribution as well for a randomly picked component probability that its lifetime exceeds the expected lifetime uh, so for if i'll find out probability x is for 
exponential distribution the probability density function would be e to the power minus lambda x lambda e to the power minus lambda x and lambda is given to me too now they ask me to find out lambda e to the power minus lambda x upon x factorial guys let me see what would be the distribution i just do not remember right now exponential distribution exponential distribution lambda e to the power minus lambda x right it's not x factorial in denominator let's remove that hmm. now they are asking me that probability that its lifetime exceeds the expected lifetime and if you remember the expectation of probability is uh, expectation of exponential distribution is 1 by lambda that is 1 by 2 so we have to find out probability x is greater than expectation of x that means i have to find out probability x is greater than equal to 1 by 2 and it is greater given to me x is greater than 0 so that means i can integrate from 1 by 2 to infinity lambda e to the power minus lambda x that means 2 e to the power minus 2x 2 e to the power minus 2x dx so if i'll integrate i'll get the probability 2 e to the power minus 2x upon minus 2 from 1 by 2 to infinity 2 and 2 get cancelled e to the power minus infinity 0 plus minus minus plus e to the power minus 1 now you can solve it what would be the value for e to the power minus 1 i think it would be something 0.37 let's just check by yourself so yeah option a is correct here so i hope it is clear just let me know guys if there is any confusion in this question many questions they are on random variable uh not so many like each year they ask one question so there would be one question in a year so if so uh, jay what you can do uh, here is just go through all the distributions once and their variance and standard deviation variance and mean just remember that if you want to go through it and i think i have taken a lecture on that and in precise uh, in very much less time i think i have covered it let me see if i have done it just give me a minute guys let me check so that i can share a link with you if i you have to cover probability distribution probability Uh, guys in the live section if you will search probability distribution let me see probability yeah uh, let me share the link for this session guys in this session i have covered in the later part i think half an hour uh, i have covered all the distribution so just check this out I have shared the link. Just check it out. I think uh, you would be able to cover, and I have also solved questions here. Yeah, I have covered all the expectation and standard deviation. Just go through that in this lecture. How many people are? keeping the deal paper okay yeah so guys let's move to our last question so this is the last question based on probability just try this once and then we'll end up our session and then i'll meet you on 11th of january uh, in which i'll discuss questions based on discrete mathematics
Aman, you are asking for DA. Like I have shared this for uh, just uh, I have shared this for gate computer science, not for DA guys. I have shared this session for D, uh, for gate computer science. It's not sufficient for DA because DA has a very vast syllabus. Okay, so this is our next question. It says that an examination paper has 150 multiple choice question of one mark each with each question having four choices. Each incorrect answer fetches minus 0.25 marks and thousand students choose all their answers randomly with uniform probability. The sum total of the expected marks obtained by these students is. Guys, uh, uniform probability means that each of the question has equal probability of getting correct or getting wrong. So we know that they are multiple choice questions. So each question has a probability of getting correct is 1 by 4. Probability of getting a question correct and what would be a probability of getting a question incorrect that is 3 by 4. Right? So. So I can see that they would uh, get one mark probability of let's say x be a random variable which calculates the marks. So probability that they would get one mark is 1 by 4 and they would get uh, minus 0.25 marks that would be 3 by 4. Right. So I want to find out the expectation. So expectation would be 1 into 1 by 4 plus Minus 0.25 into 3 by 4. So can I write down minus 0.75? 1 minus 0.75. Yeah, right. 1 minus 0.75. So that would give me 0.25 by 4. 0.25 by 4. That would give me 1 by 16. So expectation of x would be 16. But we have to find out expectation for total of the expected marks obtained by all these students. So 1 by 16 is the expectation for one question for one student. So for 150 questions, it would get multiplied with 150. For 1,000 students, it would get multiplied with 1,000. Now, if I'll solve this, just solve this and calculate because I already have solved it. So I know that on calculation, you would get option D as your correct answer. Gate CSC does it make difference? What difference? Sorry. Two five five zero is the answer. Oh, let me check. Calculator. One fifty into thousand. Divided by 16. 9375 would be the answer. <laughs> okay, so here option D is correct. So, guys, that's all from my side. Just let me know if there is any question on engineering mathematics. I'll clear it and then we are going to continue in the next session, which will be on 11th of January, same timing, 11 a.m. We'll work on discrete mathematics. Uh, hello, guys. Welcome back to our YouTube channel, Geeks for Geeks Gate uh, Computer Science. In this session, we are going to discuss all the questions related to discrete mathematics. Just give me a quick thumbs up if everything is fine with my stream so that we can start our today's session. Uh, so we are going to solve all of the questions based on discrete mathematics. So we will cover every topic from discrete mathematics. You can ask me if there is any doubt in any question. We can discuss that as well. And yeah, just let me know if everything is fine. Just give me a quick thumbs up in the chat section. So that we can start our session.
ओके थैंक्स थैंक यू गाइस थैंक्स लेट मी शेयर माय स्क्रीन जस्ट लेट मी नो इफ इट इज ऑडिबल देन वी कैन हैव अवर सेशन वी कैन स्टार्ट आवर सेशन लुकिंग फॉर चीप okay so yeah everything is fine so let's start our session so guys before starting the session just want to tell you that uh, we are introduce we have we gfg as introduced our 390 challenge and in this 390 challenge you can win up to 90% of the amount you have paid for the course if you will complete 90% course in 90 days right but the condition is that the course you should buy from 1st january to 31st january between this timeline if you buy any course then you will get a 90% refund 90% of the amount which you have paid for if you will complete 90% of the syllabus in 90 days so guys it's a win win situation you uh, do not have to pay for the course and because of this uh, challenge you would be able to complete 90% of the course in 90 days okay so yeah you can take benefit from this guys and if there is any question about it just let me know in the chat section otherwise let's move to uh, the questions right discrete mathematics so guys uh, in discrete mathematics i have let me tell you just a minute Oh, just give me a minute. My pen tab is not working. Oh, uh, just give me a minute, guys. okay so in discrete mathematics first of all we have propositional and first order logic propositional and first order logic order logic then we have set theory in this set theory and then we have combinatorics in the set theory we have group theory function sets all these things gets covered in set theory section and then the last section which is very important we have is graph theory right so i have four sections in discrete mathematics so we are going to cover each of the section in today's session okay so let's start so guys uh, this is the first question from gate cs 2015 and this question is based on uh it is based on propositional and first order logic it says that consider the following statement first p statement says that good mobile phones are not cheap q statement says that cheap mobile phones are not good and l statement says that p implies q m statement says that q implies p n statement says that p is equivalent to q so we have to tell them which one of the following statement out of l m n n are true so guys tell me which of the statement is true here just try this question guys so the question here if you will see it's saying that good mobile phones are not cheap so if i'll consider if i will consider good mobile phones as p and cheap as q then i can form a 
uh, form a logical inference for this statement? Right, so what would I do? Only L is true. Just check it once, guys. Only L is true. Rajveer is saying that only L option is true. Only L statement is true. Just check it once. Uh, Rajveer, please check other statement as well. Are you getting that all others are incorrect? All are correct. Option D. Right, guys. What about other students? What you guys are getting? okay so the question is saying that good mobile phones are not cheap so what would we take we'll take p as good mobile phones and q as cheap so what would we get oh just give me a, a minute guys i'm facing some issue here with my pen tab Uh, just a minute. Just try this one. And Lord, I don't know why I'm facing this issue. Just give me a minute. okay yeah so what would we do we will take p as good mobile phones good mobile phones good mobile phones and q as cheap mobile phones right so what would this capital p statement would become it's saying that good mobile phones are not cheap that means it would say p implication negation of q right and q statement would say Cheap mobile phones are not good. That means Q implication negation of P. Then what is L? L is P implies Q. That means L would be P implication negation of Q. Implication Q implication negation of P. Right? This is my uh, L statement. And similarly, Q implication negation of P. Implication P implication negation of Q would be my QM statement. And 
n statement is that they are equivalent that means q implication negation of p is equivalent to p implication negation of q right so i get these as my l m and n statement now if you will check the truth value of these three statement you will get all these three value three values always true what would you do you would form a table p q and then check the inequality for capital p and capital q using this and then l m and n if you will solve this you will take the cases true 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 false false true and false false and it would give me always to l m and n you just check by yourself you will get all these values always true right i already solved it so i know that l m and n are always true just let me know guys if there is any confusion in this or would i uh, solve it completely or do you get it just let me know guys uh you can tell me uh, if i have to solve it completely if you get it then we i'll move to the next question because again i in today's lecture as well i have around 30 questions which uh, in which i tried to cover whole discrete mathematics right so and if any topic you have any doubt just let me know we'll discuss that topic completely first and then we'll move to the next question okay so let's move yeah this is another question it says that which of the following logical expressions are equivalent so in four statements we have given uh, the expressions now they are asking that which of the following logical expressions are equivalent tell me guys just try it okay so what would we do so we uh, if you guys have studied propositional and first order logic you would know what would be the propositional laws so you uh, have to use propositional laws to check that these statements are equivalent or not so what will we do because you can see here that this first statement you cannot uh, make any smaller by using propositional rule this first statement but in second statement i can take this negation inside so i'll solve this second statement i'll take the negation inside what would it become negation negation p and because of de morgan's theorem and would gets converted into or then negation q so it would become p or negation q this is similar to first so that means first and second are equivalent right first and second are equivalent now let's check for third option third option is p and q let's go for the third statement so can i take p common out of this because of distributive pro property so i'll take p common i'll get p and it would become q or negation q and we have later the statement negation p and negation q right can anybody tell me what would be the value for q or negation q what would it become q or negation q if i'll take q as true negation q would be false true or false gives me true similarly if i'll take q false negation q would be true it would give me always true so it would become p and true or negation p or negation q now p and true if i'll solve this p and true what would it give me what would it give me p and true it would always give me p right why it would give me p because if p is true it it would give me true if p is false it would give me false so that means it is giving me the uh, truth value of the value p so that's why i can write down here p p or negation p or negation q now i can break down this p or negation p or and it is this is or right this is and okay so guys there is one error this is not this is and i just have written this by mistake yeah now this is and negation p and negation q right so it would become p or p or negation p and p uh, or 
negation q right p or negation p again it would be true true and p or negation q because it would give me always the truth value of p or negation q so it would become p or negation q so it is same as for so that means for second and third are equivalent right for second third and equivalent can anybody tell me fourth would be equivalent or not because you i do not have to do solve it again the fourth option because i can see that if i'll make certain changes let's say if i'll change it to fourth one right i'll make it fourth so you can see that in this fourth option what i have to do i just have to erase this negation 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 because there is the only difference between third and fourth so negation gets removed negation gets removed so i'll left with p or q so which is not equivalent to first second or third so that means uh, fourth one is not equivalent only first second third are equivalent option b is correct right rajveer option b is a correct option here yeah option b is correct guys let me know if there is any problem otherwise let's solve this question just try to solve this question guys so this is another question it says that consider the following expressions and the expressions i have given here false q true and fourth one is p or q and fifth one is negation q or p then the number of expressions given above that are logically implied by p and p implication q is so we have to tell them that uh, above all the expressions how many number of expressions are logically implied by p and p implication q just tell me guys let's solve it so what would we do here let's consider this statement p and p implication q as a right if i'll consider this as a let's write down the truth table let me start from here p and q p would be true 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 false false true and false false these would be the four cases guys i hope it's visible all the four cases right last one is false false now what i want i want p implication q p implication q would be true false true true and the last one i want p and p implication q that is a truth value for a right this is a statement so it would become true and true and false gives me false and uh, it would be false and it would be false right so everybody get this value for the truth value of a now i want to know that if i write down a implication false it would it give me true or false Fit, similarly i have to work on a implication q a implication true a implication p or q a implication negation q or p so that means i want a implication first option so a implication false so let's check true implication false gives me false false implication false gives me true false uh, it would give me true so i can see that uh, the uh, the first option is not logically implied by this statement a why this is not implied by a because i can see that p and p implication q uh, implication false is giving me false in the first line in the first row it is giving me false as i am getting it false so i'll cancel out this is not giving this is not logically implied when it would be logically implied when i'll get always true now i'll move to a implication second a implication second means that means a implication q so that means this implication q true implication true false implication false that would be true false implication true that would be true false implication false that would be true so you can see that in each of the row i am getting the value true so that means this is logically implied second option is logically implied now i'll check a implication third one and a implication third one means a implication true so it would give me always true 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 so this is also logically implied now i have to find out first p or q truth value what would be p or q it would give me true true 
true and false now i'll find out a implication fourth option so a implication fourth option would be a implication p or q so it would give me true implication true true false implication true false implication true false implication false so i am again getting all the values true in each of the row so that is also logically implied now i'll move to a implication fifth option fifth option is a implication negation q or p but before that i have to find out the truth value for negation q or p so let's take negation q that would be true would become false false or true gives me for a true it would give me true value and it would give me false value and it would give me true value let me just check false right it would give me false value it would give me true value now if i'll check i'll get all the value a implication a is what this is a true implication true gives me true false implication true false implication false false implication true so i am getting in each of the row i am getting this true right so that's why fifth is also logically implied so how many number of expressions that are logically implied four right so here answer four is correct right so now you understand that what this logically implied means just let me know if there is any confusion in this question uh, let me just remove my picture so that you would uh, get this question completely now you can see the question completely guys okay just let me know guys if there is any confusion otherwise let's move to the next question right four is correct this is another question guys based on inference nat type questions are not frequently asked from this topic yeah nat type question does not frequently asked from this topic but yeah i have that question so if in case it gets asked this is the kind of a question they can ask right let's solve consider the following logical inference so we have given two statement two inferences uh, i one says that if it rains then the cricket match will not be played and the statement is cricket match was played and then the inference uh, from that statement is there was no rain then we have i2 statement it says that if it rains then the cricket match will not be played and it did not rain and the inference is cricket match was played which of the following is true inference means conclusion right both i1 and i2 are correct inferences both uh, only i1 is correct but i2 is not a correct inference i1 is not correct i2 is correct both i1 and i2 are not correct so just let me know which of the following uh, which of the above inferences correct inference okay so guys rajveer is getting that i1 is correct so let me know uh, what you guys are getting okay anurag is saying option b is correct that means he is also getting i1 is correct i2 incorrect anyone else guys just let me know guys this is a practice time okay so let's see it says that if it rains then the cricket match will not be played so if i'll take for raining i'll take it as p and cricket match played let me take p as rains it rains and q as cricket match played cricket match played right so i1 statement says that i have one statement says that if it rains cricket match will not be played so that means first statement is if it rains that means p happens then the cricket match will not be played 
and the cricket match was played so that means second statement for this is cricket match was played now i want to know that there was no rain right there was no rain so if i'll take if i can i write down this as negation and negation of q in second i can use double negation right and because of modus ponen if i'll take the modus tollen if i'll take negation in this one i'll get negation in this one as well so that means negation of p i'll get that means there was no rain so that means this is correct inference i can conclude by uh, applying propositional laws uh, or rules of inference i can uh, get uh, there was no rain let's go for the second statement again second statement i2 if it rains then the cricket match will not be played that is true p negation q second statement is negation of p right now they are saying that cricket match was played i cannot say that because they are saying me if it rains then the cricket match will not be played they are not saying anything about it did not rain right so i and i do not have any rule which says that if negation of p happen then q would happen right so that's why i cannot conclude from that that the cricket match was played so i2 is not a correct inference but i1 is right so that's why all of the guys have given the correct answer here option b is correct right sufia b option is correct okay so that is correct just let me know guys if there is any confusion in this question otherwise let's solve this guys this is another question it says that which of the following is the most appropriate logical formula to represent the statement and the statement is gold and silver ornaments are precious so we have to write down logical formula for this statement that gold and silver ornaments are precious i think i have added questions based on lattice yeah lattice questions would be there and let me check yeah there are some questions based on relation function right there would be some questions based on group yeah i think yeah rajveer i have covered all of the topics so there would be questions based on these topics as well just tell me guys which of the option is true here how would i write down in logical formula gold and silver ornaments are precious uh anurag is saying option b rajveer is saying option d anyone else guys we have 50% votes for option b and 50% votes for rajveer option d just tell me guys so guys you can see op sufia is saying option d so let's solve this so they are saying gold and silver ornaments are precious that means if i'll consider this statement that means both gold and silver ornaments are precious that means gold is precious and silver is precious but if i'll see this option d it's saying that for every x x is gold and x is silver then it is precious so that means if x is gold and x is silver that means for any uh, ornament x should be gold and x should be silver at the same time so would that be possible or would that be important but the statement is saying gold and silver ornaments is precious this statement is not something like if it is gold then it is precious and if it is silver then it is precious right so that's why option d is true that means for every x 
X is gold or X is silver. It would be precious. Here we have used and, but in logical formula, we have used or because the statement meaning is different when we have converted that into the formula. So that's why option D is not true. Gold and silver ornaments are precious. That means if X is gold or X is silver, both would be precious. I hope this is clear. Just let me know, guys, if there is any confusion in this. Yeah, this is another question. Uh, this is a question from set theory. It says that A and B B sets, A complement and B complement denotes the complements of the set A and B. Then the set A minus B union B minus A union A intersection B is equals to. So guys, these type of questions I'll solve using Venn diagram. So I'll suggest you uh, to also solve using Venn diagram because that would be easy for us to solve. Just try this one, guys. Let me know what would be the answer based on set theory. This question is. Okay, uh, okay, Rajveer. Anyone else, guys? Option B, Sufia is saying option B. Okay, anyone else, guys? So guys, let's draw Venn diagram and see that what we are getting. So if I'm saying about A and B, let's me. Uh, guys, have you tried the Venn diagram? Right, so if I'll draw a Venn diagram, it would give me, let's say this is my complete set. This is my... This is A, this is B, right? A and B. A minus B means that I have to take A without B, right? So A minus B would be this portion. Union B minus A, that means I have to remove A out of B. That means this portion. And A intersection B is middle portion. So what is this A, what is this area, this shaded area? This is A union, A union B. So that's why option A is correct. I hope, Sufia, you get it that why option A is correct instead of option B. I just have simply drawn the uh, Venn diagram that which of the area I am covering and I have taken the union of all those areas. So I got that area is A union B. Okay, so guys, if this is clear, let's move to the next question. Let's solve this again using Venn diagram. You have to solve this. X is given to me intersection F minus F intersection G. Y is given E minus e intersection G minus e, interse e minus F. Which one of the following is true? X is a subset of Y. Y is a subset of X. X is equals to Y. Which of the option is correct? Again, use a Venn diagram. Venn diagram would be very helpful to solve these type of questions. Guys, anyone? 
just try to draw a venn diagram you would be easily work on this type of question simple set theory question Okay, so let's see how would we draw this. So guys, uh, this is E intersection F, right? Because we have three sets. So that's why I have taken E and FG. So you can see that the green shaded portion in this is E intersection F, right? What would we do next? Then I can see that what is F intersection G? This orange portion, portion is what? F intersection G. So out of E intersection F, I have to remove F intersection G. So which portion I'm left with, that means out of this green portion, I'll remove the orange portion. So you can see that if I'll remove the orange portion, I am only left with this. So this is what this area is my X area, right? So I can say that this is X area. Now let's do the same work for Y. So guys, you can see that E is what e is this whole green circle and E intersection G is green orange portion. So in this, I have to remove E intersection G out of E. So I left with this. So this portion is I can write down E minus E intersection G, right? This is E minus E intersection G is this portion. And if I have to remove E minus F, so this is whole E and this is F. So that means E minus F is this orange portion. So I'll remove the orange portion out of this E minus E intersection G. If orange portion gets removed, I'll get only this portion. This is X, this is Y. I can see that both have same area. So X is equals to Y. Right, so that's why option C is true. Uh, guys, do you get it? Why option C is true? Because uh, only Rajveer have answered this question. Just let me know if anybody have any doubt. Otherwise, guys, till now, if you are getting everything, just give me a thumbs up in the chat section so that I'll know uh, you guys are getting what I have taught till now. Just tell me, guys. Okay, Sophia said no doubt. Anyone else? Okay, so let's move to next question. Uh, so this is the next question based on set theory. The question says that power for the set A, the power of set A is denoted by 2 to the power A. So guys, if you have discussed, uh, heard about power set, power set is set of all subsets. Either we'll represent it with P of A and here they have represented it with 2 to the power A. And A is given to the set 5, curly bracket 6, curly bracket 7. So they are asking me which of the following options are true. So let me know guys which are of the following options are true here first and second only second and third first second third and first second fourth one two three c option is true okay rajveer is saying option c is true anyone else guys Sophia is also saying option C is true. So guys, how have you done this question? I just tried to form a, a power set. That means 2 to the power A set would be because I know that empty set is a subset of this. Then 5 is a, I'll take single, single element. Single, single element would be like this. And uh, right, single element in curly bracket. Then I'll take two, two elements, 5 comma curly bracket 6. Then I'll take 5 comma curly bracket 7. 
right and then i'll take curly bracket 6 and curly bracket 7 right and then i'll take this a set 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 8 right so this is a power set now i can see that which of the option is true five belongs to right this guys just remember this is a sign of belongs to this is a sign of a subset so five belongs to right five belongs to option one is true five is also a subset of two to the power a we know that two to the power a is a set right and every subset has a empty subset right so this is also true Third option is 5 comma 6. This whole element belongs to 2 to the power a. Now guys, let me tell you one thing. The difference between belongs to and subset. So if they are saying belongs to, then this exact element has to be present in this set. That this exact element is present in this set. So that's why third option is true. When I'll talk about subset, then I'll go through the curly bracket. And then I'll see that these two elements should present in this set. So I can see that 5 single 5 is not present but curly bracket 5 is present so this is not a subset fourth option is not true option c is true only first second and third one right so guys i hope all of you understand the difference between uh the difference between uh subset and uh, belongs right so let me know if there is any doubt in this other or uh, Rajveer and Sufya has given the right answer. Option C is correct. Otherwise, let's solve the next question. Right. So, guys, this is our next question, and it is from Gate CS 2000. Again, based on power set. Power set P of S denotes power set of S. They are asking which of the following is always true. So, let me know which of the following is always true here. So they are saying that power set of a power set of S is equals to power set of S. Option B is saying power set intersection power set of power set of S is equals to phi. Power set intersection S is power set S does not belongs to power set of S. This is simple question, guys, based on power set definition. If you know power set definition, then you can easily solve it. Let's take any set S is equals to A comma B and then uh, try all the properties, all the options. Then you will get which option is correct and which option is not correct. Okay, so let's see. Guys, if I'll take S is equals to, if I'll take S is equals to A comma B, then what would be power set of S? Power set of S is equals to phi. Curly bracket A, curly bracket B, and curly bracket A comma B. Right? So if I'll see powers, or I can write down this as... Let's not make it complicated. I'll write down this as S. So power set of power set of S is required. Let's find out power set of power set of S. So it would become phi, curly bracket phi, curly, curly bracket A. So we get these kind of elements. So you can see that power set of S is not, e power set of power set of S is not equals to power set of S, right? So that is uh, incorrect. This is incorrect. And if I will take their intersection, I can see that the only intersection they would have is phi. There is no another element because all other elements would have one more curly bracket. 
so that would not work so option b is true c is that their intersection is p of s if i'll take these two sets intersection that is also not true and it says that s does not belongs to power set of s s is a subset of itself any and power set definition is that uh, it it would contain all the subsets of s so option d is also not true so option b is correct right right me option b is the correct answer okay so if this is clear let's move okay this is wrong written here option e option b is correct right let's see next question this is the next question this says that number of elements in the power set of 1221121212 is so you have to tell me what would be the number of elements in the power set of this set just tell me guys what would be the number of elements in the power set guys uh, just letting you remember that what is the definition of set set is a okay set what is the definition of set set is a set is a collection of well defined distinct objects so you have to use that definition uh guys guys if you will see here let's uh, see this okay this is element 1 2 this is what 2 comma 1 comma 1 i told you that set is collection of collection of well defined well defined distinct objects this object so that means here they have written 2 comma 1 comma 1 it does not matter i can write down this as 2 comma 1 and this is also uh, written as 2 comma 1 comma 1 comma 2 i can write as 2 comma 1 so this is a set of 1 comma 2 2 comma 1 and 2 comma 1 and i know that in a set order does not matter if order does not matter can i write down this as 1 comma 2 1 comma 2 and 1 comma 2 again this is uh, the external curly brackets also represent a set so can i write down this as 1 comma 2 so this set basically uh, uh, only has distinct object that is 1 comma 2 so i can write down this as a number of elements in the power set that is 2 to the power 1 so that would be 2 option d is correct here right so guys this is a little bit tricky question because they have given a set like you you will feel like it has three element but if you will go through the definition of set you would realize that there is only one element which is distinct all other are different representation and we know that in a set uh, there is no meaning of uh, not distinct objects right set is a collection of well defined distinct objects right so i hope guys this is clear to you uh, just let me know if there is any confusion in this let's solve it this is another question okay all on answer is already visible but let's try this uh this is a question based on uh set theory relations right relation is reflexive symmetric and transitive so they are saying that a is related to b if a and b are distinct and have common division other than one so we have to tell them that this relation is symmetric reflexive or transitive which of the relation is that and the relation is that a and b are distinct and have a common division other than one so let's try this guys
okay so guys let's see uh they they are saying that a related to b if and only if a is related to b if and only if a is not equals to b and the common division that means gcd of a comma b is equals to 1 that means they do not have any common division other than 1 so if i'll talk about reflexivity reflexivity what does it mean reflexivity is a related to a but a cannot related to a because a is equals to a and the condition i have given is a equals is not equals to b so reflexive is uh, not true here right now if i'll talk about symmetricity reflexivity is not true symmetricity for symmetric that means a related to b is given so i can write down a related to b that means a is not equals to b and common division of a or b is equals to 1 so can i write down from that as well that b is not equals to a and common division of b comma a is equals to 1 right if we have 2 comma 3 right 2 and 3, 2 and 3 are not equal and gcd of 2 and 3 is 1 so i can reverse that 3 is not equals to 2 and gcd of 3 comma 2 is 1 that is the same thing so can i say that b related to a right so that means the relation is symmetric now let's check about transitivity or uh, transitivity for transitivity let's consider one example let's take that 2 is related to 3 Right, 2 is related to 3. Guys, just tell me that 2 related to 3 or not. Uh, pen. 2 related to 3. I can see that 2 is related to 3. 2 is not equals to 3. And GCD of 2 comma 3 is 1. And can I say that 3 is related to 4? Again, 3 is not equals to 4. And GCD of 3 comma 4 is 1. But if I use the transitivity property, I'll get 2 related to 4, which is not true because 2 is not equals to 4, but GCD of 2 comma 4 is 2, right? So that's why the relation is not reflexive, not transitive, but symmetric. Option D is true. So I hope Udit and Rajvi, you guys get it that why option D is true instead of B and C option. Just tell me, guys. If there is any confusion in this. Uh, guys, do you get it or uh, do anybody have still have confusion? Just let me know. Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. Just let me know, guys. Okay, so let's move to the next question. So this is another question, guys. It says that we have given a binary relation. Uh, on n cross n and it is defined as follows that a comma b related to c comma d is if a is less than equals to c or b is less than equal to d then we have to check that reflexivity and transitivity just tell me guys the relation is reflexive or transitive or both or not anyone
so guys do you have any idea that uh, which of the above statement is true about reflexivity and transitivity okay so guys let me tell you uh, that they are uh, now they usually we have studied the relation on the set a now instead of the set a they have given a relation on n cross n right is it clear to everybody now for reflexivity i just have to check a comma b should be related to a comma b and i know the definition if a comma b related to c comma d it should be equals to a is less than equal to c or b is less than equal to d so can i write down a is less than equal to a or b is less than equal to b this is true because equality holds here so this relation is reflexive so that means statement p is true now i'll check for q option q is for transitivity again let's take one example let's take 2 and 5 related to 3 and 2 right i can see that 2 and 5 to comma 5 is related to 3 comma 2 why because 2 is less than equal to 3 right now can i write down this as 3 comma 2 is related to 1 comma 4 right i can see that 3 comma 2 is related to 1 comma 4 why because 2 is less than equal to 4 here either 3 is less than equal to 1 or 2 is less than equal to 4 so i get here that 2 is less than equal to 4 So right so if i'll apply the transitive property a related to b and b related to c i'll get applying the transitive property that 2 comma 5 is related to 1 comma 4 right and i can see that 2 is not less than equal to 1 and 5 is less than not less than equal to 4 so they are not related so that means r is not transitive so guys do you get it that why r is reflexive but not transitive right so i can see say here that p is true but q is false option b is true just tell me guys if there is any confusion that why option b is true because nobody is answering answered this question so i hope uh, you guys have doubt in i think you ha guys have doubt in this question uh guys is this clear okay so let's move to the next question here option b is true so this is another question guys everybody knows the function definition or should i tell the function definition because uh you guys should know the function definition to solve this question it says that a is equals to ab cd b is equals to pqrs denote the sets and r is a function from a to b then they are saying that which of the following is not a function tell me guys which of the given option is not a function here so guys function definition says that that a function is a mapping it is a mapping from the set a to b such that there does not exist any element uh, they do not have any element left in the set a which does not get mapped so that means domain is completely used up left hand side should be completely used up every element should be there should be some mapping and that mean and also one more thing that one element cannot map to two elements right a cannot maps to if i am writing f of a then it cannot map to two elements it does not have two value a cannot map to two elements right so now let's get, get back to the question if function definition is clear it says that a comma b b comma q c comma r but i can see that in the domain in the left hand side we have four elements so four elements does not get mapped so option first is not true let's see second option a comma p b comma q c comma s d comma r 
right? That would be a function that there might be a possibility that this is a function. But the third one, a comma b p b comma s b comma r b c comma q b is mapped to s and b is mapped to r. I told you that single element cannot get mapped to two elements, right? So that's why third is also not true. Only second option is true. Second option is a function. So I can see here option D is true. Why there? Achha, guys, just check this. They are asking that which of the following relations are not functions. So that's why first and third option are true. So guys, uh, just don't get confused with this. Uh, just read the question carefully because sometimes I made this error when I do not. I, I have only checked the functions and I have seen that which of the following is a function and take the none of these options. So don't do that here option c is true right so guys is it clear that why option c is true here just tell me that if there is any confusion in this question otherwise let's move to the next question so guys this is another question based on function so guys you can see that we have started from propositional logic then we have moved to set theory now i am covering each of the topic from set theory we have covered relations different type of relation then i am uh, on functions right now right so it says that a function f from positive natural number to positive natural number defined such that f of n is equals to f of n by 2 if n is even f of n is equals to f of n plus 5 if n is odd. Then we have to tell them r is equals to i such that there exists j belonging such that uh, f of j is equals to s. Be the set of all distinct value that f takes. So basically r is a range here. So we have to tell them what would be the range of, what would be the maximum possible size of r is, what would be the maximum possible size for this a function here maximum possible size for the range of this function here so tell me guys how do you find out that so guys to solve that what would we do uh, what would we do we'll find out the values of f right and how do i find out the values let's see so you can see here i can easily find out here f of 1 right what would f of 1 would be 1 is odd so it would become f of 1 plus 5 that is f of 6 f of 6 6 is even so it would become f of 3 f of 3 3 is odd so it would become 3 plus 5 that is 8 and 8 is even so it would become f of 4 and 4 is even it would become f of 2 and f of 2 would become f of 1 so we have started with f of 1 and we have reached to f of 1 now I'll solve for f of 2. f of 2 is already f of 1. I'll solve for f of 3. f of 3 is already f of 1. So I can write down f of 2 is what? f of 1. f of 3 is what? f of 1. And if I'll solve for f of 4, f of 4 is f of 1. Right? I already have solved it. Now if I'll solve for f of 5. f of 5. 5 is odd. 5 plus 5 gives me 10. f of 10 f of 10. 10 is even. So 10 by 2. That is 5. So you can see that it uh, moves in circle 5 10 5 10 like that right so if i solve for f of 6 i already have solved for f of 6 f of 6 is f of 1 if i solve for f of 7 let's solve for f of 7 because we haven't solved it 7 plus 5 gives me 12 12 is even so it would give me f of 6 f of 6 is already f of 1 so i'll get again f of 1 let's solve for f of 8 f of 8 i already solved that is f of 1 f of 9 9 plus 5 gives me 14 and f of 14 14 is even so f of 14 would be what would be f of 14 guys f of 14 would be f of 7 so let's write it down f of 7 and i think f of 7 i have already solved that would give me f of 1 f of 10 would be f of 5 so you can see that if you will solve like that you will get only two values either f of 1 or f of 5 so that means in the range i have only two values that is this range has only two values f of 1 and f of 5 right the maximum possible size the minimum if they ask me minimum possible size then there might be a possibility that f of 1 is equals to f of 5 but they are asking for the maximum possible size possible. So that is two values, f of 1 and f of 5. So that means range has only two elements here. Just let me know, guys, if this is not clear or if there is any question in this. 
otherwise let's try to solve another question so this is another question based on set theory it says that x y z be set of size x y and z respectively w is equals to x cross y e be the set of all subsets of w and then we have to find out number of functions from z to e so what would be the number of functions here guys just tell me just tell me guys x y z be sides of so that means what i option d is they are saying piyush is saying option d anyone else guys so guys as you can see that x has cardinality cardinality of x is x cardinality of y is y and cardinality of z is z so they are asking that w is a set from x cross y and e is a set of all subsets of w we have to tell them number of functions from z to e so if i have to find out number of functions from z to e so number of functions would be cardinality of e to the power cardinality of z what is e here e be the all the subsets so first of all z be the z value cardinality of e it would be to the power z cardinality of e be the subsets of all the subsets of w and w is x cross y so let's first find out cardinality of w that means cardinality of x cross y that would give me x y right e be the subset set of all subsets of w so that means subsets of so 2 to the power x y be the cardinality so number of functions possible 2 to the power x y to the power z so it would give me 2 to the power x y z right so that's why option d is true right piyush option d is a correct answer here right now let's see next question this is the next question they are asking that the set so now guys we have question from group group theory it says that 1 2 4 7 8 11 13 and 14 is a group under multiplication modulo 15 we have to find out inverse of 4 and 7 respectively what would be the inverse tell me guys what would be the inverse just tell me what is the definition of an inverse. Okay, so the inverse definition is basically that if I'll multiply, let's say inverse 4 into x, if let's say x be the inverse of 4, then I'll get 1 mod 15. So what would I, and I'll multiply 7 into y, I'll get 1 mod 15, right? So what would I do? I'll not solve it from the question. I'll go through the option. Let's see, go through the option. If I'll take 3 and 13 with the inverse. So if I'll take option A, so 4 into 3 gives me 12. That is not equals to 1 mod 15. So that means this would not be the inverse. Similarly, if I'll take option B, 4 into 2, that is 8 it's not equals to 1 modulo 15 so that is also not true if i'll go through the option c 4 into 4 that is 16 16 is equals to 1 mod 15 if i'll divide it with 15 i'll get the remainder one right so that is true let's check for 7 as well 7 into 13 that would give me 91 and i know that if i'll divide it by 15 i'll get the remainder one because 15 6 are 90 so I'll get one mod 15. So I can see that option C matches our answer. Option C is correct answer. 4 and 13 gives me the inverse of 4 and 7 respectively. Uh, right, Piyush. Okay, so I hope this question is clear. Just let me know if there is any question in this. Otherwise, let's solve this. Just tell me H be a set of all the matrices. That means we have given upper triangular matrix. So I hope all of you know this kind of a matrix. This kind of a matrix known as upper triangular matrix. So we have to tell them the set H is a group, a monoid, but not a group, a semi-group, but not a monoid, neither a group nor a semi-group. Just tell me, guys.
anyone else uh, guys just let me know so guys if you uh, let me make you recall the definition of monoid semi group and group in monoid we want only two properties uh, in semi group we want only two properties semi group we want that closure exists closure and associativity holds right in monoid we want closure issues associativity and here i want closure associativity and identity and in group if i talk about group it basically wants closure associativity right and identity and inverse it want all these things so we know that this is an upper triangular matrix and they have given that product of abc not equals to 0 first of all uh, this closure exists if i'll mul multiply any upper triangular matrix with an upper triangular matrix i'll get an upper triangular matrix if i'll talk about associativity matrix multiplication is associative we already know that if i'll talk about identity here diagonal matrix here identity matrix work as an uh, work as an uh, identity right and if i'll talk about inverse because abc not equals to zero i'll find out the determinant determinant of this matrix is abc and abc is not equals to zero given here that means matrix determinant is not zero so can i say that if determinant is not zero then its inverse exists i know that when the inverse of a matrix exists, if its determinant is non-zero, so I can say that it is a group because inverse exists, closure, associativity, identity, all the four things exist. So that's why I'll say that it is a group. So I hope this is clear. Uh, is there any question based on monoid, semi-group or group? Just tell me. Otherwise, I am moving to the next question. Next question, basically, is this is the next question, guys. It says that which of the following statement is false? The set of rational number is an abelian group under addition. Set of integer is an abelian group under addition. Set of rational number form an abelian group under multiplication. And set of real number excluding 0 is an abelian group under multiplication. Right. They are saying in the first statement that set of rational number is an abelian group under addition. And guys, just tell, just see this. They are saying that which of the following statement is false. And right? we have to tell them which of the following statement is false. So rational number, abelian group under addition. So I know that P by Q is a form of a rational number. If I'll add any rational number with a rational number, I'll get a rational number. And associativity holds under addition. Identity is zero. Right under addition, zero is an identity, and zero by one is a rational number. And if I talk about inverse, I'll subtract it with p by q, I'll get zero. Right, minus p by q will be the inverse of p by q. So that means this is a group. This is true statement. Set of integer is an abelian group under addition. This is also true uh, using the same rules. Right, and if I'll go for option C, set of rational number form an abelian group under multiplication. That is not true. Because if I'll talk about zero, if I'll take under multiplication, what would I multiply so that I'll get one? Because one is an identity under multiplication. So I do not have anything. So that's why this is not a, uh, this is a correct statement. This is a false statement. So I'll take this option. Option D says that set of real number excluding zero is an abelian group under multiplication, right? So if I'll remove zero out of real number, then I'll get a, a group under multiplication because then I do not have zero in that statement. Right. So that's why here option C is true. So, guys, that's why I was telling you that read the question carefully, because sometimes, you know, the concept, but 
in a hurry you mistake by mistake uh, you would understand that this is an msq but this is a multiple choice question and they are asking for a false statement no issues right just let me know if there is any issue guys otherwise let's uh, should we go move to next question or do anybody have any question till now just tell me guys if there is no question just give me and uh, just let me know in the chat section otherwise doubt also guys if there is any doubt okay i hope so there is no doubt let's move to the next question so this is the next question guys uh based on lattice the question on lattice it says that inclusion of which of the following set is necessary and sufficient to make s a complete lattice under the partial order defined by the set containment tell me guys so we know that if i'll draw a hz diagram in a lattice there is a single top and single bottom right so solve this guys okay let's solve it so they are saying that if i'll draw let's first draw a hz diagram so first i have 1 comma 2 and then 1 comma 2 is a subset of 1 comma 2 comma 3 and then it is also we have 1 3 5 1 and 1 2 4 1 2 4 is also a subset of 1 2 4 is also a subset of 1 comma 2 and then we have 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 4 comma 5 this is also a subset right and we have one more which is 1 comma 2 comma 1 comma 3 comma 5 right so we have a single top but we do not have a single bottom so what would i add so that i'll get a single bottom right right piyush so i'll start with uh, because they are saying that the inclusion of which of the following set is necessary and sufficient that means if i'll add that i do not need anything so if i'll add this one this first option so i'll get a single bottom right now you can see that there is a single top and single bottom so that's why this would become a lattice now if you will add 2 1 comma 2 comma 3 uh because it would lie here something 2 comma 3 and this is this will also form a lattice but you can see that they are asking that which are necessary and sufficient we do not have to add more so that's why i'll not add any more sets because only one uh, i am able to complete my work with the only one element which is one curly bracket one so that's why actually uh, right one is sufficient for that dice i do not have to go for b c and d option okay yeah so that is a question based on let dice now let's move to the next question yeah this is a next question guys uh, now we have started uh from this question onwards guys we have started graph theory right the question says that which of the following statement is slash are true for an undirected graph and the statement is number of odd degrees is even and sum of degrees of all vertices is even okay can you tell me that uh, sort of what we have to use to get Uh, the option correct what theorem what statement would help me to solve this right right hand shaking lemma so guys we all know that what is a hand shaking lemma hand shaking lemma says that hand shaking lemma says that that sum of degree of all vertices sum of degree of all vertices 
is equals to twice the number of edges. Right, sum of degree of all vertices is equals to twice the number of edges. So I can, because they are twice edges, so that means right hand side would always be an even number. So that means sum, if I take sum of degree of all the vertices, that would be even. So Q statement is true. Right, but the next thing they are saying that number of odd degree vertices is even. So how do I check that odd degree vertices is even or not? And it is saying for number of odd degree vertices is even. Right, so what would I do? Can I write break down this as sum of degree of odd vertices? Sum of degree of odd vertices. And sum of degree of even vertices. Sum of degree of odd vertices means that they have odd degree, right? And sum of degree of even vertices means that they have even degree. Even degree. So, guys, just tell me that sum of degree of even vertices. So, if I'll take uh, that means all the degrees of even vertices are even, right? That means if I'll take sum of all the even numbers, that would also be even. So, can I say that it would be something like 2 into uh, let's say S1 or degree layer, and let's take 2 into D1, something like that? It would be multiple of 2. So, can I write down 2e minus 2d1? So that means I'll get sum of degree of sum of degree of odd vertices, sum of degree of odd vertices is equals to twice of E minus D1. So that means sum of degree of odd vertices is even. Now, guys, uh, how do if sum of degree of odd vertices, that means let's say 3 plus 5, that is even. But if I'll take 3 plus 3 plus 5, so that would become odd. So that means odd vertices sum, odd number sum would be even if they are even in number, right? So that's why number of odd degree vertices is even. So they should be even in number. So that's why then we'll get twice or even number. Otherwise, we do not get an even number. So that's why odd degrees vertices are even. So I can say that both P and Q option are true. Both P and Q statements are true in this question. I hope everybody get this by handshaking lemma. Q is straightforward, but writing uh, two or three lines, you would get P statement is correct as well. Okay, so let's move to the next question. So this is another question, guys. It says that GBR simple undirected planar graph on 10 vertices with 15 edges. G is a connected graph, then the number of bounded face in any embedding of G on the plane is equals to. Just tell me, guys, how would we solve this? Uh, right, sorry, we'll use Euler's formula. So, guys, uh, for a planar graph, for a planar graph, we have a formula which says that n minus e plus r is equals to 2. n is number of vertices, e is number of edges, and r is number of regions. And this 2 I have here. And this is a connected graph. This formula is true for connected graph. So, what would we do? n is 10. Edges is 15 and R I'll get if I'll solve it 10 minus 15 minus 5 and it would goes to the right hand side. I'll get number of regions is equals to 7. So I know that they have asked me bounded faces. This is total number of regions here. R is equals. What I want here, I want only bounded faces. So if you uh, see, you can see that if I talk about regions in this graph, one is bounded and another one is this outside area, which is unbounded. So can I say that, can I say that it has bounded regions would be seven minus one. That means six, six would be the bounded region. So that's why option D is correct, right? Option D is correct. Uh, and one more thing, guys. If I'll get a disconnected graph, 
I'll get a disconnected graph. Disconnected graph with key components. Just telling you one more thing that if I want disconnected graph with K components, K connected components, right? Then the formula would become N minus E plus R is equals to K plus one. Then this would be the formula. Right. So in further uh, for further use, if you get anything like that, then this would be the formula. And here you can see that we have a connected graph. So that means we have one connected component. That means it would become K plus one, right? One plus one, that is two. That's why we have for connected graph, we have right hand side is equals to two. Right. So let's see next question. Guys, this is the next question. It says that in a connected graph, a bridge is an edge whose removal disconnects a graph. So that means bridge is that edge. If I'll remove that, I'll get a disconnected graph. Then they are asking which of the following statement is true. The statements are tree has no bridge. A bridge cannot be a part of simple cycle. Every edge of a click with a size greater than equal to three is a bridge. And a graph with bridges cannot have a cycle. Tell me which of the option is true here. Okay, so there are first in first statement, they are saying a tree has no bridge. So this is a tree. This is a tree. Right. But if I'll remove any of the, let's say if I'll remove this one, I'll remove this one. So I'll get disconnected graph. So tree has bridge. So why they are seeing the tree has no bridge? Option A is not true. A bridge cannot be part of a simple cycle. Let's take this cycle. So we have this cycle. So if I'll remove any edge here, let's say if I'll remove this edge. Now I'll get a connected graph. So I cannot say that uh, it is a bridge because it does not removing one edge does not help me to get a uh, disconnected graph. So bridge cannot be a part of a cycle. B is true here. Right. Let's take, let's check for option C. Every bridge of a click with size greater than equal to three is a bridge. A click is any complete subgraph of a graph. Now they are saying that if I'll take a click that means if I'll take a subgraph, let's say if I have this graph and let's say this one, right? This is a sub, every each edge of a click with a size greater than or equal to three is a bridge. So let's take, I'll take this part only V1, V2, V3, V4. Can I take this V1, V2, V3, V4? Is any complete subgraph of a graph. So we'll get a subgraph. If I'll remove any edge, we'll not get a bridge. So this is not true. Option C is also not true, right? If I'll go for option D, a graph with bridges cannot have a cycle. This is not true. Let's say this, this graph. Now you can see that this graph has a cycle. It is a three cycle. It is a four cycle. But if I'll remove this middle edge, if I'll remove this edge, okay. If I'll remove this edge, I'll get two cycles. I'll get two cycles and this is a disconnect. So option D is also not true, right? So only option B is true. Uh, Satya, uh, you can see the streaming and for machine learning, because I'm teaching their machine learning, I can share uh, in tomorrow's session, the schedule for machine learning classes. Uh, you can ask each of the teacher, or each of the uh, mentor teaching you there would let you know the uh, classes schedule. Or do you want the subject schedule that I can tell you? Like, uh, uh, just give me a minute. Yeah. So on Tuesday and Friday, there is a class of machine learning. And on Tuesday, sorry, on Wednesday and Friday, there is a class of machine learning. Let me start from Monday. So on Monday, there is a class for DSA. 
in python and uh, then on tuesday there is a class for mathematics on wednesday there is a class of machine learning and on thursday there is a class of maths again and then on friday machine learning class and then again for monday onwards there would be a same schedule but if you want a subject detailed schedule you can ask from the mentor teaching there because in the next session which will be tomorrow uh, for my machine learning class i'll share the schedule in which i'll tell you that which topics i'm going to cover in the upcoming classes what's the last date i think the last date is just let me check once give me a minute the last date for the classes would be 26th of uh, january i think this uh, january 31st or 30th january would be the last date i'm not sure about that okay so let's move to the next question here option b this is another question it says that gb uh, is a simple undirected graph some vertices of gr of odd degree at okay my screen is not visible yeah now it is visible add a node some vertices of gr of odd degree add a node to v make it adjacent to each odd degree vertices then the resultant graph is sure to be regular complete hamiltonian iler uh, right dinesh your answer was correct So you can see that it is saying that G is a simple odd degree and we have added one node V, make it adjacent to each of the odd degree. So that means let's say we have N vertices and out of N vertices, K vertices have even degree. K vertices, K vertices has odd degree and N minus K vertices have even degrees. Right. So what we have done, these k odd degree vertices, we have added one node v and then we have make it adjacent to all the odd degrees. So these all the odd degrees get become even. And what about this v degree? This degree of v would be also even by because we know that we have solved the question based on a hand checking lemma when we get that that number of odd degree vertices is even. So that means in this set odd degree vertices, this is even. So v is adjacent to all the even even number of vertices so this degree of v is also even so we can see that now the resultant graph has degree all the degrees even and we know that if a graph has uh, all the vertices uh, if a graph has even degree vertices all the vertices are of de even degree then the graph is an Euler graph right so that's why option d is true here i hope you guys get it why option d is true Okay, so let's see next question. Uh, this is the next question, guys. This is simple. Tell me which of the following graph is not planar. See, the question is uh, uh, says that not planar. Not not is written in caps lock because sometimes students don't don't see that they are checking for not planar. So we have to check for planarity. Planarity shows that uh, the definition of planar graph is that no two edges intersect each other other than their endpoints or other than the vertices, right? No two vertices. So I can see that G2 is planar because no two vertices are intersecting each other. But if I talk about G1, so how do I plot this Z1? Can I take this? Uh, 
if i'll try to draw the graph g1 let's because this is this uh, vertices from v1 to v2 is moving above the vertices if i'll take it from the outside so we do not have any vertex any edge here then i left with this edge how do i plot this edge so that means i am not getting g1 planar i do not getting i am not getting any planar representation for g1 but if i'll talk about g2 i have this edge i'll remove this edge and i'll take it from the outside and this would become planar planar if i'll talk about g4 i'll take this edge from the outside and then i have to take this edge and this edge i'll take from take it from here Right, so that's why G1 is not planar. All other graphs are planar. You can see that G2, G3, G4 are planar. Right, that is a planar definition, planarity definition that no two edges intersect each other other than the uh, their endpoint. So what we have done, we have tried to find out the planar representation. So for G2, G3, and G4, we are able to find out that planar representation, but not for G1. Right, so that's why G1 is not planar. Let me know, guys, if there is any confusion till now. Any question, guys? Okay, so let's move. Now, this is the next question. It says that uh, A denote the number of simple graphs that can be created with four labeled vertices. B denote the number of simple graphs that can be created with four unlabeled vertices. Then find the value of A minus B. What would be the value, guys? A denote the number of simple graphs that can be created with four labeled vertices. Right and B B denote the number of simple graphs that can be created with for four unlabeled vertices. Then I have to find out the value of A minus B. So guys, uh, if I have to find out number of simple graph with n labeled vertices, then that formula for that would be 2 to the power n into n minus 1 by 2. Right? And if I have to find out number of simple graphs with n unlabeled vertices, that would be n plus 1. Right? So I'll find out that using the formula. So for unlabeled vertices, 2 to the power 4 into 4 minus 1. 4 into 4 minus 1 by 2, 2 twos are 4, 4 minus 1, 3, 2s are 6, 2, 2, 2, 2 to the power 6. So it would give me 64. And it would give me simple graph unlabeled vertices that would give me 5. So that would give you the answer 64 minus 5. Right, so difference between 64 minus 5, that would give me the answer 59. Unlabeled vertices. I hope all of you get this formula. If this is clear, let's move to the next question. 59 is a correct answer here. Uh, guys, just tell me what would be the chromatic number here, chromatic number of this graph. What would be the chromatic number? Chromatic number is what basically I have to color the graph such that no two edges uh, have the same, no two vertices, no two edges and vertices have the same color. And I have to find out minimum number of colors required for that. And that would be the my that would be my chromatic number. Right, so what would I will try to do? I will give a color A here, then I have to give color B. Then I can give A here, then I can give B. I cannot give, I can give A here, then here B, then A, then B. But here I cannot give either A or B because it is adjacent to this as well. So I have to give another color C. So that means minimum three colors are required to color this graph. So that's why option B is correct. Right? So you can see that I have to use minimum number of colors so that my graph would be colored, right? And that is my chromatic number. I hope this is clear. Let's see this one. 
again this is a uh, question based on coloring it says that minimum number of colors required to color the vertices of a cycle with n nodes in such a way that no two adjacent nodes have the same color anyone guys how would we get this what would be the solution So guys, if I'll talk about a cycle, let's say if I'll take a triangle, right? This is a cycle. So I can see that if I will try to fill colors, I have to give three distinct colors because this is adjacent A, B, C. If I'll take a square, then I can give A, B, A, B. Then I have a requirement of two colors. If I'll take a pentagon, that means five cycle. Then I have to give A, B, A, B. B and then I have to give another colors that means three. So that means for even number of vertices, I require two colors to color the graph. For odd number of vertices, I require three colors to color the graph. Right. So for even number of vertices, I require two colors. For odd number of vertices, I require three colors. Right. So now you can see that uh, not, neither option A, B, C can be correct. So option D would be correct. Let's see how. If n is an even number, so that means n would be something like 2k. So 2k minus 2 into greatest integer k, 2k by 2 plus 2. So 2 and 2 get cancelled. It would give me and greatest integer. Let me just. This is basically uh, 2k by 2. Right. So it would give me a 2k minus 2k. That would become 0 and it would give me 2. Right. For odd even number, it would giving me 2. If I write down odd number 2k plus 1 minus greatest integer 2 into 2k plus 1 slash 2 and plus 2. It would give me only one value. So it would become 2k plus 1 minus 2k plus 2 because it is greatest integer function. 2k, 2k get cancelled. 2 plus 1. Uh, 2 plus 1 gives me 3. So I can see here that for odd number of vertices, I have three. I require three what three colors. And for odd number of what sorry, for even number of vertices, I require two colors. And for odd number of vertices, I require three colors. And I'm getting this using the formula as well. Let me uh, remove my picture because I have written on the very left. I hope the answer is visible. Just check it once. If it is clear, then we'll move to the next question. So this is another question. Uh, guys, this is a question based on forest. Just tell me what would be the answer in this. Let G be a forest with N vertices and K connected components. So how many edges does G have? So guys, if you remember, uh, basically a tree, if I talk about a tree, tree is what? Tree is a uh, connected, tree is a connected graph with, if it has n vertices, let's say if it has, if it has n vertices, then it would have n minus one edges. Right, we know that in a tree n vertices that means n edges because I can see that this is a tree, there would not be any cycle. But if you will see here, there is one thing you just can check by very easily if you will remove any one edge from here. So you can see that if I have removed one edge, I get two connected components, two connected components, and uh, it would become a forest. Forest is what forest is collection of all the trees two connected components and now the edges would become n minus two right so if i'll add one more if i'll remove one more edge then i'll get three connected components and the edges would become n minus three so that's why option c would be true here option c would give me number of uh, uh, number of edges in a forest with k connected components and n edges Right, because I have 
uh, I have two connected component n minus two edges, three connected component, then n minus three edges. Right. So this is simple. This is basic question. You can just do by yourself. Just start with a tree and reach to a forest because removing the edges would give me a forest and give me the connected components as well. OK, the next question we have here is OK. So guys, from this question onwards, we have, I think, two, three questions, two questions based on combinatorics. Let's solve it. And that's what we have all in our uh, discrete mathematics. Uh, so the question here is the minimum number of cards to be dealt from an arbitrary shuffle deck of 52 cards to guarantee that three cards are from same suit. Right. So what type of suit we have in uh, in cards? So we have diamonds, we have clubs, we have spades and then we have hearts. These four types of suits we have and three cards are from the same suit they want. Let's say I'll take two cards from same suit. And if I'll add one more card, then either it would be three diamond card, three club card and three spade card. So what would it become? Two plus, two plus, two plus, two plus one. That would give me nine. And this I have solved using pigeonhole principle, right? Because pigeonhole principle says that if we have, uh, let's say, n number of birds and we have n minus one holes, then at least one hole has two pigeons in it. Right? So that's why we have used that. If I will take one less card from each of the suit, and if I add only one card, then I have at least three cards from same suit. So only nine cards are required. So option C is true. Right. And this is a last question, guys. So just let me know what would be the solution here. Two girls have picked 10 roses, 15 sunflowers and 14 daffodils. What is the number of ways they can divide the flowers amongst themselves? How would they divide these flowers? Just tell me, guys. What would be the way to divide the flower? So, how would they divide the cards, guys? Just tell me, guys. So guys, you can see that they have to divide. So it would become 10 plus 1 C1 because uh, to divide these uh, 10 roses and for 15 roses, 15 plus 1 C1 and then 14 daffodils, 14 plus 1 C1. So that's the number of ways. So it would become 11 into 16 into 15. If you will solve this, you will get the answer. Solving, I think you would get uh 11 into 16 into 15 uh just let me know so on solving you will get option c as your correct answer okay so yeah guys so these are all the question we have based on discrete mathematics. So we have completed each and every topic questions. Just you can post that later if you have any question doubt or if you have any issue. All right. So we'll start with the marathon session of computer science uh, gate exam for compiler design. OK, so in compiler design, like uh, we have already seen that uh, the questions related to compiler design have very uh, impact in gate uh, competitive exam and their uh, like weightage is though uh, minimum for that okay uh, so it ranges from 4 to 8 marks okay but it has a very good scoring capacity so if you are very clear in that particular concept compiler design you can score very well in that uh, area okay so We'll start with the uh, gate compiler design PYQ. So before uh, starting with the PYQ, I'll I'll take uh, a small, uh, you can say the revision concept of the gate, uh, sorry, compiler design course. Okay. 
So I'll switch to another tab and we'll start with the basic concept of this. Okay. So I hope this screen is visible to you. Okay. Let me know if this is visible to you. I'm writing here get PYQ compiler design. Please confirm whether it is visible to you. Is this screen visible to you? All right. So we'll start with the basic uh, concept of compiler design. That uh, what is compiler design? Why do we need this uh, course? Okay. So we know that uh, each and every programmer has to write some code in any specific programming language and that has to be understood by the machine okay and we also know that uh, our machine can only understand a binary code that is zero one machine code so our task is to convert that particular uh, written source code into the machine code okay for that we need to have a translator so whatever is our source code okay. so that source code is supposed to be translated so one translator must be intermediate thing and that will generate the target code. All right. So depending upon the nature of this particular source code, it could be, let's say the assembly language. It could be high level language. It could be low level language. It could be middle level language, whatever. Okay. So depending upon the nature of this particular uh, source code, we must have the type of the translator. That means it could be named as compiler. It could be named as interpreter. Or it could be named as assembler. Okay. And that will convert the object code. Okay. And this object code be, uh, can be treated as the direct machine code or it could be uh, intermediate code that is a byte code that could be transferred to any other system and uh, further get uh, executed okay, uh, by using some interpreters. So you can simply consider as a Java virtual machine that is treated as interpreter for the Java byte code. So Java compiler is used to convert your Java file into object code. So that object code is nothing but the uh, byte code and that byte code is platform independent, you can uh, take that particular file into any particular system, whether it is Mac OS, or it, whether it is Windows or it is Linux, each and every system has its own JVM. Okay, so uh, curated JVM will be there for uh, each and every hardware and uh, operating system. Okay, and that particular JVM will interpret the byte code to convert it into the machine code and then your system can actually understand that particular program. Okay. So this is the basic task of uh, our translator that is going to be uh, convert the source code into the target code. Okay. So the process of uh, conversion that uh, we are talking about the compiler design, that means we are talking about the high level language, which is going to be converted into the required target code. Okay. So uh, the task of conversion of this particular high level language to machine code or object code is to be done in several phases. Okay. So that phases are basic uh, requirement of each and every compiler. So it, is, it starts with the, so you have written your source code. So your source code is to be supplied to the compiler and compiler has the various phases. So I'm just going to write it into a particular block that your source code is inputted to this particular compiler and compiler has various phases. So you start with the lexical analysis. Okay, so that is the very first phase. Okay, that whatever is the output generated by the lexical analysis is supplied to the syntax analysis. So syntax analyzer is there that is going to 
uh, analyze the generated output of the lexical analysis. Okay, and whatever is the output of this syntax analysis is applied to the semantic analysis. And then semantically analyzed outcome is going to be uh, given to the code generator. So code generator phase is there. Then we have the code optimization. Okay, uh, this code generation is mostly known as the intermediate code generation. Okay, so this is you can write it as intermediate code generation. And then there is a code optimization phase. That is also very important phase where we can actually uh, reduce the redundancies and the time consuming operations and so on. And then we have to have the target code. So target code generation phase. Okay. So whatever is the outcome will be our required object code. Okay. And each and every phase are further connected with the two terms. One is called the symbol table. So this is symbol table management here. All right. And these phases are further connected with the error detection management. All right, so uh, we need to explain, we need to know each and every phase one by one, and then we'll go with the PYQ, okay? So whatever is the source code, whether it is high level language, your assembly code, okay, your middle level language, whether it is C or it is C++ for the high level language or Java, that is going to be supplied with the uh, lexical analysis phase. That is the very first phase. Uh, in that particular phase, you are going to have uh, the generation of the tokens okay so each and every line is to be processed by the lexical analyzer uh, mostly we know it as a lex okay so that lex is going to convert uh, supplied input uh, command into uh, the tokens okay uh, that tokens will look at the various format of the tokens and how it is going to be stored into the symbol table okay so it will tokenize the given input string into tokens okay so uh, the token may consider uh, various things like uh, it could be punctuation it could be constant it could be literals okay so uh, there are variant variant uh, terms which is to be defined okay so i'll come to that particular part again so whatever is to be generated here is known as token okay so tokens or keywords that you can say that it also recognizes the uh, keywords so it generates the tokens and that particular supplied tokens to the syntax analysis. So whatever uh, is the task of syntax analysis is to uh, process this particular generated tokens along with the underlying context free grammar, okay, uh, to produce the parse tree of that. Okay, so it, it will produce the parse tree corresponding to the uh, supplied tokens. Okay, for that particular token, it must have the underlying grammar uh, on which it will produce the uh, context uh, that pass tree okay so uh, here we we'll look at the uh, different types of the pass tree whether it is leftmost derivation it is rightmost derivation whether it is ambiguous or not if it is ambiguous or it is conflicting uh, what other issues can be there okay uh, why do we need to remove that particular uh, ambiguity from this context free grammar so that we can have the uh, right parser for the uh, compiler okay and semantic analysis that uh, Whenever you generate the parse tree from this particular phase, syntax analysis, that parse tree along with the context free grammar or uh, some certain rules, you can say, the then semantic analysis is based on certain rules that is called the semantic directed translation, okay, uh, STD, semantic translation uh, directives. So from that particular rule, it is going to uh, associate the corresponding values with the non-terminals, okay. So, uh, once you associate the so it, it is actually used to uh, determine the actual value of uh, or or you can say the meaning of that particular token okay so it associates the meaning corresponding to the generated tokens okay 
And once you have done that particular semantically di directed translation, uh, that will be supplied to the intermediate code generation. And intermediate code generation basically generates the intermediate code uh, that is represented by various means. Okay, so most dominating of that is going to be the uh, three address code. Okay, so we'll th there are various uh, parts of that. So we'll look at that particular phase. So I'll process with the one by one and accordingly we'll give some more detail on that particular topic, okay? Then uh, there, uh, after you convert the uh, given semantically, uh, semantically analyzed or uh, associated value into the intermediate code, that is going to be uh, used for the code optimization, okay? Once you start with the code optimization, it is supposed to be, uh, like trying to identify the things that are uh, basically consuming time and doing nothing. Okay, that means it is not contributing that much uh, when it is involved in certain kind of loop or uh, it is not actually changing the value. Okay, so means we need to determine the statements that are actually affected by certain loop or affected by certain uh uses okay and not contributing in uh, the effective outcome but it is actually increasing the time or consuming the memory okay so in that particular case we need to uh, optimize our two precious resources okay so the memory as well as time so we need to eliminate the statements so that it will not affect the outcome of the program but uh, to reduce the uses of the resources okay so code optimization part is the important part over here. Uh, for that, we'll uh, look at the certain techniques. And once we have generated the, we have optimized the code, we'll process with the target code generation. And after that, there is the role of uh, linker and uh, loader. Okay. So that is also important to know that linker has, like whenever you process your particular uh, program file, Okay, maybe it is .c file, .cpp file, .java file. Whenever you uh, compile that particular file, uh, there are, there are multiple outcomes. There are multiple objects files created by that particular compiler. Okay, and the linker has an important role to uh, combine all those generated files into a single file. Okay, into a single file uh, with a relocatable address. Okay, so that is another important thing. What is relocatable address or what is dynamic addressing concept? And what is a static concept? Okay, so for that particular concept, you need to have the concept of operating system where you can actually know what is the virtual address and what is the physical address. Okay, so uh, linker is actually converting that into uh, the relocatable uh, address that is called dynamic addressing concept, and the loader has to actually uh, provide the memory. Okay, so that is going to load that particular program into memory and uh, once it is loaded into the program, that is going to be executed. Okay, so we'll start with the lexical analysis. Okay, so in lexical analysis, basically what we do, we uh, tokenize the given input expression. Okay, so whenever we supply our source code, one particular command, or we can say the one particular line or expression, say my expression is x is equal to a plus b plus c column. Okay. And that particular thing is supplied to the lexical analyzer. Okay, so I'm just writing here as a lex. So what it does, it actually tries to identify what the terms are there associated with this particular expressions. Okay, so it is going to create a particular uh, table, you can say. So the outputs are the tokens here. Okay, and that is going to be represented as the lexemes and the corresponding tokens. Okay, so here you can say the first term that we are going to read from the left to right, we have to scan the entire term. So the first term is going to be X. Okay, so X is the lexeme here, over here and it is uh, treated as uh, identifier here. Okay. And then there is assignment. So assignment is nothing but the operator. So it is identified as operator. And then there is another term that is A. So it is treated as identifier. So the identifier one, identifier two, then there is plus operator that is treated as operator for addition, arithmetic addition. Then there is B is again treated as identifier and so on. 
okay so by this way like it will encounter with the semicolon at the last and it is treated as the punctuation okay so that means the tokens are supposed to be categorized by different types or different names okay and these different names are nothing but the uh, starting with the identifiers it could be constant so constant like 2 3 4 5 5 point something and so on identifiers are nothing but the variables you can say okay so all the variables are treated as identifiers the constants are the integral content constants boolean constants or uh, it could be a float constant okay let's say 10.5 and so on then uh, there comes another term that is called operator that we have just seen that operators could be arithmetic operator logical operator and so on so the operators are supposed to be uh, recognized by this then the keywords each and every programming language has its uh, predefined keywords set of predefined keywords so that keywords are supposed to be identified uh, by the lex okay and then they are called uh, literals so literals are nothing but the you can say the string constant okay so whenever we enclose any statement in double quote okay if any particular statement is included in uh double quote or single quote depending upon the programming language like uh in python single quote and double quote both are used for the uh, string literal but while in other languages like java c c++ double quote is used for the uh string literal otherwise single quote is used for the character uh constant okay so in that particular case we need to uh, define whatever defined in this particular double quote will be treated as single entity okay that is treated as single entity all right then there is another term that is called punctuation so punctuations are supposed to be identified like semicolon comma okay uh, and many other things like uh, uh, we may have dot okay so depending upon uh, the language there are different punctuations to be used and special characters or special symbols to be identified okay so special symbols you can say or special characters you can say okay like at the rate dollar sign underscore okay uh ampersand sign okay so these are the symbols that is supposed to be treated as special symbols in a particular programming language okay so these terms are to be recognized by the uh, lexical analyzer and that particular lexical analyzer like uh, in previous case you can see that whatever is uh, generated over here that is called as tokens okay and the information corresponding to that is to be entered into the symbol table okay so i'll i'll tell you that symbol table is basically collecting the information from analysis phase okay so the compilers are basically defined as uh, one pass two pass or multi pass compilers okay if you look at the types of the uh, compiler there are uh variants of the compiler type so it could be a single pass compiler that means all the phases are combined into a single uh, black box and uh, whenever you supply your source code that is going to produce the object code directly so you cannot uh, uh, visualize the intermediate part so that is the single box collecting all the phases okay uh, now what we can do if it is two phase then we can have the analysis and synthesis phase so in most of the cases uh the intermediate code generation that means the phases from lexical analysis to intermediate code generations are basically known as the uh, analysis phase or you can say the analysis pass and the code generation and the, the sorry code optimization and the target code generation is known as the synthesis phase okay so whatever is the outcome produced by this analysis pass so symbol table management is actually uh, take the value from the analysis phase so it collects the information from the analysis pass and that collected information is basically used by the synthesis uh, phase okay so uh, what a symbol table actually collects the records from the uh, analysis phase and then it produces uh, or it supplies the collected information to the synthesis phase okay so that can produce 
so if you look at this particular phase that uh, symbol table management so symbol table management is uh, not a phase actually it is a data structure okay so this is a data structure that is going to store the produced information so it will store the information regarding the tokens okay so what kind of token is there what is the size of the token what is the dimension of token at which particular line it is defined or at which particular line it is further used okay whether it is static or dynamic and all that uh, okay so these informations are going to be stored into the symbol table so i'll show you uh, the correct definition of the symbol table how it is maintained okay so i'm going to jump to the lexical analysis first uh, in this particular phase we have seen that these are the uh, tokens and these tokens so the tokenizer or uh, this particular part uh, how it is going to produce the tokens that is to be done by the uh, finite automata a deterministic finite automata okay so uh, that means if you look at the lexemes or, or, or whatever lexemes you have uh, say to be supplied to the lexical analyzer that is basically having the two uh, different parts into this particular lexical analysis okay one is the scanner and whatever is the scan term is to be produced to the analysis okay so you scan the lexemes one by one okay and what you can do you can actually eliminate the non token terms okay like uh, wide spaces whatever is the wide spaces there available you have to eliminate that wide spaces and uh, after elimination of that particular wide space uh, wide spaces uh, you will supply it to the uh, analysis phase okay once it is analyzed once once it is identified as a certain type it will produce the corresponding tokens okay now come to the wide spaces what is the wide spaces let's say uh, uh, it is possible then that during definition of any particular variable let's say i am defining any variable and uh, let's say ab and i am just trying to put certain comment on ab that uh, ab is of a specific type let's say ab is int type of four byte long okay so this is just a comment and then further i am going to assign some value over here that is let's say four okay so these are the unexecutable part that is not going to be taken into consideration for the uh, execution okay that uh, you have already known that uh, for any particular programming language comments are just to uh, have the description of that particular statement or a particular set of statement okay that is non executable part so during the compile time it will get eliminated from the uh, execution okay so if your program has only one line for the execution and thousand line as a comment uh, that will take only constant time to execute that particular program okay that uh, thousands line are not going to have any contribution in that uh program running time okay so in that particular case these are going to be eliminated by the lexical analyzer and how it does lexical analyzer basically counts the terms okay if it is single line then it will count the number of appearance of backslashes and it will eliminate each and everything until a new line encountered okay so it will simply eliminate each and everything it may be uh, the statement like if you try to uh read it as a lexical analysis then you can see that a is an identifier b is an identifier or it could be a single identifier then there is a wide space is could be an ident identifier and so on okay but what it does it simply encounters so if it is single line comment it will simply count the number of appearance of the backs backslashes and if it is multi line comment it is trying to that after the star it is trying to find another star followed by slash so everything which is uh, including these two symbols okay including these two uh, it will replace each and every term by simply white space okay and once there is an uh, elimination it elimination of this by white space it is going to be simply interpreted as a b uh, space this and four okay now there is a white space included between between this because of the scanning phase okay and then uh, the scanner has to identify uh, this wide space introduced after this particular task and that is to be eliminated and 
uh, after that, this particular syntax or this particular expression is going to be entered for the uh, analysis part. Okay, so that will get uh, analyzed by the lexical analysis. So for this, we must have the knowledge of uh, non-deterministic finite automata. Then how to convert that non-deterministic finite automata into deterministic one? Once we convert into deterministic finite automata, it is possible that uh, multiple steps are redundant. Okay, what we can say, uh, we may have more than one state which is producing the similar similar kind of yield. In that particular case, uh, it is deterministic, but it is uh, having some redundant states in that particular uh, finite automata. Okay, so we need to minimize that finite automata. And once we minimize that particular finite automata, that will actually work as a lexical analyzer. Okay, so lexical analyzer is nothing but a finite automata which will accept the regular languages. Okay, regular expressions. So you need to have the uh, knowledge of finite automata in uh, theory of computation. Okay, before proceeding uh, the learning of compiler design. Okay, because uh, we also require the context-free grammar. Okay, so the context-free grammar is the uh, next hierarchical language, which is defined by the Chomsky hierarchy in finite automata uh, in uh, theory of computation. So you need to cover these two topics in uh, theory of computation before starting the compiler design. Okay, so uh, lexical analyzer, you can say lexical analyzer is one deterministic finite automata, which is able to recognize each and every terms, which is defined as token here. Okay, so it could be able to recognize an identifier. It could be able to recognize the constant. It could be able to recognize an operator. It could be able to recognize the keywords and so on. Okay, so one single deterministic finite automata, minimal deterministic finite automata must be there. Okay, and that that will act as a lexical analyzer. Okay, so I'll start with the uh, questions based on uh, these initial level. Okay, so okay, initially uh, I have certain collections of uh, questions. Okay, we'll go through around eighty to eighty-five question in this particular session. So we'll start with the first question that is asked in uh, CS two thousand nine that match all the items in group one okay so here you can see that we have the question that match all the items in group one with the correct options uh, from these given in group two okay so the group group one is saying the regular expression push down automata data flow analysis and uh, register allocation and group two has the syntax analysis code generation lexical analysis and code optimization so we may have the combination that uh, a, which is representing the pair uh, P associated with 4, Q associated with 1, R associated with 2, S associated with 3. Okay. So I would like to have your answer in your chat box uh, that uh, which one should be the correct option. So let me have your options, then I'll explain this particular question how, what should be our approach to solve this. Please write your options in chat box so that I can comment. I can start with the explanation of this particular question. Okay, I'm expecting an answer from Monica and Swan. So, 
So the candidates are there in live session. Please respond. Monica, are you there? Okay, let me explain this particular question. So what it says, uh, you have to match the terms in group one with the group two. Okay, uh, in that particular case, you have to uh, write like whether regular expression is associated with which one, which particular option in group two. Okay. So uh, here you can see that option B is the correct answer. So uh, why option B? So regular expressions are, I just told you that the regular expression is uh, the expression which is accepted by the uh, lexical analyzer. So that very first phase is nothing but the deterministic finite automata, which only accepts the regular languages or regular expressions, okay? So uh, the P is associated with the third option in group three, okay? Then push down automata. So push down automata only accepts the uh, context free grammar. Okay. And that context free grammar is used to generate the, uh, that uh, what we say. Uh, so context free grammar is basically used uh, for the syntax analysis part. Okay. So uh, in this particular case, it is going to be Q is associated with one. Yeah. So that is uh, push down automata is associated with the syntax analysis. Okay. Because that syntax analysis says in that particular case, I have just shown you that in uh, various phases, that syntax analysis is going to generate the parse tree. Okay. And for parsing, we must have the tokens along with the context free grammar. So context free grammar is accepted by the push down automata. So push down automata is directly associated with the syntax analysis in this particular case. Okay, now the data flow analysis. So data flow analysis is the part of uh, basically the, uh, you can say the code optimization. Okay, in that particular case, we'll generate the uh, direct, directed acyclic graph or the uh, code flow graph. Okay, in that particular case, so uh, code flow graph or code flow analysis is done with the code optimization. So I'll, I'll show that particular part to you. And the register allocation. So register allocation is directly associated with the code generation. Okay, during the code generation, we'll map which particular register with the uh, certain statement. So that uh, like in three address code or so whenever we generate the three address code, uh, we we have to use the corresponding addresses. So that address minimization can be done with the association of the registers. Okay, because of they are the limited. Uh, in resources. So in this particular case, option B is going to be the correct one. All right. So hope you will answer the next question. Okay. So this is the next question, which is asked in uh, CS 2008. So some code optimizers are carried out on the intermediate code generation. Okay. So during intermediate code generation, uh, we apply some code optimization. Okay. So the, which option is the correct in this? Uh, they enhance the portability of the compiler to the other target processors. Okay. Uh, program analysis is more accurate uh, on intermediate code generation than the machine code. Okay. The information uh, from data flow analysis cannot otherwise be used for optimization. Uh, part D is the information from the front end cannot otherwise be used for the optimization. So please let me know which one option is correct from your side, from your understanding, which one is the correct option for this. So the task of the code, code optimizer, I, I told you that uh, in a particular code, there are uh, possibility that certain lines are redundant, that has to be eliminated certain lines are inside a particular loop that are actually not affected by the loop invariant. So like if your, if your loop is going to run for the thousand time and if any particular line is inside that particular uh, loop, which is not affected by that particular loop. So uh, 
there is no reason to run that particular statement thousand times. Okay, so that has to be eliminated from that particular loop. Uh, certain number of temporary variables uh, you may have defined, or certain variables you may have defined, which is actually not being used or which is not contributing in the result. Okay, so that is going to waste the overall consumed memory. So we need to eliminate that also. Okay, so certain things are there that has to be uh, removed and optimized. So we need to have the certain uh, optimization on the intermediate generated code. Okay, so I just need to have your option for this question. They enhance the portability of the compiler to other target process. Program analysis is more accurate on intermediate code than the machine code. The code, of, uh, the information from the data flow analysis can otherwise be used for the optimization. The information from the front end cannot be otherwise be used for optimization. Okay. So let me know your answer for this. Still expecting your answer. I'll wait for one more minute because I have 80 to 85 questions for you this time. So I cannot wait for long duration. So I'm expecting your answer within a minute. And that will be the time limit for you during your exam. You have to be very quick to solve that particular problem. So this is the very theoretical concept. Okay, so the option for this particular question is option A. Okay, as they enhance the portability, like your code is going to be a smaller. Okay, that is going to consume the uh, less memory as well as the less time. Okay, during the execution. So uh, that will increase the portability of the compiler. Okay, so that your uh, object code can be transferred to the different processor or different types of uh, systems, okay? So that is the option for this. Now let me have very old question here, and that is uh, GATE CS 1997 question, okay? That question is asked in 1997. A language L allows declaration of an array whose size are not known during the compilation, okay? Uh, like if you know the definition of the array that you can see that uh, array must be defined initially and it must have the certain specific size. Okay. The number of elements must be specified during the declaration of the array variable. So that is called the static nature of the array. Okay. Or, or you can say the static definition of the array. But here it is saying that uh, we have declared an array whose size are not known to us. Okay. During the compile time, we do not know the size of that particular array. It is required to make efficient use of memory. So that is another uh, requirement that it must efficiently use the memory. It should not waste the memory. Like in uh, a static definition, we have defined the array size of 1000 and we are actually using the first five spaces of that particular array. Okay, So we are wasting 9, 995 uh, allocated spaces. Okay, And again, that is going to be uh, multiplied by the data type of that particular array. If it is of float type, that means 995 multiplied by 4 byte, uh, that is going to be wasted by our definition. Okay, So we need to make use of the efficient uh, use of memory. Which of the following is true? Options are uh, the compiler using a static memory allocation can be written 
so i just told you that static memory allocation is going to waste the entire memory so option a cannot be the correct option a compiler cannot be written uh, for l an interpreter must be used so interpreter interpreter is the uh, next phase okay interpreter is the next phase so uh, this could not be like the task of the interpreter is to line by line execution of a particular code and produce the uh, possible errors and so on okay so again that is going to execute the line by line code so in that particular case again uh, it cannot predict the uh, overall uses of that particular uh, array size okay so option b cannot be the correct option in this particular case option d is also not correct uh, maybe let's see uh, for the option c a compiler using dynamic memory allocation can be written for l okay so dynamic memory allocation means as and when required we can declare the size and accordingly we can use it uh, we can increase the size required okay and also if that is not required we can uh, free the size also okay we can uh, remove the allocated size uh, if that is not being used by the uh, specific variable okay so in that particular case it, uh, we can simply treat it as a vector in c++ or uh, array list in uh, java okay so this is going to be the dynamic uh, array so the compiler must uh, use the dynamic memory allocation concept for writing this particular uh, l okay so option c should be the correct option let me check all right so option c is the correct option for this particular case okay so we may have the next question so the next question is uh, that is asked in cs 2014 uh, in set 3 so there are multiple sets for this particular uh, exam so from third set it is uh, the seventh question which is asking as one of the purpose of using intermediate code in compilers is to okay so what should be the purpose of intermediate code in compilers uh, make parsing and semantic analysis simpler option b improve the error recovery and error reporting so that is the task of the error management so option b cannot be the correct option uh, increase the chance of reusing the machine dependent machine independent code optimizer uh, in the compiler improve the register allocation okay so kunal has replied that option c is the correct one okay let me have any other option from the other users Kunal Dube has answered it as C, uh, which is very promising uh, looking at this particular phase. So like in optimization, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that during the optimization, uh, we may have the optimization, which is machine independent as well as the machine dependent. Okay. So whenever we are dealing with the software part only, when we are going to optimize the source code, okay, the number of variables, the indexation variables, uh, dependency in the loop or not uh, whenever we are dealing with that particular part we are dealing with the uh, machine independent code optimization okay and when we are dealing with the uh, register allocation uses of the registers number of registers allocation and so on in that particular case we are dealing with the uh, machine dependent optimization so in this particular case uh, as intermediate codes are uh, nothing but the machine independent code optimization so option C is going to be the correct option, increasing the chance of reusing. So that means whenever, uh, so optimization also improves the reusability of that particular code, okay? So that means you are going to increase the chance of reusing the machine independent code optimized for the other compilers, okay? So option C is going to be the correct option in this particular case. All right, so all two options that, that have answers are the correct one. All right, let me have another question from Gates CS 2015. So it is asking that uh, we have two sets, okay, list one and list two, we have to map these two. And the similar kind of questions we have just seen, the first question was uh, related to this one that uh, we have uh, list one as lexical analysis, parsing, register allocation, and the expression evaluation. List two has graph coloring, DFA minimization, post-order traversal and production tree. So we need to map 
these two. So you have to write the question number along with the option. Okay. So if you want to answer this particular question, uh, just write the question number followed by the option. Okay. So option A, B, or C, or D. So it should be your option should be 8A, 8B, 8C, or 8D. All right, Gulam is saying that uh, it is 8C. Okay, I'll explain. What about Kunal? Monica? Okay, Kunal is also saying 8C. Let me check. So if it is lexical analysis, uh, that means it is going to be accepted by deterministic finite automata. Uh, and I just told you that uh, during the definition that you must have the knowledge of non-deterministic finite automata. And that particular non-deterministic finite automata has to be converted into deterministic one. And once it is converted into deterministic finite automata, it may have certain redundancy that has to be eliminated, okay? And that is called the minimization of the deterministic finite automata. And once we have the minimized deterministic finite automata, that is going to be used as lexical analysis, okay? So that is called as lexical analyzer or lex. So DFA minimization is basically related with the lexical analysis. So A2 is going to be the correct option. So A is associated with the two. So uh, the codes A, B, C, D must be Connected with the list. Uh, so A is the first parameter and all the options, all A, B, C, D options are having two at the first place. That means uh, right now we are not in the position to decide whether which one is correct or not because two is the first option in all four cases. So we have to look at the another case B that is called parsing. Okay. Now parsing is uh, that I told you that during the parsing, we are just going to produce the parse tree. Okay, and pass tree is nothing but the hierarchical representation, uh, which is called as the production tree. Because uh, for parsing, we must have the tokens along with the associated context tree grammar. Okay, and context tree grammar uses the productions. So we are going to map that particular production into tree format. So that is called that is also called as production tree. Okay, so the parsing is associated with the production tree. Now in this particular case. Option B is going to be associated with B, uh, sorry, uh, 4. Okay, so in that particular case, if I look at the B option uh, mapped with 4, C is going to be the accurate one. Okay, so here you can see that option C is going to be the accurate one uh, because uh, A is associated with 2, that is the deterministic finite automata minimization, and then parsing is associated with the production tree. So uh, two followed by four is the only option uh, given over here that is called uh, the C option. Okay, now let me check for the other one. Register allocation that I told you that register allocation is the uh, part of optimization. In that particular case, we must know whether which particular register is already allocated or non-allocated. In that particular case, registers, collection of registers will be treated as graph. And in that particular case, allocated registers will be marked with certain color. Okay. So that concept is known as graph coloring. Okay. So any particular resource is already allocated must be marked as a certain color and non-allocated is uncolored. Okay. In that particular case, uh, the graph coloring scheme can be used for register allocation. So uh, C must be associated with one. So two, four, one is the right sequence and the last is the expression evolution that we have already known in data structure in uh, even in compiler design, uh, the syntax analysis that uh, expression evolution is done by the post order traversal of the tree. Okay, so uh, we must have the D connected with option three in list two. So C is going to be the right option in this particular case. Okay, 
So I'll switch to the next question. All right, option C is the correct one for this. Two pass assembler. All right. During my initial definition, that if you look at the initial definition uh, in this particular case, I just told you that uh, here we are defining that the first four pages here you can see that first four terms. Okay, let me select the pen here. All right. So here you can see that uh, these first four terms. Okay. The lexical analysis, syntax analysis, semantic analysis, and code generation. So during the definition of the compiler, I told you that compiler may be of one pass, two pass, or multi pass. So in one pass, all the phases are combined into a single uh, phase. Okay, that means a one black black box which is representing the entire phases into uh, the single box. Okay. Whenever you provide your uh, source code, that is going to be produce the uh, target code or the object code. Okay, so the intermediate options are not visible to you. Uh, but in two pass, the first four phases are combined into analysis phase, and another is uh, the remaining are combined into the synthesis phase. Okay, so lexical analyzer, syntactic analyzer, semantic analyzer, and intermediate code generations are combined into one pass. That is called the analysis. <laughs> pass over here okay so this analysis passes basically the combination of first four phases okay and this is the synthesis phase which is uh, the collection of code optimization and the target code now it depends upon the definition of the compiler whether uh, during the design we can have the different combination okay like you can have the only combination of lexical analyzer and syntactic analyzer, analyzer and then you can have the another pass that is combination of semantic and the code generation and then you have the third phase that is called code optimization and the target code so we may have multi pass we may have single pass or we may have two pass okay so our question here is related with the two pass assembler okay that says the symbol table is okay now you have to determine whether single single uh, symbol table is uh, generated in first pass generated in second pass not generated at all, generated and used only in second pass. So what should be your option? So this is the question number nine. And you have to write your option as 9A, 9B, 9C, 9D. Which one is the correct for your point? Okay, Gulam Sabdar is saying 9D generated and used only in second pass. Okay. So I told you that uh, if you look at this particular diagram again, I told you that if you look at this particular array, if you look at this particular arrow, it is saying that it is going to produce, it is the generator. Okay, so this is the generator. So the first phase, the analysis phase basically generates the symbol table. Okay, each and every phase in that particular analysis pass is basically contributing in generation of the symbol table. Okay, and whenever the symbol table is created, it is used by the second pass. Okay, it is used by the second pass. So, symbol table is generated in one pass and used in second pass. Okay, so option 9D cannot be the correct option. Kunal has the right option. Kunal has given the right answer that symbol table is generated in first phase. Okay, that is first pass. So, option A should be the correct one that symbol table is generated in first pass. Okay, and used by second pass. So option B, if option B was the used in second pass, then both the options are going to be the correct. Okay, so it, it, it could be the multiple uh, choice based question. Multiple answers can be the correct in that particular case. If, if generated in first pass is the first option and used in uh, second pass is the second option. Okay, but in this particular case, generated in second pass is the absolutely wrong answer. In that particular case, 
generated and used in second pass is also wrong and not generated at all is absurd because if it is not generated then how it it is going to be used by any any particular uh, pass okay so option a is going to be the correct in this particular case is that clear gulam I'm waiting for your response, Gulam. If you have any doubt, like you have given your answer as 9D. All right. So option A is the correct here. Okay. Let me have another question. All right. How many tokens will be generated by the scanner for the following statement? Okay. So scanner is the one particular part that is uh, the specific part in a lexical analyzer that I have just shown you. Let me show it to you again. Okay, so here you can see that whenever I'll supply any lexeme to the lexical analyzer, a scanner is going to scan that particular first. Okay, and during the scanner, it is going to eliminate all white spaces. Okay, it is going to eliminate all white spaces. Okay, uh, it recognizes, uh, all right, and the analysis is going to identify, determine whether it is uh, of which particular type, okay? So here we have defined the type that it is of identifier type, it is constant type, operator type, keyword type, literal type, punctuation or the special symbol, whatever it is, is defined by the uh, analysis and then it will produce the token, okay? so. Uh, Whenever you recognize any particular token, that must be counted only once. Okay, that must be, sorry, that must be entered into the symbol table only once and counted multiple times. Okay, let me correct the statement again. Uh, whenever you scan a particular statement, okay, so during the scan, each and every term is going to be counted but entered once into the symbol table. Okay, so let me have the question again. All right, so this is the question. And uh, during this particular explanation, what it does, uh, you have to maintain the symbol table. So during the maintenance of symbol table, what you have to do, uh, you have to define the symbol table like this, that uh, I just told you that symbol table is going to be the data structure, okay? And that could be implemented by simply array, linked list, hash table, or the tree, okay? So that symbol table can be generated by any of these data structures, okay? So depending upon the complexity that you afford, depending upon the uh, accessibility of that particular, like uh, sequential access only permitted, or whenever you define it as a linked list, that sequential access is going to be uh, the option in that particular case. If you are defining array, then in that particular case, random access is also permitted, but it is going to take longer time because you have to uh, scan the entire array, okay, to get any particular token from that symbol table. So uh, that is going to take order and depending upon the size of the array. If you are going to implement it by the uh, tree, let's say it is binary search tree, in that particular case, you can have the logarithmic time space, okay? Log n, depending upon the number of n entries into that particular symbol table. You can have the hash map, that means in that particular case, your size could be larger, but uh, you can have the constant time accessibility of that particular uh, item, okay? Uh, now, again, there could be the collision and all that. So that particular concept you have to understand whenever you are going to implement the symbol table via different types of data structure. So symbol table is nothing but a data structure that is going to store and uh, permit you to access that particular element okay, uh, by a specific mean. So if you are using array, you can have it random access. If it is a linked list implemented by a pointer, then in that particular case, it is going to be sequential. If it is linked list implemented via array, then it could be random, but again, that is going to be time consuming, okay? So in that particular case, you have to access multiple arrays uh, depending upon the data and the pointers. So I'm not going to dive into that depth. I'm just going to explain this particular time how, how it is going to be uh, encountered, okay? So during the scan from left to right, this is the first term, okay? So X is identified as the identifier. So it is going to be the type of that particular Okay, so 
so what particular type uh, or you can say the name of that particular identifier you have assigned then the corresponding type so right now type is not known to us because it is some intermediate statement isse pehle jo statement rahe honge wahan pe type aapne define kiya hoga so i am just keeping it blank over here then then we may have the size of this so depending upon integer float character it must have certain size uh, let me consider it as a integer so it is going to have two or four byte depending upon the compiler okay so i am just taking it as a 64 uh, bit processor it is going to take the four byte size in this particular case now we may have the dimension of this uh, okay so from that particular point if you look at this particular uh, variable it is of simple ordinary variable so dimension is going to be zero in this particular case if it is one dimensional array then dimension is going to be one if it is matrix then dimension is going to be two and so on okay so the corresponding dimension you have to uh, define over here the line of declaration of this particular statement that is to be uh, known to us okay the symbol table also maintains that the line of declaration of this particular statement so right now i don't know so i i'm just keeping it black uh, the line of uses okay so line of uses is also uh, another important term that is going to be defined over here like x could be first used then after 10 line you are again using x then after third line again you are using x so what we can do we can maintain a a uh, linked list that first uses of x then next uses of x followed by next uses and so on okay so whenever uh, whatever places you are using that has to be linked okay so that you can actually maintain the uh, propagation of the particular value okay and then we can have the specific address okay so whatever the log logical address reusable address or uh, relocatable address or it is the actual physical address that has to be maintained Uh, uh, by this particular symbol table so during program or at the programmer level it is basically the virtual address that has to be maintained in this particular uh, case okay so by this way you are actually going to uh, maintain the symbol table now whenever one entry has been done you are not going to enter it again in this symbol table so what you have to do uh, x has been entered once that has to be maintained okay if it is reusable then again you have to mark over here that the linkage of uh, users has to be maintained so you have to maintain the linked list corresponding to the users okay if it is in the same line repeated then again you have to uh, mark it as a linked list which is causing the loop kind of thing okay so that has to be maintained in the linked list as a line of users but you cannot re enter into uh, the symbol table again okay so that is going to uh, create some conflict in this particular case now look at the counting so x is counted once then the operator assignment is the operator that is counted as 2 then x is again count encountered that is 3 so it is the third occurrence 2 1 2 3 star is the operator so 4 okay then opening brace braces that is going to be 5 open bracket is 5 then a is counted as 6 then plus is the operator that is counted as 7 b is the identifier so it is counted as 8 closing bracket is again counted as an symbol so 9 minus is the operator so it is 10 uh then we have 5 as uh the constant so it is going to be 11 then semicolon is going to be uh the punctuation mark so it is 12 all right so it is giving me 12 so according to this option a is going to be the correct but you are marking is at 10b that means you have not counted x again isn't it so x is supposed to be counted so during the count it must be counted okay but during the entry in symbol table it should not be uh, re entered okay by this way it must be 12 only okay so option a should be the correct one recheck your calculation yes count x two times because that is twice occurrence okay so it will recognize it twice 
okay but it will not enter into the symbol table during the entry of symbol table it will only enter once okay but during the count it will recount multiple time okay so according to that particular uh, countability it is 12 okay so let me show you the option correct options would be a all right so here option a is the correct one okay so for question number 10 option a is with is the correct one all right okay so let me have the another uh, question incremental compiler is a compiler now uh, like uh, we have defined that the compiler is of one pass two pass or multi pass compiler now we have the incremental compiler so incremental compiler says that a compiler that compiles a source code let's say we have compiled a entire program once okay and whenever there is any particular error at any particular section is re uh, let's say after the correction, uh, it should be compiled. But whenever we have any ordinary compiler, it will recompile the entire program again. Okay, so that is going to consume lot time. The compilation time is also important. So it will compile the entire program again and again uh, during the error recovery. Okay, what we can have, we can have the incremental compiler that that will only recompile that particular section which is only require the attention okay whenever we modify any particular section the compiler will only compile that particular section that is called the uh, incremental compiler okay so now uh, the definition is uh, in front of you just let me know which option is going to be the correct for this particular question so incremental compiler is a compiler which is written in a language that is different from the source language, uh, which is different from the source language. So that is going, that is known to be as the cross compiler. Okay, that is known to be as cross compiler. So for option A, cross compiler will be the correct option, but it is not the incremental uh, compiler. Compiles the whole source code to generate the object code afresh. So this is going to definitely increase the uh, overall compilation time. So that is not the task of the incremental compiler. So option B is not the correct one. Compiles only those particular portions of the source code that have been modified, which is called as the incremental compiler. So option C should be the correct option and your options are correct. All right. Uh, let me have the fourth one that runs on one machine, but produces the object code for the another one. That is again the task of the cross compiler. So it is not going to be the right answer so option c is going to be the correct one for this question all right so option c is the correct one good to go all right uh, again we have another question that which phase of the compiler generates the stream of atoms so a stream of atoms are also known as tokens okay so that is the uh, different way of naming the term so a stream of atoms are nothing but the tokens okay and tokens are generated in which particular phase good one akash has the right option that is 12b all right so uh, if you recall the phases, Anna, if you recall the phases that uh, you have the lexical analysis, so that tokenizes and that tokens are basically used by the syntax analysis to produce the pass free. Okay. Once that particular pass free is generated, that is supplied to the semantic analysis to associate the semantic uh, rule along with that and that semantically verified parse tree is produced for the uh, intermediate code generation and then uh, the generated code has to be optimized so the token generation is the task of the lexical analysis so option b is the correct for this particular phase all right so the question number 12 has the right option as b all right everyone has the correct option 
let me have the another question which data structure in compiler is used for managing the information about the variables and their attributes i have just defined that okay we have just seen that which particular data structure is used to uh, maintain the variables and the attributes okay so that table formation i have just shown you correct so akas has the option d symbol table definitely the symbol table because each and every other phases are basically producing certain outcomes but not the data structure okay symbol table is the only data structure that is using that is used to manage the uh, recognized tokens okay so the tokens along with its attributes what is the size of that particular token what is the name of that particular token what is the location of that particular uh, token and all that what is the dimension so these are the attributes associated with the tokens so that is to be managed by the symbol table only so option d is the correct option for question number 14 which of the following is not performed during compilation so if you uh, recall the compilation process that uh, during the compilation it does uh, expand all the macros all the uh, let's say the libraries that you have used for the calling any predefined function or user defined function okay so it will expand the first phase is the expansion of that particular things okay so inline expansion is going to be the part of the compilation okay symbol table management i told you that the very first phase of the compiler uh, or you can say uh, the first four phases are contributing the symbol table management okay so that is going to be the part of the uh, compilation type checking so syntax directed tra translation like uh, this uh, semantic analysis phase uh, is used to actually check the type okay so whenever you create a particular parse tree uh, we apply some semantic rule along with that that actually checks the type of uh, particular uh, non terminal okay so type checking is also associated during the compilation process dynamic memory allocation is the part which is not connected with the compilation because compilation deals with the static allocation so dynamic memory allocation is the part of linker and loader okay so this is not the part which is associated with the compilation so option a should be the correct option for this one all right each one have the correct option very good yes that is the not run time so during compile time dynamic memory allocation is not done symbol table can be used for question number 16 symbol table can be used for so th these are the very basic questions okay uh, these are you can have the uh, you can see that uh, this is going to be very theoretical question uh, i'll gradually increase the complexity of the questions okay so mm -hmm. all right 16d you are saying 16d that checking the type compatibility suppressing the duplication of the error message the storage allocation so all of these are going to be the correct option and all you are right okay so uh, like during the symbol table management you can see that we are going to associate the type and that has to be used by the uh, syntax directed translation to check the compatibility of that particular type suppressing the duplication like uh, i told you that we need not to include the duplicate value that during the scan if there is any repetition that is not going to be entered into the uh, symbol table so the suppression of duplicate is also handled in symbol table a storage allocation that uh, whether it is static or dynamic and what size is going to be allocated for that is to be maintained in that so all of these are going to be the correct option in this particular case all right in two pass assembler symbol table is 
so this is the kind of repeated question but uh, in different way okay in the first way it is uh, represented as symbol table is generated by used by or generated and used by now in this particular case it is saying that in two pass assembler symbol table is generated in first pass generated in so it is the similar question i guess so this is the same option so i'm just uh, skipping this particular question so this is the repeated question uh, it is generated in the first pass all right uh, this is the access time of the symbol table will be logarithmic all right gulam i have uh, just considered that i i just uh, committed that that particular question number 17 is the repeated one now come to the question number 18 the access time of the symbol table will be logarithmic that i told you that a symbol table can be managed by variant of data structure so uh, we may have the uh, linear list we may have the search tree we may have the hash table we may have the linked list so like which particular data structure should be used for logarithmic access and i just told you that uh, if we manage it by the search tree that means if it is a search tree then we may have the partition of the elements whether the left is smaller and right is greater and so on by that way we can access a particular element in half of the time okay uh, like uh, in half of the time means uh, we can ignore half of the entire section for consideration okay in that particular case we will move to uh, the left or right half and accordingly in that particular comparison uh, in further comparison we will eliminate the next half and so on so it is going to have the logarithmic series and if you optimize that it is going to have the uh, logarithmic table of uh, log n base uh, depending upon the binary tree ternary tree the base is going to be accordingly defined okay so uh, the logarithmic is only possible when it is implemented by search tree all right okay so we'll have the lexical analysis so since we have already seen the lexical analysis phase uh, what what are the things associated with the lexical analysis so we'll take the questions of the lexical analysis again uh, in the compiler keywords of the languages are recognized by the lexical analysis that is the very definite term okay so that is asked in cs 2011 okay so the lexical analysis of a program in compiler that is going to recognize the keywords okay so uh, for this question number 1 for the lexical analysis option c should be the correct one okay because that is uh, the analyzer lexical analyzer is the phase that is going to uh, recognize the tokens or the keywords okay so option c is the correct over here okay look at the question number 2 now count is as question number 1 and 2 okay yeah both are correct now look at the question number 2 which is again asked in uh, gate 2011 the lexical analysis of a modern computer language such as java okay needs the power of which of the following machine model uh, is necessary and sufficient sales okay so saying java means it is a high level language okay uh, so high level language is going to be compiled and uh, will produce the machine code okay so which particular thing is required in this particular case okay uh, akash is saying 2a gulam is 2a kunal is saying 2b okay 2b is going to be the Push down automata, deterministic push down automata. Why it is deterministic push down automata? See, whatever language is there, whatever is the uh, requirement. If we are talking about the lexical analysis, lexical analysis is only uh, associated with the deterministic finite automata. All right. that is not associated with the deterministic push down automata if if you are talking about the syntax tree then we can say deterministic push down automata is okay for that okay because that is going to be uh, associated with the uh, context free grammar and that context free grammar can be derived so derivation tree can be generated or we can say the parse tree is generated so deterministic push down automata is 
correct option for the syntax analysis okay all right so finite automata if deterministic is not associated or if, if there is two options like finite state machine and deterministic finite state machine in that particular case deterministic is going to be the correct option but in this particular case there is only finite state automata so deterministic finite automata or finite automata will be the correct option for lexical analysis phase okay so question number two must have the option a all right now look at this gate 2000 question the number of tokens in the following c statement so you have to compute the number of statement in this particular a number of tokens in this particular statement try to find the number of tokens in this particular statement Okay, you are saying option C is the correct one. Gulam has the option as C. Anyone else? What about others? Kunal also has one C. Okay, so that means 10 number of tokens are there. Let me check whether it is 10 or something else. Do I count is P as one term, R as another term, I is another term? Do I count it like? We cannot like when when we define a finite automata we may start with the initial state we may have p as one parameter to shift to another state then we may have r to another state i to another state then n to the next state then t then next state and f to the final state okay so if it is accepting to the final state this is going to be the one particular token okay so each and every token must be accepted when that is terminated over a final state okay so in that particular case printf is going to be the one identifier in this particular case now we have the bracket so that is going to be two now we have literal in this particular case so everything which is enclosed in double code that is counted as one term one token that is uh, the literal for this particular case so it is going to be the counted as the third symbol now we have the comma that is counted as four then i as counted as five then comma that is counted at six then m person sign that is the special symbol counted as seven then again we have i that is counted as eight okay that is counted at eight and then we have closing bracket that is counted as nine then we have punctuation that is counted as 10. So option C is going to be the correct one for this particular scenario. Okay, so in this particular case, option C is going to be the correct one. All right, and eventually all of you have the right option. Is that clear? How tokens are actually recognized? So each and every term will be counted, okay, unless it is encountered at any final state. But once it is terminated at final state, everything will be counted as single term. Okay. So if now in this particular case, if I define it as like this particular finite automata is defined as a final state over here, in that particular case, P will be counted as one token. Okay. Then you have to look because uh, it is possible that we may have another initial state here and it is terminated over here. So RINT will be counted as another token. But uh, this is not the case. Uh, the previous one that we have defined that uh, starting with the initial state, printf will terminate on a single final state that will be counted as one single token. And by that particular concept, it is going to be the uh, 10 tokens in this particular statement. All right. 
So option C is the correct one. Okay, in the compiler, keywords of the language are recognized during this. This is the repeated question again. So I'm skipping this particular question. Now look at this particular question. Uh, I guess again, this is the question which is repeated one. So this is again the repeated question in this particular case. So I'm skipping this one again. Okay, now look at this particular question. Question number four. Consider the following statement. The output of the lexical analyzer is the group of character. That is option one. The total number of tokens and the print statement are 14. Okay, so just do that particular countability analysis. And the third option is symbol table can be implemented by using array and hash table, but not the tree. Which of the following statement is are correct? It is possible that it may have the multiple correct option. Okay, so uh, read it wisely and give me the answer whether A, B, C or D is the correct option in this particular case. Let me know. Okay, Kunal, don't make it quick. Okay, just go through, just go through by all the options. Output of the lexical analysis is group of characters only. Group of characters are the literals. It may have the constants also. It may have the special symbols also. So output of the lexical analysis is not the group of character that is the tokens and tokens are of different type. So how could you say that uh, option A is the correct one? So option A is the wrong one. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll consider uh, your option. Let me explain this. Uh, so first option is going to be the wrong in this particular case because output of the lexical analysis is a token and token can be of a different type. It could be the keyword, it could be the identifier, it could be the constant, it could be a special character and so on. Okay, so uh, even it could be the literal, but in this particular case, if it is, asking about the literals only, it cannot be the correct only. You know? Now, total number of the tokens in this particular statement, we have just seen that this particular statement has 10 number of tokens. So 14 cannot be the correct option. In the previous question, we have seen that this particular uh, statement has 10 number of tokens. Okay, So it could not be the correct one. Symbol table can be implemented via array and hash table, but not the tree. But we have just defined that symbol tables can be generated by the tree also. Okay, and that gives us the logarithmic time complexity. Okay, so all three options are incorrect. So option D is going to be the correct one. That is none of the following statements are correct. Okay, so option D should be the correct one. All right, Kunal. Okay, let me switch to the next question. Look at this. Which of the following statement is false? The context free grammar can be used to specify both lexical analysis and syntax rule. Okay. Option B, type checking is done before parsing. All right. High level languages. Uh, high level language programs can be translated into different intermediate representations. Okay, so I just told you that intermediate code generation can be uh, done. And in that particular case, we may have uh, the directed acyclic graph, we may have the parse tree, we may have the uh, means that could be de defined as linear or non-linear both way. Okay, 
uh, we may have the three address code we may have the dag representation so different representations are possible for uh, any particular program during the intermediate representation okay so option c is going to be the correct one so that could not be the false option b that that says that type checking is done before the parsing okay uh, parsing se pehle to tokenization hota hai aur tokenization mein hum kya type hai uski entry karte hain symbol table mein verification nahi karte uska hai na so according to me this should be the wrong answer hai na okay akash is also saying that the b is the false one let me see the d option arguments to a function can be passed using the program stack okay so program stack means stack memory whenever you define any particular function and if you pass the value to that particular function that has to be uh, like hello am i visible to you am i visible to you please confirm whether i am a visible to you or not am i audible all right so what i'm saying that uh, okay so this is screen is on wait a minute all right so we are talking about uh, this particular question that the arguments to a function can be passed using the program stack that means whenever we call a particular function whatever argument you have passed whatever local variables you have defined inside that particular function will occupy the stack memory okay that will not occupy the heap memory so that memory allocation is also important part uh, whether you can read it uh, from the computer organization uh, lecture there i i have defined that uh, you can also refer my operating system course there also i have defined the heap memory allocation and the stack memory allocation and during this particular uh, compiler design course also in that particular case i have defined how we can allocate the uh, different segments of the particular main memory okay so uh, during the call of any particular function whatever variables you have defined inside that particular function or whatever parameters you have passed in that particular uh, function that will occupy the stack memory okay so option d is going to be the correct one in this particular case option a is also correct because uh, the lexical analysis uses the regular grammar or regular uh, languages uh, which is nothing but the subset of the context free grammar if you look at the chomsky hierarchy classification in that particular case uh, the regular languages are the subset of context free grammar context free grammar is the subset of context sensitive languages and context sensitive language is the subset of Uh, recursively enumerable or uh, unstructured languages okay in that particular case uh, context free grammar is going to be the super set of uh, regular language and that will actually uh, satisfy both the lexical analysis and syntax analysis or the syntax rules so option a is the correct one so option b is going to be the wrong option for this particular question okay and uh, yes you all have given the right option okay so the output of the lexical analyzers are output of the lexical analysis is the stream of tokens that is very well known to you okay so i'm just going to skip this particular question that is the very basic definition yes now look at this which of the following statement regarding the linker software is are true 
so for linker i told you that uh, uh, during the definition that uh, linker and loaders plays the very important role that uh, linker basically combines multiple object files during the compilation okay once you have compiled your source program that will produce the multiple object files all the object files has its own relocatable addresses okay so uh, it is the task of uh, or or you can say all the created object files have its own virtual addresses corresponding to each and every line that virtual addresses are mapped by the linker into a single file okay so that will compile uh, that will uh, combine all the created object file uh, into a single file with a relocatable address okay so that particular file is further used by loader to load into the uh, main memory okay so by looking at this particular point you have to identify whether which particular functionality of the linker is correct okay so the function of linker is to combine several modules into a single load module uh, option 2 is uh, a file a function of the linker is to replace the absolute references Uh, of an object module to a symbolic representation to the location in the other module okay that is not the option correct uh, that means option a is going to be the correct that it combines okay that is the very primitive task of the linker is to combine all multiple object files into a single module file okay so that option a is going to be the correct one okay uh, part of b is basically uh, done with the combination of the loader okay so option 2 is the primary task or, or you can say the primary task of the loader okay that relocatable addresses are going to be converted into the physical memory location okay so that is going to be uh, no oh, let me give your okay answer corresponding to the 9 answer corresponding to the nine uh, that i told you that uh, option a that means uh, only first option is going to be the correct here that the function of the linker is to combine the several objects file into a single load module and that particular load module is basically loaded into the memory by a loader okay and the loader has the task to eliminate that uh, relocatable address by the absolute address okay so that is the task of loader not the linker so option 1 is going to be the correct option in this particular case all right just go for this the number of tokens for the following say statement it looks like the previous one but it is different just look it carefully and give me the option question number 11 which particular option is the correct one so just do it and let me verify 1 2 okay this is 1 this one is 2 and this one is going to be 3 then 4 then 5 and first and is 6 then 7 closing is 8 and then punctuation punctuation that is 9 so i am getting d as the correct option okay kunal and gulam both are having the same answer 11d what about akash are you getting the same answer all right very good so so this is uh, 
क्वेश्चन नंबर इलेवन हैज नाइन ऑप्शन एज करेक्ट बट इन सिंबल टेबल मेंटेनेंस आई विल बी इंटर्ड ओनली वंस ऑल राइट सो डोंट गेट कंफ्यूज बाय दैट वन दैट इट लाइक ओके लेट मी रीड दिस क्वेश्चन यू आर सेइंग दैट इट इज लाइक द प्रीवियस क्वेश्चन बट मिसिंग द कॉमा yes yes uh, between i and m percent i comma is simply eliminated so it is the same question but uh, only one punctuation has been eliminated okay so it is possible that the examiner can play with uh, such kind of thing okay so that you have already known this kind of question but uh, something is misplaced or something is reintroduced and will uh, actually does not permit you to have the, uh, the past history or you can simply replace it with 10 or certain known answer okay so you have to be very careful you have to actually uh, solve that question okay so debugger uh, that uh, during the phase definition we have seen that the error management is also one particular phase and uh, in that particular case uh, debugger has a certain role okay so you need to determine whether uh, debugger is a program that allows to examine the examine and modify the content of the register does not allow execution of the segment of the particular program allows to set a breakpoint execute a particular segment of program and display the contents of the register or all of above okay so let me tell you about the debugger that debuggers provide you or the programmers a capability to check the specific value of a register during the execution of any particular statement and to check that particular value we must set the breakpoint corresponding to our program okay so we need to uh, associate the breakpoints uh, into our program it could be one breakpoint it could be multiple breakpoint during our entire program it will debugger will execute that particular uh, sections and the changing values are associated with the registers are going to be displayed at that particular time okay during the debugging process so in this particular case option c is going to be the correct one that it will allow you to set the breakpoint like any any debugger or error handler does not says that uh, execution of any particular statement is not permitted okay so that is kind of protection mode that uh, like uh, Uh, certain set of programs or certain programs that has uh, different privilege okay like operating system modules operating system kernels has certain privileges in that particular case a normal user cannot execute the entire program okay so that is entirely different thing uh, this that is not the task of the debugger okay uh, so debugger allows you to execute your entire program Uh, but in that particular section you have to set the breakpoints corresponding to the required statement so uh, it allows you to set the breakpoints corresponding to your program and execute that segment of the particular program and check the corresponding changing values into the register okay so option c should be the correct option in this particular case all right so option c is the correct one here now we'll jump to the syntax analysis so what do we mean by syntax analysis before i jump to this particular section let me have the basic concept of the syntax analysis so can anyone tell me what is the syntax analysis so we have seen the lexical analysis where we have uh, created the tokens okay we have seen the symbol table that uh, whatever entries are there in the symbol table that is actually uh, produced by the uh, lexical analysis that uh, whatever uh, tokens or symbols that have been encountered the corresponding type or corresponding attributes are to be entered into that okay now we need to define the uh, syntax analysis okay so let me that is the second phase okay during your compilation design that is the 
second phase that verifies the structure of the statement of the uh, as per the language rule all right very much closer to the definition anyone else has any definition so what we have done you have just the lexical analyzer okay so your source program that is entered to the lexical analyzer that is producing the tokens okay these tokens are supplied to the syntax analysis and you know, that is called syntax analyzer that will basically analyze this particular token and that requires the context free grammar the underlying grammar okay for this particular phase it requires the token along with the underlying grammar to produce the syntax tree also known as parse tree all right so the syntax analysis phase does actually the parsing okay so it produces the parse tree corresponding to the generated tokens along with the underlying context free grammar okay so what is context free grammar a context free grammar is a grammar with certain like a, in a theory of computation you have already seen that a particular grammar is defined by four tuples that is v that is the set of all non terminals sigma that is the set of all input terminals okay the input symbols or the terminal symbols and set of all the production that is set of rules uh, that actually defines the uh, grammar and the starting variable okay now p is having the concept by which it is called as the context free grammar so every production is defined as the term of alpha a beta and that will produce so this particular production can produce alpha let's say b beta okay so in this particular case if you can see that a is basically producing something okay the variable a or the non terminal a is producing something okay b may be a terminal maybe non terminal or maybe the collection of both okay so it could be something but in this particular case if you look at the left part of a is intact over here okay so this is called as left context of a and beta is called as right context of a okay so if any particular production let's say we can have any particular production which is of a tends to let's say uh, gamma in this particular case the variable a doesn't have the left context as well as it is free from the right context okay so in this particular case this particular variable or this particular terminal and left hand side is free from both the context then you can say if the collection of such kind of productions are there in any particular grammar that will be known as context free grammar okay so a grammar will be known as context free grammar due to this particular rule that Now, otherwise it is going to be the context sensitive that if it is de dependent on uh, left hand side uh, or you can say the left context available in the left hand side that must be available on the right hand side of the production at the same position okay in the left context then it is called as left uh, context sensitive language okay now in this particular case it is free from that particular context it doesn't de dependent it is not dependent on left context as well as on the right context so it is called as context free grammar so any context free grammar having such kind of uh, production rules uh, are known as context free grammar okay so that is the basic definition of the context free grammar so what we are saying that we are saying that a token along with the context free grammar supplied to the syntax analyzer will produce the syntax tree okay so we we may have let's say uh, we may have a rule let, let's say id is equals to id plus id into id such kind of symbol can be uh, this kind of sequence can be given to the lexical analyzer and lexical analyzer will simply identify this is the token this is the token this is the token uh, this is the operator and all that okay so it will simply tokenize now how this particular expression is generated it is generated by the context free grammar let's say given as 
e tends to e plus e then uh, it could be given as e tends to e into e and it is derived by id so what we can do we can have the uh, production like e tends to e plus e then uh, this particular term can be further derived as e into e and then every term can be derived as id id and id all right so that is called the context free grammar and it is since we are replacing the rightmost variable first it is the rightmost derivation okay now what we can do we can eliminate the leftmost derivation leftmost uh, variable first so i can start with the variable e into e so e is derived as e into e then the leftmost term that is sorry uh, e plus e and then we can have this particular term as id then uh, this particular term as id then the rightmost term as id so it is the rightmost derivation uh, and the leftmost derivation okay and both are producing the same yield so yield is nothing but the outcome of the entire uh, tree that means if you scan the tree from left to right top to bottom okay and whatever the terminal sequence is going to be there will uh, result the yield okay so here you can see that it is going to produce the id plus id into id okay and if you scan this particular term again it is going to have the id plus id into id okay so both the context free grammar derivation is producing the same result okay now this is the matter of investigation that whenever we have certain kind of grammar which is producing multiple uh, parse tree corresponding to the same result okay uh, isn't it creating any kind of conflict for the compiler okay so compiler will definitely get confused that whether to use this particular production first or this particular production first okay and also there is another problem that it is going to actually uh, produce the conflict corresponding to the operator precedence as well as the associativity if you look at uh, let me have the value corresponding to the id let's say id is nothing but 2 okay so if i replace this as 2 plus 2 into 2 so we know the bottmost rule and according to the bottmost rule this particular term is going to be evaluated first so it is going to be 4 and then plus 2 so overall result should be 6 okay now let me eliminate it one by one i'll just place the value over here 2 2 and 2 so if you evaluate this particular first because this is the variable symbol which is not having the accurate value right now here we cannot start with the uh, leftmost so what is the bottommost scenario uh, e into e so 2 into 2 is going to be 4 and now e has certain value uh, this particular task has to be done by the syntax director translation that is done in semantic analysis phase okay so association of value is done in semantic analysis phase so whatever I am doing here right now is done during the semantic analysis phase that it will associate value along with each and every non-terminal in the production. Okay. So that task is uh, right now I am doing this particular task over here. So this particular non-terminal is right now having the value 4. So 2 plus 4. So whatever is the value over here is going to be applied with this particular E. So E is having value 2 here. So 2 plus 4 is going to be 6 at this particular case. So the topmost or the root node contains the value 6. Now evaluate this particular term. So here in this particular case, I cannot evaluate this because E is unknown to me right now. So what I can do, I can uh, evaluate with the bottommost. So it is going to be 2 plus 2 that is having the value 4 over here. And this particular ID is having value 2. And 4 into 2 is going to be evaluated. Then the topmost value is going to be 8. And this is the wrong answer because 8 cannot be the correct value. Uh, as per the bottommost rule, it, it must be 6. Okay. So that is producing the conflict. Okay. So it is playing with the uh, ambiguity. So this, this uh, means if you have the same result from two leftmost derivation, two rightmost derivation, or one rightmost and leftmost derivation both, Okay, in that particular case, that particular grammar is known as ambiguous grammar. Okay, and ambiguity plays a significant role in destroying the association as well as the 
precedence of any particular operator okay so that should be uh, that should be first resolved before parsing any particular grammar okay all right so uh, we must have to be very careful that during the derivation tree or during the parsing your grammar must be unambiguous non ambiguous okay so if any non context free grammar is there that must be first converted into deterministic context free grammar okay and that particular deterministic context free grammar must be non ambiguous unambiguous okay and once it is unambiguous we can uh, create a parse tree for that particular grammar and we can have the uh, right solution for that okay now since we are looking at the parser uh, like this is the second phase which will produce the parsing so we must have the concept of the parsing like uh, what is the concept of parsing okay so parsing basically uh, creates a parse tree that uh, from a particular context free grammar or for the given grammar uh, this particular phase produces the parse table okay from that particular parse table we are actually uh, trying to look at the corresponding variable and the terminal corresponding to the particular production we are able to determine whether we have to actually perform what kind of task okay we have to perform shift operation or we have to perform the reduce operation or or certain kind of task okay and that is actually defined by the types of a particular parser okay so there are various types of the parser if you look at the definition of your uh, parsing there you can see that uh, parser can be defined as two ways okay whether it is top down parser or bottom up parser so if you if you recall that particular thing i can i can just quickly uh, create a table for you to summarize that so we may have the parser okay that will actually produce the parse tree okay so that parse tree basically can be generated by two ways one is the top down uh, parser and another is the bottom up parser okay we can have the top down parser as well as bottom up parser now in top down parser there is a problem that if your grammar is let's say in previous case uh, if you recall that particular uh, derivation uh, there you can see that if we are uh, deriving from the top to bottom if we are using the production from top to bottom uh, in that particular case if grammar is ambiguous in that particular case we need to backtrack to the previous one to find the right solution okay so it is possible that for ambiguous grammar there will be multiple backtracking okay so if it is with backtracking okay if backtracking is permitted then we can have the unambiguous uh, we can have the ambiguous grammar okay we can use ambiguity we can permit the ambiguity in grammar with backtracking concept okay and that is called as brute force parsing technique okay brute force top down parsing technique all right so it uses the non deterministic context free grammar this uses the non deterministic context free grammar but if you are dealing with no backtracking concept okay then in that particular case your grammar must be deterministic context free grammar okay and for that we have two type okay one is called as recursive descent parser okay and another is called predictive parser or also called as ll parser okay so recursive descent parser is uh, the concept of recursive descent parser is to associate a procedure along with all the term non terminal defined in your production okay so uh, let's say you have five non terminals in your production in that particular case you must have the five procedure corresponding to that particular grammar okay so that production is a basically converted Uh, that production rule is basically converted into the procedure how it is going to be evaluated okay so in that particular use of that particular production you are basically calling the uh, specific function which is defined 
so recursive descent is basically uh, converting a prediction into a procedure okay so the production corresponding to a non terminal is going to be converted into the production and that particular uh, procedure okay and that particular procedure will return on terminal symbol okay so that will return on a specific terminal symbol for that we must have the deterministic context free it should not have the ambiguity it should not have the multiple derivation corresponding to the same result okay so it must be eliminated and similarly we have the predictive parser that is called ll parser uh, or we can further categorize it as uh, ll1 or it is llk okay so in this particular case uh, to create this particular parsing table we have to have the concept of first and follow okay so you must have to have the concept of first and follow so let me know if you have any any doubt in first and follow then i am going to cover that particular concept otherwise i'll i'll jump to the direct uh, gate questions okay so you must have the concept of first and follow to evaluate once you get the first and follow of the given productions you can easily create a parse table for that particular uh, predictive parser okay and if there is only single entry like uh, you have to maintain the parse table and for each and every terminal term let's say id plus multiplication bracket and so on uh, for each and every term and for each and every variable if there is only one entry or one production corresponding to every cross section then that is called one entry okay that is called as ll1 so why it is called as ll1 it is uh, left to right scan okay so first l is defining left to right scan okay and second l is defining left most derivation okay so in this particular case we'll follow the left most derivation so we'll scan the entire sequence left to right will follow the left to right uh, left most derivation and then uh, during the construction of this particular table we'll check if there is only one entry corresponding to the uh, table then it is called as one okay that is called ll1 if it is having multiple entry corresponding to this particular cross section then it is going to be converted into ll2 3 or k okay depending upon the number of entries into that so uh, this is called the predictive parser which is top down parser now come to the bottom up parser so here it is following the left most derivation okay so this is the left most derivation now look at the bottom up parser that means uh, rather than following the root to come to the result we'll follow the result to uh, proceed to the root okay so we have the production like id plus id uh, we have the uh, statement like this is the result uh we eliminate it by the production rule id then it is id then id so it is reduced by this particular production then we may have another production like e tends to e plus this and then we have e into e and so on so this is going to be the uh, way that we are just going to follow this particular concept so we are starting from the uh, bottom to top okay to have the particular root uh, so this particular parse tree is generated in reverse order and uh, since it is following the rightmost derivation if you have if you we, if we follow the production we can start with the e tends to e plus e and in that particular case we apply the elimination of this particular non terminal from the right hand side so this is the rightmost derivation concept so we'll replace this by uh, e into e okay then we replace this rightmost non terminal with id then this is going to be the rightmost derivation this is going to be the id then this is going to be the rightmost because that is the only variable here so it is the rightmost derivation but in reverse order because uh, in this particular production we are following the uh, non terminal way but uh, here in the tree structure you can say that this is the reverse order so uh, this particular concept is using basically the rightmost derivation in reverse okay so any bottom up parsing is parsing is basically following the concept of rightmost derivation in reverse order okay so bottom up classification if you look at the bottom up classification it is also known as shift reduce parser okay shift reduce parser and it is because it is only having the uh, well known defined actions into the table and that is called as shift reduce error and accept 
so four possible uh, actions are there in this particular uh, parsing shift reduce accept and error okay so whenever you terminate with the right uh, yield that is called as accept and when you terminate with the blank cell into the particular table that will be encountered as error okay so uh, these are the four actions and based on the first two actions it is called as uh, shift reduce parses okay so it is classified as the operator precedence parser parser so the first type is operator precedence uh, where basically we are using the uh, operators precedence uh, so that will evaluate the operators in uh, given particular production rule okay and second one is called as lr parser so lr parser is nothing but the left to right scan right most derivation in reverse okay so this is the definition corresponding to both uh, here ll is defined as left most left to right scan left most derivation it is left to right scan right most derivation in reverse that's why it is called as lr now lr can be further classified into uh, four type okay that is called slr uh, also it is known as lr0 okay since it doesn't have any look ahead that's why it is called as lr0 zero is the look ahead corresponding now we may have the another one that is called slr1 uh, okay or we can have it is lr1 okay so that is called uh, one look ahead is allowed in this particular case or you can say it is simply uh, lr we just eliminate this term over here which is representing the lr0 we can have the lr grammar that is lr0 then we have the simplified lr that is slr okay then we have the lalr okay so lalr concept is entirely different than this one that tabulation scheme is same uh, like how to tabulate that particular context uh, that particular context free grammar along with the tokens uh, the tabulation concept is same but uh, the use of look ahead is different okay so this is lalr1 because it is also using one look ahead and then we have the clr okay canonical lr uh, grammar that is also one because it is also using one look ahead symbol for construction of that particular table and if you look at the power of there so in that particular case lr lr0 is going to have the least power than the slr this is because uh, in lr there are uh, multiple cells which has uh, multiple cells which are uh, having the uh, redundant information in that particular case error recovery or error detection is lesser okay while in, while in slr1 error detection is more prominent than lr0 because it will produce the accurate information so whenever there is any specific uh, action required then only uh, one entry will be there in the uh, table otherwise that particular table is going to be blank okay so if that is blank that means it is more prominating to the uh, errors okay so slr1 is going to be more powerful than the lr0 now by using the concept of follow as well uh, lalr is going to be more powerful okay but this particular parsing table is going to be longer in size so that uh, longer size is eliminated by eliminating the redundancy uh, from the canonical uh, look ahead uh, parsing table okay so clr having the most powerful construction and right now uh, if you look at the current generations of the parsing uh, this clr is most dominating parser which is known to us till now okay till date it is most dominating no other parser is there which can actually replace such kind of powerful uh, parsing technique okay so these are the basic concepts of the uh, parsing technique now uh, the collection of for uh, generation of this uh, we need to have the canonical connection and for that canonical connection we need to know the uh, go to and closer concept okay so you just have to have the go to and closer concept and this is because required uh, questions are asked in gate exam that uh, this is the current canonical collection and if we move the dot position from one particular place to another place what will be the next state or what will be the concept of uh, shift and reduce 
will there be any um, uh, conflict during the moment of this okay or this will be the final outcome of the canonical collection what types of conflicts will be there in the uh, parse table so such kind of questions are associated with this uh, parsing if it is okay then i'll jump to the uh, questions previous year questions please let me know if you seek any clarification from these points anyone just require any clarification on any topic please let me know if anyone is seeking any doubt any any uh, clarification or any topic to be revised please let me know otherwise i'll take the questions okay since i am not getting any response i'll i'll switch to the question section okay so the first question which is asked in uh, cs 1999 98 gate exam so type checking is normally done so type checking is normally done at which particular phase during the lexical analysis syntax analysis code optimization and Uh, syntax director translation let me have your answer i'm not getting any answer okay Muhammad Ali Rahman is saying C. Akash is saying C. Very good. So, lexical analysis task is to generate the token, while syntax analysis is to create the parse tree. Okay. Code optimization basically optimizes the code, removes the redundancy, removes certain things. But syntax director translation basically associates the corresponding value and checks the types of the non-terminals. Okay. So. this particular task the type checking is done in syntax director translation okay so option c is the correct option for uh, your question okay let me have the another question which is asked in gate 2014 now we have certain production rule we have certain operators okay now we need to know so consider this particular grammar defined by the following production rule and with the operators plus and multiplication uh s tends to t star p u, t tends to u or t tends to uh, t star u so that is the one way to combine the multiple uh, options or multiple production is into single production okay uh which of the following is true so you need to determine the associativity and the precedence so let me let me first uh, tell you what is the how could you actually determine whether it is uh, left recursive or right recursive or left associative or right associative so in your production rule you have to just see for any particular production for any particular operator that production is left recursive or right recursive okay so if you look at in this particular example if you look at this t okay now in this particular case let's say uh, multiplication is associated in this particular production so if you look at this particular case i am not able to determine whether it is left recursive or right recursive because uh, in s uh, t into p if i de start deriving this it is going to be t into p and it is non recursive because uh, uh, right now i don't know whether it is going to uh, derive in right left direction or it is going to derive in right direction okay but if you look at this particular production that t tends to t star u okay in this particular case uh, star is just preceded with t and it is left recursive okay can you see this this is left recursive that's why 
this star is going to be left associative okay so just look at the production and determine whether it is left recursive or it is right recursive then you can easily determine the associativity of that particular production okay now look at the p production that it is producing p tends to q plus p so p is going to be the right recursive in this particular case so plus is going to be the right associative okay and since we are just going to uh, determine the associativity uh, so the correct association will be plus is the right associative while multiplication is the left associative so option b is the correct one okay option b is the correct correct ones okay now since this particular question is the right uh, question to tell you that uh, how to know the precedence of any particular operator so what you have to do you have to create the parse tree and see whether the operator in the bottom or the operator is on the top okay so if i just uh, start writing this s tends to t star p because s is the starting variable i can start with this particular production only now whether you follow leftmost derivation or rightmost derivation any one uh, let me apply it over here as t into u then uh, t can also derive u then you can derive id so it is id into id sorry this id into id and this particular p can derive further let's say q plus p okay and then uh, this is going to be let's say again we can have uh, this u sorry q can directly derive id then p can derive q then q can derive id okay now in this particular uh, tree if you look at the uh, level of any particular operator okay so any particular operator which is in the bottom most position okay that is supposed to be evaluated first okay that is supposed to be evaluated first so in this particular case if you try to evaluate this multiplication you cannot evaluate because that is at the top level okay now we can evaluate plus operator here because it is at the bottom and it can easily be evaluated because this id can be associated with q this id is associated with q which will further associated with p during the syntax directed translation so these two non terminal will have the value here and we can evaluate this plus that means this particular plus has the higher precedence than multiplication okay so what you have to actually determine uh you you need not to evaluate any particular operator you just need to know which particular operator is in the deep of that particular syntax tree okay so deeper most operators has the highest precedence okay and all the operators at the same level has the equal precedence okay and uh, the operator which has the top position has the least precedence all right is that clear to you how we can associate the operators okay precedence and the associativity so for association option b is the right one if it is for the uh, if we are concerned about the uh, associativity of uh, sorry uh, precedence of this particular operators in that particular case plus must have the higher precedence than the multiplication for this particular scenario okay so let me jump to another question so option b is the correct one for that now we have a grammar and it looks like ambiguous okay because uh, a can derive double a and a can derive the bracket a and a can derive the epsilon okay so since epsilon is there it, it is non deterministic uh, it is left recursive as well as right recursive so it is ambiguous grammar so it says the production is not suitable for predictive parsing because because it is ambiguous okay and ambiguity is defined by the left recursive then the right recursive okay so which one is the wrong option for this case
टू ए ओनली ओके दैट इज वाई आई आस्क दैट इफ यू हैव एनी डाउट एनी एनी क्लैरिफिकेशन यू नीड प्लीज लेट मी नो फॉर प्रोडिक्टिव पार्सर वी ऑल्सो चेक एट द लेफ्ट फैक्टरिंग कॉन्सेप्ट ओके इफ एनी पर्टिकुलर प्रोडक्शन हैज लेफ्ट रिकर्सन दैट पर्टिकुलर प्रोडक्शन मस्ट बी कन्वर्टेड इन टू राइट रिकर्सिव वन ओके टू रिजॉल्व द एम्बिग्यूटी द प्रोडक्शन मस्ट बी कन्वर्टेड इन टू राइट रिकर्सन ओके so left recursion is also one concern that to be eliminated okay so ambiguity you have to remove and for elimination of the ambiguity your left recursion must be eliminated into the right recursion okay that left recursion must be converted into right recursion so yes rajveer has the correct option that both ambiguity and left recursion must be eliminated so option d should be the correct one for this right recursive is not the concern okay your context free grammar having the right recursion is the correct one there is no issue with that having the left recursion is the issue that must be eliminated okay another concern is that left factoring that whenever you are dealing with the parsing uh, if there is n number of production and all the productions are derived by the same variable having let's say some common context in all the productions at the left side that is called the left context okay तो वो सारे लेफ्ट कॉन्टेक्स्ट को आप रिप्लेस करोगे विद द लेफ्ट फैक्टरिंग कॉन्सेप्ट ओके यू विल अप्लाई द लेफ्ट फैक्टरिंग टू एलिमिनेट दैट लेफ्ट फैक्टर बिकॉज योर कंपाइलर इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी डिटरमाइंड कि उतने कॉमन कॉन्टेक्स्ट के बाद कौन सा प्रोडक्शन यूज किया जाए इफ यू हैव एन नंबर ऑफ प्रोडक्शंस इफ यू हैव द कॉमन कॉन्टेक्स्ट इन ऑल द प्रोडक्शन देन कॉन्टेक्स्ट ग्राम और योर योर कंपाइलर इज गोइंग टू बी कन्फ्यूज Uh, for uh, the per, uh, uses of any particular production after that common uh, left factor okay to wo bhi apne ko nahi chahiye we have to eliminate that uh, left factor so that i can be very deterministic ki is particular like yahan tak to deterministic aana hai uske baad kaun sa production use karna hai that production will be easily recognized okay there should be uh, no conflict no ambiguity in selection of that particular uh production okay so left factoring is, is is another concern that we have to take care all right so for this particular question option d is the correct one okay so a is not selected so option d is the correct one for that one okay just look at this particular question which is asked in gate 2005 uh consider the grammar e tends to e plus n we have another production e into n and the next production that is n for the sentence n plus n into n okay we have to derive n plus n into n that is the yield of this particular grammar the handles in right sentential form of the reductions are okay so what should be the handle for right sentential reduction what do you mean by right sentential form i'm expecting your input what is the right sentential reduction form option b is the correct option i'll i'll check whether option b is the correct or option c is correct or option d is correct but uh, we need to know the right uh, right uh, sentential reduction form
okay so let me let me write the corresponding uh, pass tree we have to generate the pass tree so we, i can start with the e okay so we can use uh, so which particular production we must use first occurs in the rightmost derivation of the sum sentence all right uh, so if we if we derive it as a, let's say a star n okay so in that particular case we have the rightmost derivation for e only because that is the only variable here so what we can do we can further derive it as e in p plus uh, n okay and then uh, we can have further derivation as n over here okay so is this the right way to solve this particular problem because in this particular place uh, in this particular case i am playing with the uh, precedence of the multiplication because that is going to have the least precedence okay so what we have to do since it is the right sentential form we have to apply the bottom up approach okay so we have to apply n plus n into n and in that particular case this particular production must be uh, eliminated first so in so for elimination of this particular production this n is going to be replaced with e so e into n must be uh, replaced first okay that's that is going to be the first production to be used for generation of e into n okay now uh, for this particular production it is going to have the uh, right option or we can we can start with the right approach let me let me erase this okay so what we can do we can apply this e tends to e star n okay so what we are doing we are just using the uh, production rule e tends to e into n okay for this particular case and then uh, this e is going to further derive as e tends to e plus n into n okay so rather than uh, syntax director tree uh, syntax tree we are just using uh, this one yes uh, this is not the leftmost derivation as you can see that this is the only variable okay this is the only variable which is available so uh, we have to replace it okay and that is not the leftmost derivation okay this is the only variable at the right hand side and uh, whether it is in the left side or in the right side we are just following a derivation so it could be treated as uh, rightmost derivation okay so what we are doing here we are just simply using e tends to e plus n okay we are just using e plus n in this particular case now what we can do we can replace this right most non terminal since that is the only terminal uh, sorry that is only the non terminal so that will be treated as the right most non terminal so it is going to be n plus n into n okay so what we are using we are using n then e plus n then e into n yes that reduction rules are to be applied so that reduction rule is applied in uh, which particular direction first we have reduced n so that is the rightmost derivation in reverse so that in reverse concept is that we are using n then e plus n then e star n okay so uh, if you look at this uh this is not the right production this is also not the right production this is the sentential form that does, doesn't have the uh, non terminal combination so these three options cannot be the correct one and if you look at this derivation in reverse direction then it is going to be n followed by e plus n followed by e into n so that is the uh, right approach okay so d should be the correct option for this so this is rightmost derivation in reverse direction okay so option 3d so 
Ali has the Ali Rahman has the right answer. Okay, look at this particular question. Which of the following is essential for converting an infix expression into postfix from efficiently? Okay, which of the following is essential for converting an infix expression into postfix from efficiency? Okay, an operator stack, an operator operand stack, an operand stack, and the operator stack, a parse tree. All right. Which one should be the correct one? So question is: You have an expression in in fix mode. Okay. So uh, let me have example. Like it is two plus three into five. Okay. So this is the in fix of uh, expression. You need to convert into post fix. So it is going to be two three. Five multiplication plus. Okay, so this is the postfix. Now it says which kind of oper uh, which kind of stack is to be used. Okay, it is operator stack, it is operand stack, or both are required, or pass free is sufficient to convert this. Which option should be the correct one? I'm expecting your quick option because we still have around 50 questions left. Okay, and time is running out. Do it fast. Which option should be the correct one? Okay, uh, let me tell you. The pass tree cannot be the option because that is for the derivation. That is to derive a particular pass tree. Okay, from the given context-free grammar. So that is not the Right option to convert any infix expression into postfix. If you recall your data structure concept, there we use uh, the stack as a data structure to convert any given infix into a postfix. But in that particular data structure or in that particular stack, we are actually maintaining the operators only. Okay, we do not permit our uh, operand to be inserted into that. So uh, we uh, in Evaluation of any arithmetic expression, we allow operand to be inserted into the stack. Okay, for evaluation of the particular expression. So this is not the evaluation; it is conversion. So for conversion, it should be the operator stack. Okay, so we insert any operator into the stack. The next scanned operator is to be compared with the input is uh, uh, entered, or you can say the stacked operator. Okay. And if it is lesser, greater, or equal, depending upon that particular nature, we perform certain uh, task. Okay, so we either enter the particular operator or we uh, pop out the entered operator to be included with the uh, postfix of uh, expression. Okay, so that particular concept is applied. So in this particular case, operator stack is going to be the correct option. Okay. A context-free grammar is ambiguous if. So that is the very basic and primitive question. Uh, if it is having more than one leftmost direction uh, derivation, if it is having more than one rightmost derivation, if it is having a leftmost as well as a rightmost derivation for the same string, in these three cases only, your context-free grammar is going to be ambiguous. Okay, so we need to consider these three scenarios that if it is having one, more than one leftmost derivation, more than one rightmost derivation, or it is having both leftmost derivation as well as rightmost derivation for the same string. Okay, so looking at this particular option, uh, it has more than one leftmost rightmost derivation. It has more than one leftmost derivation. So both options are promising. Uh, C no pass tree can be generated. No, uh, for whether it is ambiguous or non-ambiguous, we can generate the pass tree. Uh, all right. So option C cannot be the correct one. So D is the correct ones, uh, correct one. That is A or B. Okay. Uh, 
in my view both should be the correct a and b should be the option okay uh, but in this particular case uh, whether it is uh, all right all right this is the correct option whether uh, a is true or b is true it is going to be ambiguous okay Rajvi, you have to uh, like uh, we have to look at both the cases now. Whether it is uh, having more than one leftmost derivation or having more than one rightmost derivation, both are the ambiguous concept. Like again, compiler will get confused which rightmost derivation has to be followed or which leftmost derivation has to be followed. Okay, so it should be deterministic always that uh, from any context free grammar there should be only one derivation. Okay, if there is only one derivation, then there, then it is going to be the deterministic one okay then only we can have the deterministic then we have uh, uh, you can say the uh, right way to calculate the time okay the execution time of the program otherwise it will get confused kitna time kis context we grammar ko lagega kis particular recursive uh, kis derivation mein. all right so which of the following are always unambiguous which of the following are always unambiguous deterministic context free grammar non deterministic regular grammar context sensitive grammar none of the mentioned it is asking about the unambiguity okay and if there is non deterministic term associated with anything then it is not going to be the ambiguous uh, it is unambiguous okay so that is definitely ambiguous so uh, option b cannot be the right option context sensitive grammars ke bare mein hum koi comment hi nahi karenge because that is not going to be used for the parsing because we are using context free grammar for the parsing none of the mentioned ever cannot be the correct option because still we have not considered one and that is deterministic context free grammar so deterministic context free grammar is the right option all right so because that is uh, that is our motive to convert any leftmost derivation into rightmost derivation and to eliminate the left factoring okay if we have done these two thing our grammar is converted into deterministic context free grammar and that is unambiguous okay that is the required context free grammar for our uh, bottom up parsing or our uh, top down parsing for the predictive one okay so option a is the correct option for this all right just look at this particular production state whether it is true or false the statement is r is deriving r and r is deriving t where t is deriving epsilon this is ambiguous or not this grammar is ambiguous or not this is very simple question okay rajvir it is ambiguous what about others why it is ambiguous rajvir please comment why it is ambiguous two left most derivation are possible yes r tends to t tends to epsilon very good very good so we may have the multiple uh, leftmost and multiple rightmost derivation okay uh, for this epsilon so uh, we can have the context free language which will include epsilon okay uh, for this particular case it is epsilon only so this is the context free language okay 
uh, which is generated from this particular production and we may have uh, r deriving r deriving t deriving epsilon okay or we may have r deriving t deriving epsilon so two leftmost derivation or you can say it is two rightmost derivation so two derivations are possible for the same string with different uh, height of the tree or different yield okay so it is going to be ambiguous all right so that is the right uh, justification for this particular grammar all right look at this which of the following to be sufficient to convert an arbitrary context free grammar to be an ll1 grammar okay so we need to create a uh, parsing table okay and that is predictive parsing table ll1 is predictive parsing table okay so for predictive parsing table we have uh, just defined that uh, removal of left recursion and left factoring both has to be considered okay so your context free grammar must be unambiguous because we are not going to follow the backtracking concept okay so to generate a predictive parser we must have a grammar which no left recursion with no left factoring and in that particular case only your grammar is going to be the uh, right one okay so uh, let me check removing left recursion alone is not sufficient removing left factoring alone is not sufficient removal of left recursion and the factoring of the grammar is supposed to be done so option c is the correct option in this particular case all right <laughs> So which of the following be sufficient to convert an arbitrary context free grammar to LL1? Option C is the correct one, removing the left recursion and the factoring of the grammar uh, for this one. All right. So, okay, it should be option C. Uh, please correct it that it is option C. All right. Uh, that is some mistake. Removing left recursion and factoring of the grammar. Yes. Left recursion and the factoring, they are not uh, sufficient alone. Okay. Both should be done. So, option C should be the correct option. Okay. Uh, maybe So, you must correct that. Option C should be the correct option for this question. All right. Which of the following is a top-down parser? Yes, Rajveer, option C should be the correct for that. Uh, now look at this particular question. Which of the following is a top-down parser? Recursive descent, operator precedence, LRK, or LALRK parser? Okay, which option is correct for this? So if you if you recall, recursive descent parser is the top down parser. Okay, uh, that is without backtracking. Operator precedence parser is bottom up parser. If you can recall, operator precedence parser is bottom up parser. So that could not be categorized under top down. LRK is again like uh, we have defined that LR0 is the simple LR parser, okay. Uh, that is having no, no look ahead. And if we have one look ahead, it is going to be LR1. If we have K look ahead, then it is going to be LRK. But that is to be categorized under LR parsers, okay. So LALR and LR parsers are again going to be categorized in bottom up approach or bottom up parsers, okay. So recursive descent is the only option in this particular case. So option A is the correct option, okay? So you all have the right option for this. Okay, look at this particular question which is asked in gate 2000. 
which of the following derivations does not uh, does a top down parser uses while passing an input string okay which of the derivation is used for top down parser so top down parser we have uh, seen that it is following the leftmost derivation uh, during the classification i told you that it is the top down is following the leftmost derivation because it is ll okay uh, it is ll during the definition of the predictive parser i told you that it is following the left to right scan followed by leftmost derivation so it is ll while in uh, bottom up approach i told you that it is lr it is the left to right scan and rightmost derivation in reverse okay so for uh, this particular question the top down parser follows the ll leftmost derivation okay so leftmost derivation traced out in reverse is not the correct option uh, rightmost derivation is absolutely not the correct one so option a is the correct option for this uh, question so for top down parser it uses only leftmost derivation okay so option a is the correct option for this leftmost derivation all right now we have little tricky question just look at this yes you all have the correct option look at this particular question for the grammar below a partial ll1 parsing table is also presented okay uh, entries to be filled indicated with e1 e2 and e3 okay so entries are e1 e2 e3 they are missed okay or deliberately kept like this uh, what you have to do you have to determine which particular production to be used at this places okay so three options are given to you okay for given context free grammar for this particular table three options are given to you so four options are given to you a b c d okay uh, out of this what should be the uh, right option for e1 e2 and e3 okay ali is saying a okay let me have other options other students may please give your opinion what should be the correct option since it is ll1 we have to apply the first and follow okay we need to determine the first and follow okay and since e1 and e2 are to be entered corresponding to the uh, s okay and that is not in the uh, dollar symbol we have to first check at the uh, first of s okay so if you compute the first of s okay because look at the particular set here it is to be entered against s and this particular value is to be entered against s and uh, epsilon entry is supposed to be done uh, corresponding to the follow and the production entry is to be done corresponding to the first okay and if you look at the terminal okay this is the terminal a and terminal b so there are two productions where first of s could be determined as a okay and in this first of s should be determined as a small b so the first of s to be computed okay if you compute the first of a in that particular case uh, you will get the corresponding value a and b so e1 is going to be s tends to a capital a b b this is the corresponding to e1 and for e2 it is going to be uh, s tends to b a a b isn't it mm -hmm. 
okay and since e3 is supposed to be entered into a uh, dollar symbol and because uh, it is corresponding to the row b we have to apply the follow of b in this particular case we have to apply the follow of b okay so what should be the correct option according to you all you are saying okay first of a is first of b that is right uh, here we can see that uh, first of a is going to be the first of s first of b is going to be the first of a uh, so this is the equality in this particular scenario so uh, that is the correct option first of a is going to be the first of b so here you can see that uh, option a c and d both are representing the first of a is equal to first of b okay and uh, follow of a if you look at the follow of a follow of a is including a small b and uh, a small a okay in that particular case follow of a is going to be a b okay so that is also correct here it is also correct here it is also correct okay so these three options are going to be but uh, this is not correct because first of a is going to include epsilon also okay because that is the inclusion of first of s so d is not the right option for this so there is only class between a and c now look at the uh, third one follow of b and follow of b is going to be the follow of s okay and follow of s is nothing but the uh, dollar symbol only okay so in that particular case this cannot be the blank so dollar symbol is at least included okay dollar symbol is at least included in that particular case uh, this should not be the uh, right one this should not be the right option uh, sorry uh, this should not be the right option that uh, blank is there so at least dollar should be included okay then since it is having the epsilon also so we have to consider uh, putting the value of epsilon we have to check the other possibilities so that is going to be a b dollar so option a is the correct one okay so all you have the right option here that uh, for this particular question option a is going to be the correct one all right just look at this particular question consider the grammar below okay uh, let a b d and dollar b indexed as following okay so just look at the indexing a is indexed as 3 b is indexed as 2 d is indexed at 1 dollar is indexed at 0 okay now we have to compute the follow of non terminal b so we have to simply compute the follow b okay and that will include something okay and that something is supposed to be ordered in this non decreasing okay uh, that that in descending order okay that is supposed to be uh, answered in this descending order of this particular Uh, defined index value okay so just compute the follow of b and let me have the answer what should be your outcome corresponding to the input sequence let's say the outcome is b and d only i'm just considering the example here if it is b and d only then the outcome is going to be 21 so what is your outcome just let me know follow of b and i'm sorry follow of b only so if you compute the follow of b then it is simply the first of d and if you look at the first of d first of d is going to be d over here uh, so d is going to be included here since d is epsilon here if i put that epsilon over here then it is going to be the follow of a and follow of a is going to be a small a over here so it is going to be including uh, a also okay so just look at other possibilities uh, there is no other possibility because uh, since this is the terminal uh, it cannot have the other alternate okay now if i put the value of 
this d is going to be one three is uh, b a is going to be three and since it is required the outcome in descending order so it is 31 so my answer is 31 akas is also getting the same answer what about others What about others? OK, Rajvir also has the value 31. OK. Very good. Let me have another question. So this is the grammar that we have already seen. So I'm just skipping this particular question. So a few questions have been repeated in this case. So bottom-up parser generates. That is also repeated question. So no, this is not the repeated one. That bottom-up parser generates the rightmost derivation. That was uh, the top-down parser. So this is bottom-up parser, which is the rightmost derivation in reverse order. OK, so that is the correct option here. Now look at this. Uh, OK, this is also repeated one. Let me have another question. OK, which of the following is true about the LR parser? Which of the following is true about the LR parser? A is most general non backtracking shift reduce parser, is a still efficient parser, both A and B, none of the mentioned. As I told you, that uh, canonical LR is the most efficient parser. So Option B cannot be the correct one. You know? Till now, whatever is the efficient parser known to us is uh, canonical LR. It is CLR. So SLR or LR cannot be the most efficient. Okay. So it is asking about the LR parser. Okay. So it, it says LR parser has the four category. LR0, SLR1, LLR1, CLR1. Okay. So now look at all the uh, categories that first one is the most general non backtracking shift reduce parser that is very well true okay that is very well true that it is most general non backtracking shift reduce parser it is bottom up parser so it cannot have the possibility of backtracking okay so it is non backtracking shift reduce parser that is true it is still efficient okay uh, if we if we look at the categorization of the clr which is the type of lr so that is the very well known efficient parser okay so option b is also correct okay option b it is it is asking about the uh, lr parser all or lr parser okay it is not asking about the lr0 okay so you have to consider all four possibility so any statement which is related to any of these four statement is going to be true okay so you have to be very careful in this answering. OK, uh, Rahman has the right answer. Rahman, don't switch to A. C is the correct option, OK? So both A and B are the correct one. Uh, all right, both A and B are the correct one. That means option C is the correct one, OK? Because this is the general definition. Na? self reduced parser hota hai, non-backtracking hai. That is associated with the LR. Now, if we look at LR, we have four categorization. First one was LR0. Okay, that was the simplest, less powerful. Then we have SLR, which is more dominating than uh, LR0 because it's error recovery or uh, error detection. Uh, then we have LALR. It's a good look ahead. It's a powerful hua, but Table size बहुत बड़ी थी तो उस table size को reduce किया हमने CLR में. So CLR one is the most powerful among all and it is still efficient known to us. So option B is also correct and option A is also correct. Okay. So in this particular case, it is going to be uh, option C as a correct one. All right. Okay. Look at this particular case. Which of the following is incorrect for the absence of 
एल आर पार्सर सो दीज आर द ऑप्शन दैट इट हैज सेफ्ट ऑपरेशन इट हैज रिड्यूस ऑपरेशन इट हैज एक्सेप्ट एंड रिजेक्ट ओके विच वन इज द इन करेक्ट which is the correct statement in this oh, sorry uh, which of the following is incorrect question samajh mein nahi aaya question ye keh raha hai ki aapke paas uh, lr parcel lr parcel is the collection of canonical items okay so canonical items mm-hmm. ke collection mein aap dekhte ho ki kuch is tarah ka aap ek uh, uh, list banate ho jisme ek production hota hai a tends to dot something okay then a tends to let's say a dot something or a tends to something followed by dot kuch is tarah ki scenario hoti hai aapke paas okay uh, in these two scenarios you say it is shift operation okay this is shift operation and aisa jab bhi case aata hai then you can say it is reduce operation theek hai this is the final collection final item in that for in that particular case you will simply reduce it by a particular production theek hai aur ek case aata hai jab aap kehte ho ki s dash tends to s dot theek hai is case mein agar hamara look ahead dollar hai then it is the except scenario theek hai so you have to be careful for this uh, otherwise everything is the reject okay uh, otherwise everything every cell which doesn't have any kind of shift reduce or except all the blank cells are saying it is reject okay so if you look at the productions so shift by s so that is not the right production shift ke liye kuch is tarah ka production hona chahiye tha okay reduce ke liye a tends to beta sahi tha lekin yahan pe dot hona chahiye tha last mein it must be terminated by dot okay jo ki yahan nahi hai theek hai to ye wala bhi production sahi nahi hai एक्सेप्ट केवल एक्सेप्ट ऐसा नहीं होना चाहिए था एक्सेप्ट की सिचुएशन ऐसी होनी चाहिए थी जो यहाँ पे मैंने डिफाइन किया हुआ है तो ये वाला ऑप्शन भी करेक्ट है रिजेक्ट रिजेक्ट मीन्स इन दैट पर्टिकुलर केस नो प्रोडक्शन इज टू बी यूज नो टर्मिनल शुड बी यूज नो नॉन टर्मिनल शुड बी यूज सेल शुड बी ब्लैंक ठीक है तो ये वाली सिचुएशन हमारी बिल्कुल राइट right है दैट मीन्स इन दिस पर्टिकुलर एक्शन दिस एक्शन इज प्रॉपरली डिफाइंड ओनली बाकी सारे ऑप्शन प्रॉपरली डिफाइंड नहीं है ठीक है सेफ्ट रिड्यूस एक्सेप्ट प्रॉपरली डिफाइंड नहीं है तो अगर हम इसको देखते हैं तो उस पर्टिकुलर सिचुएशन में मुझे बताना है विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज इन करेक्ट ओके यस वन टू थ्री आर द रॉन्ग वन ओके सो विच वन इज द रॉन्ग वन ऑप्शन बी इज शुड बी द ऑप्शन बी इज द इन करेक्ट ओके वन टू थ्री इज द रॉन्ग राइट ऑप्शन बी शुड बी द करेक्ट वन इन दिस पर्टिकुलर केस ऑल राइट ऑप्शन सी नो ऑप्शन सी यहां पे uh, गलत टाइप हुआ है ओके दिस शुड बी ऑप्शन बी ओके प्लीज करेक्ट इट दिस शुड बी ऑप्शन बी ओके वन टू एंड थ्री इज द ओनली रॉन्ग ऑप्शन बिकॉज रिजेक्ट इज the right format which is written over here otherwise all other options are incorrect okay so this would be option b okay conflict mein bhi agar aap dekhoge kisi bhi production mechanical collection ke case mein uh, yes i'll i'll close this uh, within 5 minute i'll close this within 5 minute okay Uh, as you said the reject it should have uh, it should be blank so here we have a question mark no no this question mark uh, is basically what we are saying uh, 
uh, yes if we if we treat it question mark as a uh, wrong option in that particular case uh, it, it might be possible that it is treating it as a terminal symbol so in that particular case it is wrong okay because if you look at the table okay corresponding to any particular state let's say state 1 2 3 and so on whether uh, for it is uh, let's say terminal a b or dollar or then there is non terminal okay a b and so on uh, if you look at there is either shift or reduce options are there otherwise this is blank okay this blank is basically representing the uh, what reject scenario okay this is the reject scenario okay so what i'm saying that this question mark can be replaced by this particular symbol a b dollar or whatsoever okay and if it is simply treated as uh, unknown scenario in that particular case it could be the right one that if we are counting this question mark then uh, option c is the correct one otherwise it should be only reject okay it should be only reject okay it should be only reject uh, situation no other symbol is required for representation so if you look at this particular question mark since it is given in the question so option c is the correct one otherwise it should be only reject okay for the correct statement it should be only reject no special character no state no terminals no not terminal should be appended with this nothing should be appended with this okay Uh, so looking at this scenario yes you are right looking at this particular scenario option c should be the correct one is that clear rajveer so all four are the wrong options for this okay so let me have few more question uh, if the state does not know uh, yes yes all or all options are incorrect uh, if a state does not know whether it will make a shift operation or reduce operation for a terminal okay since there are two possibility that i told you that uh, we may have a canonical collection where we can have a production like uh, this dot something or we can have a production like a b c dot something okay so this dot position basically defines whether it is a uh, shift operation or reduce operation okay if it is in between some place then it is going to be the shift operation okay and if it is at the last place it is going to be the reduce operation okay uh, if you look at the questions that you have solved uh, there you can see that uh, for any particular item for any canonical item these two terms are not occurring at the same uh, state okay uh, either uh, this particular operation is there in one state or this particular operation in another state so if your grammar is ambiguous it is possible that these two possibilities can arise in the same state okay in the same canonical option these two options are going to arise in that particular case the possible conflicts are either it is shift reduce or it is reduce reduce only two possibilities are there okay that either shift reduce conflict is there or reduce reduce conflict is there so in this particular case if you look at uh, so shift reduce conflict can be there reduce shift conflict is not defined only shift conflict is so shift shift conflict cannot be done okay reduce reduce conflict is only possible if more than one production can have uh, or sorry s can have a dot like okay more than one production are the final production or the final item in this so this is the situation for the reduce reduce but in this particular question it is saying that whether it is not able to decide the shift operation or reduce operation that means it is causing this kind of scenario so it is option a as the correct option that is shift or reduce conflict there okay so it is going to be option a as the correct one that is Uh, the shift reduce conflict okay another question is related to the reduce reduce okay so reduce reduce is only permitted that uh, whether it is not able to determine which particular production to be used for uh, reduction okay 
so there is possible that it uh, a particular non terminal may have n number of productions and out of which two reduced operations are occurring at, at the same uh, state at that particular point it is not able to determine whether it should replace it by ith production or jth production okay so if you look at the options uh, state does not know whether it will make a shift so shift operation ka to conflict hai nahi reduce reduce conflict ki baat kar raha hai so option a cannot be the correct one option b is also dealing with the shift operation that means uh, option b cannot be the correct one because reduce reduce is dealing with the replacement of any particular production uh, any particular variable by any particular production okay to do productions reduce ki conflict mein aa rahe hain sirf uski baat kar rahe hain so look at the option c uh, if the state does not know whether it will make a reduction operation using production rule i or production rule j okay so two productions which are eligible for the reduction just look at this scenario these are the two production production i and production j both are eligible for the reduce because dot is at the last place okay so it is reduced by ith production or reduced by jth production so this is the reduce, reduce reduce conflict so in this particular case option c is going to be the correct one okay to represent the reduce reduce conflict scenario so at any particular state if there are more than two productions uh, two or more than two productions uh, and both are eligible or more than two are eligible to uh, replace that particular variable in that particular case it is known as a reduce reduce conflict okay so option c is going to be the correct one all right okay so i'll take two more questions to complete it as a 50 questions okay and then i'll uh, stop this particular process look at this particular grammar consider the following two statements every regular grammar is ll1 every regular set is lr1 grammar okay which of the following is true this is asked in gate 2007 question both p and q are true p is true but q are false q is false p is true uh, p is false and q is true both p and q are false okay so i'll quickly uh, define the terms uh, it is asking about the regular grammar so if you look at the regular grammar regular grammars are uh, in nature of left recursive or left recursive uh, so it is left recursive okay or left linear okay a grammar is left recursive or left linear okay but it doesn't say it is unambiguous so any regular grammar can also be ambiguous okay and if it is ambiguous then ll1 is not possible because ll1 is only for unambiguous grammar okay so in this particular case p cannot be the true okay p cannot be the true yes rajiv you have the right option that p is false okay so in this particular case it cannot be true okay so ye bhi galat ho gaya ye bhi galat ho gaya because both are representing p as true okay so either c correct or d correct because p is false in both the cases now let me check for the q okay so every regular set is lr1 okay regular set means uh, regular set kise define karte hain so grammar can produce the languages and for every for any language uh, we may have the deterministic infinite languages infinite uh, number of strings okay so in that particular case we may have a regular set of languages okay regular set of languages can start with the epsilon to any number of character okay that could be simply represented by uh, either let's say a plus b star a star a or a epsilon okay a plus and so on various rules are there to define that particular thing okay uh, if it is so if it is so that means we have the certain string over here certain yield over here and for every yield we can generate the bottom up parser 
we can generate the lr1 parser okay that means q is going to be true okay we have a set of strings that could be easily converted into a uh, parse tree okay for that we can have the lr1 grammar okay so q is going to be true so c option is going to be the true option okay and uh, all you have the correct option very good i'll take the last question here a canonical set of items is given in below that s tends to l dot greater than r q tends to r dot okay so just look at this situation that i have uh, shown you in the canonical collection that the dot position is in between somewhere okay and dot position is after this so these two possibilities are there in any uh, collection okay so these are the two possibilities that is uh, to be included in any particular production so these are the two productions that are the part of any particular set okay so it says that on input symbol this a set has shift reduce conflict reduce reduce conflict or both or neither which one is the correct one neither shift reduce or nor reduce reduce why Raman, why it is so? Yeah, you are correct. You your answer is bilkul correct, but why it is so? See, whenever we create the parsing table, na. Uh, what we have to enter the parsing table must have the all terminal symbols so terminal symbols are greater symbol and the dollar symbol because no other symbol is there and then we have all the non terminals so non terminals are l r q and s okay so in this particular parsing table there is no entry for less than symbol just look at this particular symbol and this symbol both are different okay there is no entry for Less than sign. If there is no entry for less than sign, so जब ऐसा कोई symbol ही नहीं है, तो उसके लिए conflict क्यों होगा? No, 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 no. Raman, you are going, you are bit confused. ये अगर ये question होता मेरा greater than symbol के लिए, ठीक है? अगर ये इस question होता on input symbol greater than the set has, then in that particular case set has the shift conflict, okay? along with the reduce conflict so on that particular state any particular ith state yahan pe shift bhi aata reduce bhi aata theek hai but in this particular case it is asking for the less than symbol so less than symbol to hamare table mein hai hi nahi kahin pe to koi conflict kyun hoga are you getting my point Raman, are you getting my point? That if there is, like, मुझे किसी से डर क्यों लगेगा? अगर कोई होगा तब तो उससे डर लगेगा ना? अगर कोई है ही नहीं तो उससे डर क्यों लगेगा? So if less than symbol is not there in your terminal list, तो उसके corresponding हम shift या reduce के entry ही क्यों करेंगे? ठीक है question को ध्यान से देखो जो production rule दिया है उस production rule में less than symbol है ही नहीं और आपसे पूछ रहा है कि कॉन्फ्लिक्ट कहाँ होगा लेस देन सिंबल पे तो लेस देन सिंबल है ही नहीं तो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट होने का चांस ही नहीं है सो नीदर अ शिफ्ट रिड्यूस नॉर अ रिड्यूस रिड्यूस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट दोनों में से कोई नहीं होगा बट अगर यही क्वेश्चन होता है ग्रेटर देन सिंबल के लिए देन इट इज डेफिनेटली अ शिफ्ट रिड्यूस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट ठीक है रिड्यूस रिड्यूस नहीं होता शिफ्ट शिफ्ट नहीं होता इट इज डेफिनेटली अ शिफ्ट रिड्यूस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट ठीक है तो ऑप्शन बी करेक्ट हो जाता दैट इट इज अ शिफ्ट रिड्यूस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट बट नॉट अ रिड्यूस रिड्यूस ओके okay, तो उस केस में ऑप्शन बी करेक्ट हो जाता फॉर ग्रेटर देन सिंबल लेसर देन सिंबल के केस में डी ऑप्शन इज द करेक्ट दैट नीदर अ शिफ्ट रिड्यूस नॉर अ रिड्यूस रिड्यूस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट ऑल राइट विश यू ऑल द बेस्ट सो आई क्लोज दिस सेशन ओवर हियर